it, it's a great pleasure to initiate Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to stay here with all of you from all parts of the world in different countries. Uh, this is the opening session of our first symposium of fungal diversity and conservation in cloud forests. These are our site here, uh, and these are our Instagram. And now we are beginning officially our event. I'm going to uh, just say uh, some words about this event. Our organizing committee supporters, uh, our press symposium course that occurred yesterday, and our lecturers, our speakers. Uh, during the whole program that will occur today and tomorrow. These are the two main research groups that are responsible for construct uh, this event, the Mind Funga from the Michael Lab in the Federal University of Santa Catarina, uh, uh, leading by Dr. Ricardo Drexler Santos and the, uh, the group from Molecular and Computational Biology of Fungi Laboratory uh, from Federal University of Minas Gerais, uh, both in Brazil, uh, leading by myself. And this is a completely 
free uh, um, event uh, and uh, uh, our main supporters are uh, one of the research agent funding agency, uh, federal agency in Brazil called CAPES and uh, a state a, a research funding agency in the state of Santa Catarina, uh, which is situated the Federal University of Santa Catarina. So that's why uh, our event is completely free for everybody. These are the main supporters of our event that I have already told you, CAPES, another federal agency responsible for the uh, research productivity, research productivity uh, scholarships, uh, the CNPQ. CNPQ. Uh, these are our universities, Federal University of Minas Gerais and Federal University of Santa Catarina. And I would like to thank uh, a lot for all the organizing committee we have uh, besides ourselves, uh, the leading of the groups, we have uh, postdocs uh, and PhD and master and undergrad students, uh, mainly from the Federal University of Santa Catarina and state University of Feira de Santana in the state of Bahia. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for this fantastic uh, work in, in, to, uh, uh, in the divulgation of this, of this symposium. This is our program. I will talk a little bit about it. Uh, we are very, very happy because we have speakers from 18 di distinct country, uh, countries and they will talk about mainly uh, diversity, ecology and conservation of fungi in cloud forest all around the world. We have uh, uh, speakers from South, Central and North Americas, Europe, Asia and Oceania. Uh, these are our important dates of our event. Uh, yesterday, we had our pre-symposium course uh, applying IUCN criteria for the assessment of certain fungal species that uh, was very successful with 160 attendee, attendees in both uh, uh, Zoom and, and YouTube platforms. So thank you very much for all the, the professors and uh, students that were enrolled in this press symposium. This is the official program of the event. Uh, this is our uh, opening session here. Uh, after that, we have the main lecture uh, that I, I'm going just to present you to, the, to our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Geraldo Fernandes. Then we have a break and we begin with uh, the first part of the fungal diversity and ecology in neotropical cloud forest. There is a, a first lecture of, of me, then a lecture of Dr. Joseph Gam from Hungary, and then one le uh, uh, a lecture of uh, Professor Genivaldo Silva from Federal University of Santa, Santa Catarina in Brazil, and then another one uh, with uh, our lecture João Paulo Araújo, uh, that is now in uh, New York Botanical Garden, but uh, he's uh, Brazilian. And then we finish the, the first day in morning 
with uh, Clara Fonseca from uh, the system of Brazilian biodiversity. That is a, a, a program of uh, linked to the Ministry of Environment in Brazil. Uh, at the afternoon, we start uh, with Dr. Emerson Gomboski uh, talking about lichenized fungi uh, from Brazil. And then uh, Dr. Aldo von uh, Wagenheim uh, from Brazil, Federal University of Santa Catarina. Uh, Dr. Aldo is from computer science and uh, he will talk about artificial intelligence for community-based macrofungi. Uh, it's uh, the foundational uh, research of the Mind Funga group. And then we have Dr. Mario Raschenberg from uh, Argentina, and then Dr. Sharon Cantrell uh, from Puerto Rico. After that, we have uh, in the end of the lectures, we have a discussion. Uh, uh, open to all the attendees for questions. Then we have a break and we, be, we continue with Dr. Jonathan Trujillo um, and, and Dr. Peter Trutman from Switzerland, Dr. Tina Hoffman from Germany, and ending with Dr. Ida Vasco Palacios from Colombia. And then our first day uh, mainly focused on fungal diversity and ecology uh, will be finished. In the second day, uh, we have Dr. Safir McMullen Fisher from Australia, then Dr. Ko Zhuan uh, Chen from Taiwan, uh, and after that, Dr. Kiran Ranadev from India and followed by Dr. Tinik Rabank from Slovenia, Dr. Daniel Thomas, uh, uh, the ending in, in, in the morning from uh, United States of America. And, and at the afternoon we have Dr. Gregory Miller, one of the main professors of the Press Symposium course from USA. Then Dr. Susana Gonçalves from Portugal, Dr. Robert L uh, Lukin uh, from Germany, Dr. Melinda uh, Lello from Australia, and then followed by Juliana Fursi uh, from Chile. And uh, uh, in the last part uh, of uh, at the afternoon of the, our second day, uh, we have Dr. Ricardo uh, Garcia Sandoval, Sandoval and Dr. Mariana. Uh, Del Olmo Ruiz, and after uh, of our uh, uh, Dr. Ricardo Drexler Santos, and ending with Dr. Uh, uh, Ru van der Grift uh, from United States. So uh, we are all very, very happy to have all of you in our fantastic event, our sim first time symposium of fungal diversity and conservation in cloud forests. So uh, we are well, we uh, welcome for, for all of you. And now we are going to begin our, uh, our activities. Uh, I would like to to introduce our keynote speaker, our main lecturer, uh, Dr. Geraldo Fernandes from Federal University of uh, from Federal University of Minas Gerais, that uh, he will go to present the about the biodiversity and collapse in the second largest. South American mountain chain. Dr. Geraldo Fernandes is uh, the uh, member of Brazilian Academy of Science. He, he has a productivity uh, scholarship top 1A 
of our CNPQ agency, and uh, he has uh, a, a, a one of uh, a large experience in ecology and conservation. So it's a great pleasure to call and introduce Dr. Geraldo Fernandes, my colleague here in the Federal University of, of Minas Gerais from the ecology uh, graduate program and department to begin his lecture. Thank you very much and uh, Geraldo, uh, please, <laughs> it's, it's now, it, it, it's you. Good morning, good morning all, good afternoon to those of you who are um, in other parts of the world. Uh, it is an, an enormous pleasure to be here to be talking about this mountain chain that I have been working for a long, long time now. Um, I, I'm gonna have a presentation of my talk that was recorded uh, just for safety because, you know, uh, internet connections can go bad. But uh, just uh, before uh, we start, I would like to thank uh, Aristoteles and Ricardo for putting together this outstanding meeting, uh, fascinating talks, and uh, I'm really excited about uh, the future that uh, you guys are opening uh, in Brazil and elsewhere with uh, showing to us the diversity of fungi in, in the cloud forests. I'm sure that this uh, whole symposium is gonna be, I mean, a, a light to many students to get started studying them, not just in cloud forests, but many in all of, all of the other uh, biomes and ecosystems uh, of South America, including non-forest ecosystems. So um, said that, uh, Will you guys please uh, let the talk roll? Good morning, all. It is a pleasure to be here today. And I thank Aristoteles and Diogo for the invitation and for organizing this fantastic and very important meeting. So thank you very much. Let me share with you my talk. Okay. So today I'll be addressing the biodiversity and collapse in the second largest South American mountain chain. Did I say mountains? Mountains in Brazil, where? Brazil has mountains. Yes, they were once as giant as the Himalayas and the Alps and perhaps the Aconcagua. But with time and subjected to erosion, they become much shorter. And here are the mountains we're talking about. As you can see here, we have here the Andes 
a fantastic long chain of mountains in South America. And here, <clears throat> located right here in Brazil, between the states of Minas Gerais and Bahia, we have the Espinhaço mountain range. Nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, in spite of, the, of being very short compared to the Andes or the Himalayas today, the trends in the species distribution were mainly in the eroded but still giant mountains of Eastern South America. These mountains are relict of an ancient time, a great natural laboratory for multidisciplinary studies, a place where the signs of climate change can be studied on its phylogenetic old lineages, on the species evolved under the most severe harshness imposed by its iron and quartz substrates. These mountains in Eastern Brazil, they stretch over 1200 kilometers in the landscape from north to south, it uh, has 10 degrees latitude and also between 50 and 200 kilometers wide. And elevation varies from 700 to a little bit above 2000 meters above sea level. Well, these mountains are within three transition zones. <clears throat> In the Northeast, the Caatinga, the Brazilian dry forest. In the Southeast, the majestic Atlantic rainforest. While in the Western side, uh, it is, makes contact with the Brazilian savanna that we call the Cerrado. Well, <clears throat> these mountains are rather uh, is small compared to the size of Brazil. Brazil has an area of uh, 8.5 million kilometers square, while these mountains has only eight, a little bit uh, close to 83,000 square kilometers. This represents less than 0.8% of Brazil in altitudes when we measure that, I mean, uh, for the 83,000 square kilometers, <clears throat> only the land above 900 meters uh, in elevation. And that's uh, the distribution of this mountain and the vegetation it, uh, it has that I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later. Well, <clears throat> but in the last glacial period, the Hupessian grassland vegetation, the vegetation that dominates the western side of the mountains was widespread in South America and perhaps connected the Andes, as you can see here, with the eastern Brazil. So perhaps the species could pass through this very large area. And this is uh, approximately 20,000 years ago. Um, in a study done by a former PhD student of mine. Well, in these mountains, soils originate from the quartz and iron rocks. And so this means that we have an extremely nutrient poor soil with lots of heavy metals in it. In these soils, large scale agriculture is not possible, of course. Therefore, this is excellent for biodiversity, but very bad for subsistence. Well, <clears throat> a little bit uh, um, of the ecos or the habitats we find in this mountain environment. Of course, uh, I'm gonna be showing only a few of them because there are many little habitats that uh, would take very long here. So uh, the most common uh, environments are those of, the, of grassland or savannic ecosystem. When this vegetation develops on the ironstone substrate, we have the, a vegetation that locally we call kanga, but it is, but it's also, uh, but there is, I'm sorry, it is an ironstone Hupestrian grassland, Hupestrian meaning rocky. 
When it develops on top of our quartz soils, we have particulate compass in grassland. And this is the uh, general uh, view of, um, of this rupestrian grassland, or locally called Campo Rupestrian vegetation. It's a very uh, interesting and beautiful uh, area in Brazil. Well, <clears throat> also at the top, immersed in this vegetation matrix that I mentioned to you, there is an archipelago of tropical rainforest islands. And so <clears throat> when the soil is a little bit, little bit deeper or there are more humidity, then we have the development of uh, forest on little pockets. And sometimes they get connected as you can see in this uh, slide. Inside some of them, that's what we uh, general, generally find, you know, lots of bromeliads, you know, and actually this is Atlantic forest in a way, uh, which is mostly found in the eastern side of this mountain chain. Of course, uh, inside you have lots of very interesting fungi, you know, mycorrhizae, endophytic, and other types of fungus uh, uh, in the area. So with regards to the flora of this mountain, chain, it is spectacular. I mean, uh, and lots of this uh, belongs to a very unique plant genus uh, that's solely found in the area. So um, diversity is very high as well as endemism of plant species and of course in animal species as well. And so for those who like these creatures, I have a few of them here to illustrate and uh, some of these little fellows. Of course, I'm just showing um, frogs and, and little lizards because, you know, there is no time to show the other fantastic creatures, many endemic birds and hummingbirds in the area. Well, <clears throat> in this mountain chain, species and vegetation are under extreme habitat stress and I shall convince you of that. Well, <clears throat> time and environmental harshness worked in synergy to filter one of the most fascinating flora and fauna of this planet. Perhaps the divorce, the divorce with Africa did very good to our campo pastry that speciated and radiated into <clears throat> many clades with unique shapes, as you can see here, functions and behaviors to survive environmental harshness. I mean, that's quite different vegetation, isn't it? Well, <clears throat> in this little area, there are more than 6,000 plant species. That means 3% of the world, 11% of the Brazilian flora, which has 55,000 species. And again, just to remind you, in less than 0.8% of the Brazilian territory, <clears throat> and more, approximately 40% of them are endemic to this mountain range. And in some groups, the endemism is really like uh, 70 to 90%, such as in the Iriocalaceae and Vilosiaceae. Well, <clears throat> what are the natural challenges that plants and animals must cope in this mountain chain? I think that the most important one is to breathe in tune with the adverse environment. In this vegetation, fire uh, is of great relevance because it exerts a very large pressure in this vegetation. Hence, understanding the pressures exerted by the environment is an important key to understand biodiversity in the campo of pasture. And fire is a very important stressor. Just to show to you <clears throat> how this vegetation is in fine tune with fire and many other um, phenomena in the area. Uh, in 2014, we had a fire and in the following day, we set up a camera that took one photo a day of the burnt area. And this is the area in 19th of August. 30 days later, 
the whole place starts flowering. And in 40 days, there were lots of fruits. All these little spots had fruits on it. Some plant species can grow five centimeters a day after a fire event. So fire uh, is a very important event in there and many plants are adapted, perhaps I should say tolerant, instead of adapted to fire. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> in this area, mass flowering is very common after a fire event. And so many plants are adapted to that and they take advantage of fire and produce flowers and fruits. But some plants also, or perhaps to do it. Many plants evolved underground structures to regrow after some above ground disturbance. And so after fire or perhaps a bivouac, <clears throat> they re-sprout and flowers and fruits, and then there is another fire and they keep going. Well, what is interesting is that we think that these plants, many of them, in fact, live underground. They hide in the ground at least. And this <clears throat> is a very interesting example of a plant that it is really an underground, underground species. This is an anonace. It looks like a shrub with a very large fruit, but in fact, it's not a shrub. It is a tree. This is just a little stem, a little shoot that's outside, you know, just popping out from the ground. But this is very common. Look at this jacaranda, a big noniace. This whole thing we can see here is, is one single tree. The tree is underground. What do we see? A little stems outside, you know, <clears throat> um, outside in the, uh, in the surface of the soil. So when we look like there is a little shrub flowering, but in fact, it's a, a tree. In fact, this tree was uh, uh, more than 3,000 years old in this study, fascinating study by Alvis published in 2013. <clears throat> in this vegetation house, plants are associated with lots of fun fungus and bacteria that helps them to survive in these poor soils where the harsh and hostile environments prevail. So in this vegetation, we were able to describe the highest diversity of mycorrhizae in the world. 25% of mycorrhizae in the altitude gradient of Serra do Cipó. Well, if we're talking about anthropology, this is also a fantastic place because this is the area where we found the oldest occupation of man in South America with fossils, uh, man fossils of uh, above 12,000 years ago, dozens of archeological sites, lots of uh, rock paintings, and also, of course, uh, lots of high um, uh, social diversity with a mix of many indigenous peoples, uh, African uh, people, uh, that came as slaves to Brazil and, of course, Europeans. So it's very rich when we talk about uh, culture and, and anthropological um, aspects. In this area also, it is very important to mention the high quality of water and the high quantity of water, you know, because there are many springs of, uh, of, uh, in the whole mountain chain. So many important rivers are born in this Piasso Mountains, including the one that the mining company, San Marco, uh, uh, I mean, destroyed with the, the dam rupture of down in 2015. Well, uh, in spite of this beauty and this very important uh, aspects that I mentioned, this whole mountain chain is in the route to collapse. Uh, a modeling done by our group showed that uh, by 2070, if we keep doing what we are doing with the ecosystem, we're gonna lose most of it. We can end up losing more than 93% of the Hupestian grassland. 
And imagine how many plant species and animals can go extinct. The most stable areas, if uh, this modeling uh, is okay, then it will be the southern region of the entire mountain. Otherwise, this is the place where we have the iron ore, the mining companies down here. So we are going to face a very large problem in the future. So what are the main drivers of this rupture of the natural pulses in this fiasco? Well, I'll talk a little bit about the scars left by highway construction, mining, urbanization, ecotourism, and of course, lack of governance. So what we have is the hottest biodiversity hotspot in Brazil under pressure. Well, one major threat is that caused by afforestation, which is, which is the ill planting of trees where they do not belong. I mean, this is a very bad initiative of the bomb challenge that's spreading trees all over the world in vegetations which are not forest just to capture carbon. That's very sick. The other one is of course urban development. What we have is this uh, spreading of the cities and of course, lots of people going to the mountains. And then we have a very serious pressure caused by urban development. Another one <clears throat> is road construction. Road construction can be nice if People are very intelligent. If they're intelligent enough to build roads, they do not bring nasty, nasty exotic African species to restore degraded land. So these nasty exotic species, they often escape and invade, you know, uh, adjacent uh, ecosystems such as the cloud forests. As I have been showing the, here in this last. Uh, slide down here. Okay, well, <clears throat> mining, we all know that mining is a very old activity in Brazil. Old gold was discovered in, at the end of the 1600s, just to let you know a very interesting curiosity. In 1750, Ouro Preto, this town above here in Brazil, nearby here, Belo Horizonte, had 80,000 people living in it. Sao Paulo in Brazil had 8,000 people and New York at that time had 40,000 people. So, I mean, that's why, uh, that's why what the gold uh, brought to this area. I mean, lots of people, lots of slaves came to work in this whole area. But then, I mean, we are still today with the scars left by this crazy mining, you know, that's now 300 years old. Well, and another problem that we have in the whole region, in, as you know, in mountain ecosystems, global change caused by uh, temperature increases. We just modeled the distribution of eight endemic birds in the in this in the Espinhaço Mountains, and we saw that to survive by the year of 2070, these birds will have to fly away more than 300. I mean, almost 300 kilometers south to find adequate habitats, or go up in elevation 500 meters. The only problem is that we live in a very short mountain, so there's no more mountains up there. So they are eroded, a very short mountain. So, I mean, what's gonna happen to them? We try to model the routes to escape. Everything points to going south, but how come a bird or any other species are gonna be able to cross very hot valleys, you know, with lots of predators? in a matrix of an agricultural and, and eucalyptus plantation. So that means the future for them may be over. Maybe they are just zombies, unfortunately. Well, another problem, of course, is that more than 50 million people depend on the ecosystem services of this Miyasu Mountain. So they depend, they depend on water, 
greatly depend in climatic stability and many things that are produced there, of course, you know. So they're extremely important uh, also for climatic stability and, and, and so on. Well, <clears throat> what have you been doing in these mountains? So let me show to you very quickly uh, the sort of studies we are doing right now here in Serra do Cipó and surrounding areas. We are looking mostly, uh, attempting to understand the trends in biodiversity and distribution of species. So um, we have along the altitudinal gradient, a constellation of climatic stations in the gradient. So we have a, every 100 meters, a climatic station, very, very good stations that monitor everything uh, that we can possibly do uh, uh, in climate measurements. So we are looking at temperature in the soil, air, photosizing, radiation, radiation, um, wind, wind, uh, wind speed, uh, relative humidity, precipitation, and so on. And these are the trends we have been reporting and um, another uh, aspect that I should mention that uh, we, uh, after 10 years of monitoring, we have been able to get some interesting data that indicates that indeed mountains are warming up. So uh, with regards to animals and plant species distribution, and also down here you can see my horizon, we have very interesting trends described already in the distribution. You know, so we are observing that in spite of these mountains being very short compared to other mountains uh, around the world, uh, species number in general increase with decreasing elevation. So um, this is quite interesting, fits the trends found all over the world. And so, but what is curious is that we have a very short mountain and we still have very strong trends in many, many groups. We are also looking at many other uh, characteristics or characteristics of the vegetation, such as functional attributes of the flora. And we are now starting to that to do that for some animal species, primarily for ants, butterflies bees and gall inducing insects. We are looking at the differential growth, ecophysiology and development of many native plant species. And because, you know, this is an attempt to help them uh, to understand them and uh, perhaps uh, engage in studies on propagation so we can help them to survive in the future. We are also attempting to establish the reference ecosystem for all major habitats in this, uh, in this mountain chain, including the cloud forests. So we know how the uh, pristine habitats look like. So one day we can attempt to restore and um, as uh, was the vegetation, the primary vegetation. So we have been producing lots of papers, just a few samples, uh, a few samples of them here, but there are many other that you guys can consult. We are also starting to look at the chemical ecologists of some of the major uh, species uh, found in the area. So we are primarily interested in, in flavonoids or antioxidant uh, chemicals in this vegetation. So we're just starting to do this now. We are also uh, looking at the endophytic fungi uh, and plant chemical properties uh, relationship in some plant species. And we are mostly focusing on species that we have been doing long-term observations, such as the Bacteris dracopolifolia or all the other Bacteris uh, genus. Bacteris is a asteraceae, uh, very common in these mountains and in the Andes as well very important medicinal uh, plant. So we are looking at uh, this, this is just an example of this, of the uh, endophytes we are 
finding in some of the species. <clears throat> and also we are just starting a work now uh, on the fungi community traits along the student gradients. So um, we're gonna do that, you know, mostly for the mycorrhizae and uh, that we find and also of some endophytic fungi in bakeries, as I mentioned. We are also uh, doing some interesting uh, work on, on increased CO2 and temperature effects on native uh, plant species by looking at the physio ecophysiology performance and also uh, evaluating the uh, endophytes present on this plant subject to increased CO2 and temperature. Well, other uh, studies, uh, you know, I should just mention briefly plant facilitation, uh, deep web interactions by looking at trophic interactions in some key uh, systems, fire ecology, effects of fire on cloud forest ecology, eDNA, climate change modeling, pollination ecology, ecosystem services, bioeconomy, and of course, ecological restoration. Um, so um, we have been doing lots of work also on the, on the cloud, on the cloud forests right now. And uh, here are a few examples of studies. So we have some of these little islands that I mentioned, you know, uh, where we studied for the flora and uh, the diversity and um, the presence of uh, a few uh, animal species such as ants, butterflies, then beetles, golem insects, and bees. <clears throat> um, and, and I think I should end here. And please feel invited to come and visit us at any time. You can contact me, contact uh, Ari, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Geraldo. It's, it's uh, 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 our, our great pleasure, pleasure. pleasure. Uh, and uh, to uh, see you and uh, presenting so many and beautiful results of all of your research group. Uh, we have a question here uh, for you, and I I'm going to Thank you very much, and thank you very much for everything. And to see you and uh, presenting so many and beautiful results of all of your research group. Uh, we have a question here uh, for you, and I I'm going to uh, the question is, uh, we have this great biodiversity, high endemic of plants in the Siasu mountain range. There are two voices at the same time.
Now I cannot hear you. Hello? Ari, I can't hear you. Ari, uh, your phone, it's disconnected. Uh, we have this great biodiversity, high endemic of less in the Seattle mountain Hello, everybody. Uh, Geraldo, thank you very much for your brilliant lecture and presenting us all your results of your research group. And there is a, a question here for you. Okay. Um, the question is, we have this great biodiversity and highly endemic uh, plants in Espinhaço mountain range. What do you think about the fungal, the, 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 the fungal biodiversity there in the same Espinhaço mountain range? Do you think it should follow the same pattern of the plants or not? Uh, uh, do you know if there are studies being carried out about this, studying the, the, the fungal <clears throat> diversity in the same uh, Espinhaço mountain range? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, well, I am not a microbiologist, but I do have many good friends who work on, on, on fungus and all the fascinating creatures. Um, yes, um, what, we did a survey in the past of mycorrhizae along the altitudinal gradient. And we found uh, a very large number of species. Uh, at that time, the highest diversity of mycorrhizae in the world in a single spot. Um, and then we look at the distribution of mycorrhizae along the altitudinal gradient. But what we found was that uh, different from plant species, the highest diversity was at mid latitudes. So between 1,000 and 1,200 meters high in elevation, that was the place where uh, richness peaked. So there we found more species. Um, of course, we did look only in one mountain range. And as I said, these mountain ranges, we, I mean, in one mountain area, but the mountain range is, uh, is 10 degrees latitude. So the best thing to do along this uh, mountain chain is look at several mountains so we can have an idea how this change with latitude as well. Um, uh, also, we are looking now at the um, entire um, fun fungus species uh, associated to uh, single genus along the altitudinal gradients, looking at them at the rhizosphere. And then I'm sure you're going to find something uh, quite interesting. But the number of species is very high anyway of, of endophytic fungi 
and mycorrhizae in the Campo Rupestre in this mountain range. Uh, what we don't know is what's causing them, what's causing this uh, very high biodiversity. Uh, Gerald, there is another question here. Uh, yes. From Mona Lisa Ribeiro. Okay. Uh, was uh, I, I, I'm I'm translating uh, on real time, okay? <laughs> uh, it it was verified that some basidio mycete fungi in this uh, cloud forest mm -hmm. are bioluminescent. Uh, I think uh, Ricardo uh, could uh, help and 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 an answer this. Because I don't know if uh, Geraldo, uh, during his field um, experiments and, and, and uh, field surveys, uh, have noticed that uh, there are uh, bioluminescent fungi in, in cloud forests. What do you think? Well, I never yeah. saw one, unfortunately. I wish I could. Uh, well, uh, as I said, you know, um, this ecosystem, which is uh -huh. at the, uh, I mean, very high in elevation, or high elevation, which is not that high compared to the Andes or other places around the world. I mean, um, what happened is that this ecosystem is only being studied right now. The only thing that we knew about it was species list, plant species list. No sample for animals, no sample for fungus. So that means if you guys are interested in, in fungus come to visit, I'm sure you're going to find it many, many interesting and new species. But I, I'll keep my eyes open as we dive into these uh, islands of uh, cloud forest right now. Yes, in fact, uh, one of the objectives to invite uh, Geraldo is that we are going to begin uh, all the fungal diversity and conservation studies in this mountain range, uh, because most of our studies are mainly restricted to the Southern Brazil cloud forests. And now we are going to go upper <laughs> in the direction of Southeast, uh, in, in northeastern parts of uh, cloud forests in, in Brazil. Uh, there is another question uh, from Paula Moraes. Uh, the question Hi, is, <laughs> uh, uh, Dear Geraldo, in the Espinhaço mountain linked to the mountains in northern Cerrado in Tocantins, is it extended to Jalapão? If so, uh, maybe is there, a, uh, there is a connection to Amazon forest. Is it possible? Well, um, I mean, uh, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, we know that the Pleistocene uh, 20,000 years ago there was some sort of connection because the climate was much colder than right now. So we have lots of uh, uh, perhaps some species uh, going down there and up here. And uh, just because, you know, these mountains were connected by climate, you know, it was colder. And as the globe started to warm up, then this connection disappeared. So that, that's why we have many species which are trapped in our warming mountains in, in, in the Spiazzo mountain range. But I don't know um, uh, if there was a very strong connection with the, that region of the Amazon. Uh, what I can tell you guys that I have a very good friend uh, from Göttingen, um, Belling, who is coming to study uh, these old uh, connections between the Spinhaço Mountains with other regions of South America. So perhaps you're gonna uh, have an answer to you, Paula, in the forthcoming years. Thank you very much again, Geraldo. 
and all the, the attendees that uh, sent the, the questions. We are now uh, on time. In, in fact, it's 9.20 and we are going to our first break uh, of the morning. And again, uh, thank you very, very much, Geraldo, for this lecture. Uh, thank you very much. And we are going to our uh, coffee break. <laughs> I thank you guys for listening. Thank you.
uh, dear all, now you are going to have our the first part of our first round table of today. The round table is called Fungal Diversity and Ecology in Neotropical Cloud Forests. Uh, there will be four lectures. Uh, the first one is a lecture that I myself uh, will deliver uh, about fungi associated with the Dreamies angustifolia in cloud forest of southern Brazil. Uh, after that, we have the lecture of Dr. Uh, Joseph Gem from Hungary, diversity and compositional dynamics of taxonomic and functional groups of fungi along an elevation gradient in the southern Atlantic forests. Then the lecture of Dr. Genivaldo Alves Silva, uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. Uh, that will be uh, 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 the, the translation. Uh, this lecture will be in Portuguese. Uh, diversity of macrofungi of cloud forests in Santa Catarina in the south of Brazil. And finally, uh, the lecture of Dr. João Paulo Machado de Araújo uh, from University of Florida and um, uh, uh, New York Botanical Garden in the United States. The, the, the title is The Zombie Ant Fungi in the Brazilian Cloud Forest, Future Perspectives. So uh, let's begin our first round table and I'm going to share with you uh, my lecture. So uh, in my lecture, uh, my lecture will be of fungi associated with Dreamis angustifolia in cloud forests of southern Brazil. In fact, there is a, a, a larger uh, project that involves uh, the fungi associ associated with uh, dead substrates, basically dead wood of Dreamis angustifolia, uh, that, that is exactly what I'm going to show to you now in this lecture. And uh, the fungus associated with living substrates of Dreamis angustifolia that uh, we are going to begin in, uh, in due time. This is the outline of my lecture today. Uh, I'm going to show you just an overview of the study area, the, uh, talking a little bit about cloud forests in the whole world. And uh, then in the area that we use to study, uh, our main character, the tree, Dream is Angustifolia. And then uh, for uh, now, the fungal communities of dead wood of this tree. As you must know, uh, cloud forests uh, in the IUCN global ecosystem typology that was uh, quite recently published uh, is classified as a tropical, subtropical mountain rainforest, and it occurs in all over these areas here, uh, in this map that uh, are in yellow and, and, and red, in, in Americas, Africa, and 
in uh, Asia and Oceania here. It's not uh, uh, that easy to, defi to, to define cloud forest, uh, but uh, as usually uh, these kind of forests occur in mountain top and slopes, uh, are constantly under fog, just in this in this picture here, and uh, uh, they contain unique biotic uh, elements with a high diversity of en endemic plant species. And uh, as you are going to see uh, in uh, during all the this event, uh, also uh, fungal species. And it is a, they are a very fragile ecosystem that is uh, it, it, uh, in terms of climatic change, uh, it, it is very uh, negatively impacted. And of course, uh, it occurs in medium to high elevations in these areas. These are our study area. It's in the southern part of Brazil, more specifically in the state of Santa Catarina and in national park is a conservation unit uh, called São Joaquim. Uh, uh, we, uh, this is uh, an overview of this area. It's about uh, in, in the elevation of more than 1,200 meters, but in average at 1,600 meters. Uh, we studied three plots. This is the name of the plots and at least six, but uh, between six and 10 uh, samples, uh, biological replicates per plot with a total number of samples of 24. So all the criteria of replicability, randomization, it's all applicable. This is our main character, the tree Drinis angustifolia. And why uh, this? Uh, because of uh, its ecological importance for these uh, cloud forests in the, in the southern part of Brazil, because this species, this tree species, is a bioindicator or a biomarker of this kind uh, of forests. So if you have Dreamis angustifolia, you are quite sure that he, uh, this area is a cloud forest. Uh, why? Because it is the most prevalent and the most abundant species in cloud forests of southern Brazil with the highest important value index uh, for the whole uh, tree species community. And it, it, this is an aspect of the edible plant, those flowers, fruits, and, the, and, and leaves. And uh, popularly, the popular name of this plant is Brazilian tapir bark because uh, ethnozoologically, uh, one knows that the Brazilian tapir, tapir when uh, these species, this mammal species uh, is feeling bad in, in terms of <laughs> stomach and intestines, uh, they used to eat the bark of this tree. This is the geographical distribution of this tree along the, the Brazil. Uh, it occurs mainly in, in Atlantic forest and more specifically in these cloud forests and mainly in the Southern Brazilian cloud forest. So this is our case study. Uh, the dead wood, the substrate of Dreamis angustifolia. Uh, our premise is that these three species is the most prevalent abundant tree species 
of cloud forest in southern Brazil. And our hypothesis is that most of the available dead wood for decomposition for the uh, fungi are produced by this tree species in these clouds forest in southern Brazil. So we have some uh, scientific, scientific questions to answer. We are the richness of mutant and taxonomic composition of fungal taxa associated with uh, these three species that would create substrate traits, mostly influence uh, the microbiome composition. And if there, is, uh, if there is any association between this, uh, the, between uh, overall tree species richness in the plots and fungal communities and which ecological functional groups are associated with Dreamis angustifolia that would. Uh, for this, we uh, study and compare fungal richness, abundance and taxonomic composition versus decomposition stage and substrate diameter uh, and fungal taxonomic composition versus substrate position and overall tree species richness in this plot. So these are the substrate traits, uh, the composition stage, substrate diameter, and substrate position, and uh, another uh, environmental uh, trait that is the overall tree species in these plots. Did these our methods? We use an amplicon metagenomics uh, approach using the nuclear uh, uh, nuclear ribosome ITS region as the the biomarker. So we perform. Uh, for all these samples, the DNA extraction, the library preparation, uh, previously uh, with the amplification of, of this genomic region and sequencing uh, using Illumina platform. And then we have short reads. Then this is the, we used a uh, customized pipeline bioinformatics, but uh, uh, as uh, a whole, we have uh, three main steps. The first step is quality control uh, of the, uh, the filters that we use to, to uh, filter all the, the, the reads that uh, have um, ambiguous bases, uh, uh, short, very short reads, uh, uh, compared to a threshold, and then we perform an, an OTU clustering, and then the taxonomic assignment, that is a taxonomic identification and relative abundance uh, to generate the abundance table that it, 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 uh, was used for the community college analysis. We analyze the community structure using the microbiome analyst. We performed a permanent tests using R and to assign the ecological functional groups used from Guild. These are the programs that are used to perform this customized pipeline in bioinformatics. And our associated data are the decomposition stage, that is initial, moderate, and advanced. Uh, stage of the composition of dead wood, substrate diameter from narrow clusters to bigger classes of substrate diameter, substrate position, if it's on the forest soil or suspended, still on the tree, but dead, and uh, the overall tree species richness. These are our rarefaction analysis. Uh, for all of the samples, we have uh, a trend for the asymptote, for the plateau, so uh, we, we have sampling sufficient. Uh, we have identified 465 fungal OTUs uh, with approximately 350,000 reads analyzed. This is our taxonomic composition and relative abundance of these fungal groups. This is a graph uh, uh, that we can see in this network. Uh, the, the bigger the, the nodes, uh, more uh, absolute 
uh, reads we have for that that note uh, here, of course, as an overview, uh, most of the the fun fungal are from Ascomycota, Philomycota, mainly the classes Sordariomycetes, Leuchtiomycetes, and Eurotheomycetes. Uh, we have many, but many unidentified uh, 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 OTUs. That means that we have a cryptic uh, fungal diversity uh, in, in this cloud forest. And then uh, the other phylum uh, that is substantially uh, uh, abundant terms of reads uh, in, of related bonus is Basidium mycota and mainly uh, the class Agaricomycetes. Uh, here you, you can see more individually uh, from each plot here, from the, the three sites that we studied and for each sample. And you can see that uh, uh, at least in a whole terms, uh, the, the samples in each plot are quite similar, but they are uh, quite different from uh, one plot to the other. Uh, these are the exclusive and shared uh, taxon richness of the three plots and the different uh, decomposition is staged, so, so we can see that we have a core microbiome uh, in different sites and also in different uh, decomposition states, but of course we have much more uh, taxon richness exclusive of each site and each decomposition state. Uh, this is an overview of the core microbiome. Uh, this is in the uh, x-axis, the detection threshold in terms of percentage abundance. And here, the OTUs that are the most prevalent and abundant uh, at the same time. So it is a bi-dimensional uh, uh, way approach to, to attack, uh, to investigate the core microbiome. Uh, these are the the, we have these uh, more six representative OTUs. So we have a, 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 a core microbiome and this is the alpha diversity. Uh, we can see that in terms of these general indexes, in, in index for the three uh, sites, you don't have a significant difference, but we have a quite, uh, but, but not at uh, a, a, that significant, uh, but a, a trend uh, to a distinct uh, alpha diversity index for the advanced class of decomposition state. Uh, we don't have a significant pattern of distinction using the beta diversity uh, analysis, uh, 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 neither in, in, in sites or in decomposition states. But when you use the pattern search, uh, we have some correlation uh, uh, genus that correlate with either positive or negative with distinct patterns of, of the composition states as we can see here. But uh, once again, it's not, uh, uh, the correlation is not that big. Uh, when we performed a uh, differential abundance analysis, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, fungal OTUs that are very significant, significantly um, uh, different in terms of abundance in distinct decomposition uh, stages. And when we use an artificial intelligence, uh, more specifically 
uh, machine learning classification by the random forest approach, we can see uh, a, a separation uh, quite clear uh, after 400 uh, uh, decision trees of the three the, the three sites here. So uh, that's what we are going to do more uh, using uh, techniques and approach of artificial intelligence and mainly machine learning to try to better classify and correlate uh, this data than the traditional ones. And we can see uh, quite clear here that some fungal OTU uh, uh, correlates with this classification and they are uh, more related uh, to, uh, the, uh, to one of the sites here. So, uh, with this approach, we can effectively uh, categorize uh, not only uh, uh, regarding the, the the composition stage, but also regarding the different sites. When we perform a permutation on multivariate analysis of Ryan's permanova, now we have a very strong and significantly p-value. Uh, uh, and saying that uh, one of the substrate traits, the diameter of the traits uh, are very significant in, in, in respect of the richness and rel relative abundance of the fungal communities. And uh, uh, to, to end, we also performed uh, ecological functional group analysis, used the fungal uh, program to uh, understand the trophic mode and the guilds that occur in, in different sites and decomposition states as a whole. Uh, uh, the saprotrophs dominate uh, in terms of trophic mode in both side and decomposition states. And most of them are of undefined in the class, undefined saprotrophs uh, of undefined saprotrophs, sorry. I, I, I just, okay, uh, of undefined saprotrophs. And uh, Answering the questions that we have posed in, in the initial part of the presentation, uh, uh, which are the regions among the taxonomic composition of fungal taxa associated with Dreamis and Gustifolia Deadwood, everything were characterized. Now we are doing uh, a more detailed work on each of these taxa. So it's okay. Which substrate traits mostly influence the microbiome composition is the substrate diameter. And it is, uh, according to Permanova, uh, it's uh, highly significant. Uh, and we have a trend if you relax the, the, the alpha uh, significance, uh, we, we can also uh, say uh, that substrate position, we, we have a trend at least for p value, a p value uh, lower than 0 0.1. Uh, is there any association between the overall tree species richness and fungal communities? Apparently not. And which ecological functional groups are associated with uh, the dead wood of this tree? Mostly saprotrophs and mostly. Uh, what they say, undefined saprotrophs. Uh, our next steps will be to analyze other predictive variables to better understand the microbiome structure of uh, these uh, that would substrate of the these highly prevalent, abundant, and uh, those the uh, tree species. Uh, uh, 
by indicator of southern Brazilian cloud forests that, uh, that that produce most of the dead wood for uh, the composer fungi. Thank you very much. That is the 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 site of of my lab, and I invite all the people to to take a look. Thank you very much.
uh, uh, I would like, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure uh, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Josef Gemmel from Esterheis Karoy University of Hungary uh, that will be uh, our lecturer from now on. Thank you very, very much, Josef, uh, Josef to, to be here with us. It's uh, a pleasure for all of us. Uh, I'm going to... Thank you. It is a, a, a great pleasure to have this uh, chance to uh, give the talk. In fact, my talk will be uh, uh, will, will be uh, 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 the one that I pre-recorded uh, uh, for uh, 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 this occasion.
and uh, th th there were only a, a, a few other cases where we saw uh, uh, significant differences among these different habitats, uh, like uh, in the case of uh, calcium and magnesium, where the uh, lower altitude habitats sh show the higher uh, values. And uh, th th there were only a, a, a few other cases where we saw classes. As you can see at first, that uh, when 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 we uh, uh, like uh, measured all fungal diversity, it was uh, highest in the low low mountain and upper mountain habitats. Uh, th this was a. Uh, in in part uh, uh, explained by the high diversity of uh, uh, agarico mitsetes and uh, and saudario mitsetes in 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 the lower mountain habitat, while the upper mountain. Uh, Groups in, in, included the, the Archeo uh, 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 Rizzo, Mitsetes, and l, 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 l. Hi, everyone. I would like to talk about the di diversity and compositional dynamics of uh, fungi along an altitudinal uh, 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 gradient in uh, the Atlantic. Uh, Forest. Uh, this uh, project came as a kind of a spontaneous uh, 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 pro uh, project when uh, we were discussing it with the two friends of mine. You can see here at the uh, uh, Florianopolis Mycological Meeting in 2016. And basically, on the spot, we uh, decided to um, uh, go and uh, take some uh, samples, both in uh, in the island of uh, Florianopolis as well as all uh, 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 the way up to the uh, national park of São Joaquim. And we actually uh, sampled the, the four major ha habitats. Uh, we 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 uh, decided to sample the lowland uh, lowland forests on the island, and then uh, uh, driving up. We uh, stopped at a few places to uh, sample a lower mountain uh, forests. And then in the uh, national park, we sampled the, the upper mountain uh, forests and the mountain grass lands. As you can see here in the picture, the uh, uh, grasslands and the upper mountain. Uh, Forests form a mosaic in the uh, uh, landscape on this uh, plateau, where the these the cloud uh, forests are mostly in, in the uh, valleys of the plateau. In terms of um, methodology. At each of these uh, sites, we collected uh, 20 uh, cores that we, we combined into one uh, 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 composite uh, sample. We, we uh, extracted the uh, DNA there in uh, Florianopolis and uh, uh, sequenced the samples with ISEC to obtain between uh, 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 20 and uh, 30,000 sequences per sample. And uh, with the, uh, for, for the data analysis, I used the uh, uh, Data2 uh, pipeline 
that uh, basically um, this amplicon uh, sequence uh, variants that uh, that can be viewed as uh, 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 genotypes and uh, the uh, main advantage of uh, this approach is that it uh, preserves uh, uh, the information for each uh, uh, genotype in the same species so it uh, uh, it, it doesn't uh, lump uh, uh, different uh, genotypes in in uh, to an OTU as as other approaches I deleted all uh, singletons and used the Hellinger transformed abundances for all uh, the analyses, as you can see here. We also measured uh, soil uh, properties, and uh, 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 quite a few of them uh, 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 showed uh, clear. Uh, patterns along the uh, 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 gradient, uh, clay uh, content, uh, carbon and nitrogen uh, content, and uh, aluminum uh, content were all uh, much, much higher at uh, higher altitudes. And uh, th 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 there were only a, a few other cases where we saw uh, uh, significant differences on, on, among these different habitats, uh, like uh, in the case of uh, calcium and magnesium, where the uh, lower altitude ha habitats sh showed the higher uh, values. In terms of uh, taxonomic groups, in this case classes, as you can see at first that uh, when 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 we uh, measured all of fungal diversity, it was uh, highest in the low low mountain and upper mountain habitats. Uh, th this was a uh, in in part uh, uh, explained by the high diversity of uh, agarico mitsetes and uh, and uh, uh, mitsetes in, in in the lower mountain habitat while at the upper mountain uh, Groups included the Archaea Rizzo, Mitsetes, and Laozio Mitsetes that are known to prefer these cool habitats in other altitudinal gradients studies as well as in uh, as as well as in uh, the arctic uh, moving on to the uh, uh, functional groups on this slide you, you, you can see again the uh, 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 richness and as you can see in the lower mountain uh, forests the actomycorrhizal fungi later decomposes plant pathogens and wood decomposes were the most diverse while in the upper mountain forest root associated non-mycorrhizal species and uh, uh, general uh, 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 saprotrophs were the most diverse. And the uh, pattern is uh, mostly the same in terms of abundance and uh, uh, richness, with an interesting exception of the uh, microparasites that uh, showed a strong degrees along the uh, gradient. In, in 
in terms of uh, community composition uh, you can see here that all four habitats uh, show the uh, 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 distinct uh, uh, grouping with uh, with uh, uh, some overlap between the lowland and the lower mountain habitat and again uh, for the uh, uh, soil properties you can see here that in the lowland there were higher uh, mag magnesium uh, uh, concentration and higher uh, pH than in the high elevations where the, where the clay content and the, uh, the organic matter was higher. This uh, table sh shows the, uh, 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 the explained uh, variation of the environmental uh, uh, factors in terms of uh, community composition. As you can see here on the left part of the table is that habitat explains by far the most in, from the, uh, the differences uh, in community composition among the uh, samples. So in, in this case it explains more than uh, uh, 40% for for the uh, variables that we have actually m m measured it is altitude that that has the highest uh, 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 measure and uh, 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 there is almost a uh, uh, 20 uh, and this basically means uh, uh, mean and your uh, uh, temperature and uh, from the uh, 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 soil properties it was mainly uh, uh, pH, uh, uh, clay content and aluminum content uh, 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 that explained uh, 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 the most. In, the, in, in terms of how the uh, functional group uh, uh, richness and uh, 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 relative abundance, you, you can see on the left that uh, most of the uh, functional groups were more diverse in uh, the upper mountain and the lower mountain uh, forests while in terms of abundance some groups like the micro parasites and the plant pathogens were more abundant in the lowlands. All uh, functional group that is on here had a strong compositional difference among the four habitats. And if we want to uh, look at the uh, distribution of uh, genera inside these groups, you can see uh, that every group had uh, many uh, 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 genera that sh 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 that uh, 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 that uh, showed a different uh, 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 distribution uh, uh, patterns, and uh, that means that uh, different uh, 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 genera. Uh, uh, prefer the different habitats uh, and uh, this also means that uh, we cannot uh, uh, generalize too much in terms of uh, functional groups 
because uh, each uh, genus is uh, quite different f from uh, the, from the others in terms of uh, the, the, uh, distribution and uh, probably in terms of uh, uh, functionality. I also want to mention a few words about ectomycorrhizal uh, uh, fungi because uh, 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 globally speaking they are uh, quite an important group. In the, uh, uh, in the uh, neotropics they are uh, uh, not as diverse as in other parts of the uh, uh, globe, but uh, st still in the few uh, samples that uh, we have analyzed here, we could already uh, uh, find uh, 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 quite a few uh, 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 genera. And uh, f a few of these had been found m before in uh, Brazil. In fact, in the same s s state, by uh, uh, my ecologist from uh, uh, Florianopolis. And uh, so uh, uh, the air uh, uh, sequences that, sh 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 that were generated from uh, fruit bodies or, or from uh, uh, root samples had a high uh, uh, similarity with uh, some of the uh, 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 sequences that we obtained from the soil samples. These included uh, 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 clavulina, species and uh, l l l l and uh, active fluids. Also wanted to mention that there were uh, uh, three other uh, cases where we had high uh, matches and the uh, reference uh, sequences for these uh, uh, came uh, 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 from African countries and from Madagascar, which of course uh, means that uh, these had to be uh, uh, dispersed uh, uh, trans oceanically by humans or not, or maybe by birds or some other means. To, to uh, uh, summarize the talk, based on these a few uh, uh, samples that can mostly mean a, a, a pilot, we, we, we saw that the lower and upper mountain forests were more diverse than lowland forests or uh, or uh, grasslands, and also uh, uh, that about half of uh, the ASVs that we uh, uh, sequenced. Uh, could be uh, could be identified to a uh, genus, and uh, that was the uh, uh, basis for the uh, 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 functional ass ass uh, assignment. I hope that in the future this uh, this uh, proportion will be higher, as more and more species are are uh, uh, described from uh, uh, from uh, uh, this area. As you, as I mentioned, all uh, 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 all uh, functional groups sh show the strong compositional uh, uh, changes along the uh, uh, gradient, and inside these groups there were always uh, a, 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 a different genera that showed the uh, preference to uh, 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 different habitats. Many uh, uh, sequences had high uh, uh, similarities 
to st- st- really unknown uh, species. So definitely uh, more uh, 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 research is uh, is uh, needed here and uh, and 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 as well in the uh, in the uh, near tropics. I want to uh, thank you for the uh, chance to uh, give a, a, a presentation here and uh, for the chance to to actually uh, go t- to these amazing places. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer.
Okay, thank you very much again, uh, Yosef, for your lecture. Very interesting and amazing patterns. And now we are going on. Uh, and then we have Dr. Genivaldo Alves Silva from Federal University of Santa Catarina. Uh, he is now a postdoc of Mind Funga program in, in Federal University of Santa Catarina. And uh, he is taxonomist with experience in molecular biology and phylogenetic analysis of microfungi. Genivaldo. Uh, thank you very much uh, to accept the invitation, and uh, I'm now, uh, it, it's your time. Thank you very much. Aí, uh, eu que agradeço a você e a comissão organizadora do, do evento. Uh, gostaria de falar bom dia a todo mundo e... Uh, espero que todo mundo, todos estejam bem. Como o Ari comentou, eu sou Genivaldo Alves Silva, uh, doutor em botânica pela Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, e atualmente estou como pós-doc no Laboratório de Micologia, Mãe Funga, na Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. Uh, hoje, nesse evento importantíssimo para a diversidade e conservação de fungo das matas embolares, eu... Eu quero conversar com vocês um pouco sobre os resultados que o grupo de pesquisa Manifunga tem, tem encontrado é, com uma palestra intitulada Diversidade de Macrofungos das Matas Nebulares em Santa Catarina, sul do Brasil. E hoje, então, como comentei, estou aqui representando o, o grupo Manifunga. É, nosso grupo de pesquisa, então, está localizado... Caso alguns não conheçam, então, no sul do Brasil, em Santa Catarina, em Florianópolis, é, venham nos visitar, assim que possível. É, o principal grupo de pesquisa, como é, também já diz é, no título da palestra, são os macrofungos, o principal grupo de pesquisa que a Marifunga vem é, se esforçando em estudar, é, levantando esforços para entender esse, esse grupo de, de fungos, que simplesmente... É, são aqueles fungos em base de micrófita e ácido micrófita que podemos observar a sua estrutura evolutiva né, ao olho nu. É, as principais atividades que o grupo vem é, realizando são de respeito a entender a, esses organismos da, de ambientes é, particulares e únicos, como as matas angulares, e nesse caso, ambientes sensíveis, né, inventariar entender a distribuição e conservação nessas espécies, né, os estados de conservação nessas espécies, uh, fazer um levantamento e inventário uh, a longo prazo, uh, principalmente, vou explicar melhor ao decorrer, principalmente em, em parcelas permanentes, a resolução, claro, de complexos taxonômicos, uh, o grupo é, é fundamentado pela taxonomia, então, trabalhamos com, com, com a resolução de complexos de espécies, descrição de, de taxos novos, né, espécies de gêneros, principalmente. E uh, um passo crucial, uh, que o, o simpósio, inclusive, faz parte, que é uh, levarmos a, a informação sobre as espécies, sobre suas características, uh, seus estados de conservação, né, sua importância para o grande público, para a comunidade científica, né, a divulgação do, da científica dos dados produzidos. Então, entrando em detalhes, acredito que colegas hoje já comentaram um pouco sobre sobre o, quais são, quem são as matas nebulares, e eu trago para vocês é, especificamente as matas nebulares neotropicais montanas, que podemos encontrá-las desde o sul do México, né, e na América do Sul, aqui no Brasil, eh, no sul e sudeste do Brasil. É, são são áreas de florestas com que variam, né, pensando em América, América Central e América do Sul, que variam de mil metros de altitude a três mil metros de altitude, e com uma é, diversidade biológica, pensando em funga, única, e com alto índice de endemismo, como 
bem levantou em, em 2017 o juiz de cobradores. Especificamente no Brasil, as, as matas angulares elas são encontradas uh, no sul e, e sudeste do Brasil, variando principalmente de mil metros a dois mil metros de altitude, com diferentes macro, eh, geomorfologias, pensando ali desde a Serra da Mantiqueira, em Minas Gerais e São Paulo, uh, descendo o Serra do Mar e, e Planalto uh, da Serra Geral, com diferentes declives. Essas matas são pequenos fragmentos de naturalmente fragmentos uh, naturalmente fragmentados que permeiam o que nós chamamos de dos mosaicos é, de floresta e campo, né, como vocês podem observar tanto nessa imagem como na anterior, que são pequenas porções de floresta e rodeadas por, por campo e que, ao decorrer do, do passado, é, foram trocando de espaço, né, campo, floresta, foram, foram trocando sua florística, é, seu espaço ao longo do tempo o que forma esse, esse mosaico que podemos observar hoje. Então, são são áreas de floresta, como o nome bem já diz, né, nebular, com frequente permanência é, de nuvens, com alta umidade e com a média é, anual de temperatura é, abaixo, é, temperaturas baixas, o que isso... Uh, bom dia, pessoal. Obrigado, Auri, e à comissão organizadora do, do simpósio. Uh, como o Auri comentou, sou o Genivaldo Alves Silva, uh, doutor em botânica pela Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, e atualmente estou como pós-doc no Laboratório de Micologia, uh, no Mind Funga. E estou muito feliz em participar desse evento importantíssimo para a diversidade e conservação dos fungos das matas angulares. E hoje venho aqui representar o, o grupo Marifunga e conversar com vocês um pouco sobre os resultados que tem, uh, estamos encontrando uh, com estudos de, de, longo, de longa duração, uh, um, então mais detalhes a, a decorrer. Então vou falar com vocês sobre a diversidade de macrofungos das matas nebulares em Santa Catarina, no sul do Brasil. Uh, para aqueles que não, não, não nos conhecem, não sabem onde nós estamos, Estamos localizados aqui no sul do Brasil, em Santa Catarina, no estado de Santa Catarina, em Florianópolis. Quero convidá-los, quando possível, nos visitar. O, o grupo de fungos que o Mar de Funga estuda principalmente são os macrofungos, macrofung, macrofung, como bem diz a, a palestra aqui, que nada mais é do que aqueles fungos em as de micota e as micota, que podemos ver, né, observar a olho nu as suas estruturas reprodutivas, ou seja, 
o seu uh, esporomas. As principais atividades que, que o Marifunga, que o grupo de pesquisa Marifunga vem desenvolvendo, de respeito à, à pesquisa uh, desses organismos em ambientes únicos, como as matas angulares e sensíveis, inventariar e entender a distribuição desses organismos e, e os seus estados de conservação, né? é, realizar um monitoramento, um inventário a longo prazo da, dos marcofungos, né? da funga, principalmente em, em parcelas permanentes. Ah, e, claro, a, 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 a fundamental estrutura do grupo, é, o qual o grupo é formado principalmente são os taxonomistas, ou seja, Uh, fazemos sim a resolução de, de problemas taxonômicos de complexos de espécies, uh, realizamos a descrição de novos taxa, espécies, de gêneros novos, e, por último e não menos importante, uh, e que o simpósio aqui faz parte, que é a divulgação desses resultados, levar as pessoas, levar a comunidade científica e não científica, uh, a importância desses organismos e, e como eles estão... É, qual a sua composição na natureza e como eles estão distribuídos. Ah, agora, mais, com mais detalhes, o que então são as matas nebulares? Alguns colegas aqui já comentaram um pouco sobre isso hoje. Eu quero trazer para vocês, ah, principalmente, o entendimento das, das matas nebulares neotropicais, ou seja, as que ocorrem nos neotrópicos, é, as matas nebulares neotropicais montanas. Elas podem ocorrer aqui desde o sul do México, América Central e América do Sul, aqui no Brasil, Sul e Sudeste. É, pensando em, em, nessa distribuição tropical, elas ocorrem de mil metros a três mil metros de altitude e, como bem levantou o Omo Ruiz e colaboradores em 2017, apresenta essas matas, essas matas ambulares, apresenta uma diversidade de fungos única e com alto índice de endemismo. Então, ficamos com isso em mente. No Brasil, as, as matas nebulares, elas, como vocês podem ver aqui nessa imagem, elas podem ocorrer principalmente no sul e sudeste do Brasil, mas principalmente no sul, uh, variando de mil metros a dois mil metros de altitude. Elas, como o nome diz, são matas com predomínio, com predomínio das, das nuvens, né? com predomínio frequente das nuvens, com alto índice de umidade, e com a média de temperatura anual baixa, o que é um dos filtros ambientais importantíssimos desse, desses ecossistemas. Ah, então, como comentei, ela, ela, no, no sul e sudeste do Brasil podem variar de mil metros a dois mil metros, e pensando na sua geomorfologia de clives, elas podem variar bastante, pensando desde a Serra da Mantiqueira, em Minas Gerais, São Paulo, e Serra do Mar, descendo Paraná, Santa Catarina e Planalto da Serra Geral em Santa Catarina e Rio Grande do Sul. Elas são uh, fragmentos de, de mata, uh, são naturalmente fragmentados e formando o que nós chamamos de mosaico, de floresta e campo, que ao decorrer do tempo, uh, tanto a, a a composição desses dois ambientes foram trocando de, 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 de ambiente ao decorrer do tempo, né, com ah, épocas glaciais e tudo mais. Então, apresenta essa distribuição que, que vemos hoje. É importante destacar, pensando em funga, que pensando em fungos que tem como hospedeiro né, plantas e animais, principalmente, e é, como a Ari comentou, é, da, dos endófitos em brindos angustifolia, as principais espécies de plantas que caracterizam as matas embolulares no sul do Brasil, é, podemos citar três, de que são a angustifolia, que é uma das principais espécies do docel dessas matas, e a araucária angustifolia, que mesmo não sendo encontrada é, com frequência no interior das matas nebulares, elas são encontradas principalmente é, nos, nos campos ao redor dessas matas nebulares. Então, são três espécies uh, que caracterizam bem a, a presença de uma mata nebular ou não. E entrando 
no que o grupo de pesquisa Magfunga vem desenvolvendo. Eu posso comentar com vocês que é, esse trabalho nas matas ambulares, ele, ele vem desde 2011, no Parque Nacional de São Joaquim, então, desde 2011 que uh, o grupo de pesquisa vem uh, uh, realizando esforços de amostragem, de inventário nessa, nessa área, aqui em Santa Catarina, principalmente pensando nas parcelas permanentes do, do Programa de Pesquisa de Ecológica de Longa Duração, do EPBio PELD. E, mais recentemente, uh, o grupo uh, foi, está sendo financiado com um projeto que tem como objetivo uh, entender e, e pesquisar uh, os macrofungos ameaçados nas matas angulares em Santa Catarina e também a inovação na identificação de espécies, ou seja, aqui o PRONIM, que é um projeto importante do grupo, que tem como objetivo entender e inventariar outras áreas de altitude em Santa Catarina. Então, a partir desses dois projetos, principalmente pensando nesses longos anos, nesses 10 anos, de 2011 a 2021, pensando em arredondar, 10 anos, alguns dos resultados importantes, a riqueza de espécie encontrada é altíssima e vários problemas taxonômicos foram foram alimentados né, com dados a partir dessas, dessas, dessas coletas, desses inventários. E eu trago para vocês, por exemplo, dois, dois, dois taxos, duas espécies publicadas como novas em 2016, Androide neotrópica em 2020, mas recentemente como Tipória nubícola. Androide neotrópica encontrada em bacres uh, nos campos, ao redor das matas ebulares, e fumo de pólen nubícola encontrado exclusivamente em drimens angustifolia, em árvores vivas e mortas, no interior né, dessas matas. E trazendo para vocês um panorama geral da diversidade de, de fungos, de macrofungos, né, pensando em basilicota e ascomicota, uh, até 2018, a partir de dados do PNCJ e também em literaturas em literatura de trabalhos anteriores, haviam ao menos 160 espécies, morfoespécies que de macrofungos que ocorriam, que eram registrados como ocorrentes em matas angulares em Santa Catarina. E, com, como vocês podem observar, com, uh, esses fungos uh, sendo classificados principalmente em poliporais e, e menuquetais. E, mais recentemente, eu não comentei, uh, com o PRONEM, Desde, desde o ano passado até agora, realizamos cinco expedições a campo e com além do, do incremento dessas coletas e, e com o incremento aqui é, entre 2018 e 2021, com teses, dissertações realizadas no PNCJ, é, podemos contabilizar ao menos, é, podemos dizer que ao menos nós temos 700 espécies, morfoespécies de macrofungos, é, classificados principalmente nessas três ordens de, de base micota, mas também alguns em raça micota, hipocreales, pesisales, chilariales. E pensando especificamente em, em base de micota, as três principais ordens que, que, de espécies que encontramos nesses ambientes de altitude, uh, poliporales e agaricales aparecem com uh, praticamente igual frequência e, em seguida, imunoquetais e ursulares. Isso, é, além, é claro, de um montante de ao menos 17 ordens, com algumas espécies sendo encontradas uma vez ou duas. Então, uh, temos diferentes uh, frequências relativas dessas, de ocorrência desses esporomas, dessas espécies. Eu trago uh, em detalhes aqui algumas uh, coletas interessantes de base micota para vocês. Uh, uma delas é um possível microporelos, que se uh, confirmado sendo desse gênero, no Brasil, na, na região neotropical, nós temos cinco espécies aceitas a partir de um trabalho recente de revisão morfológica, porém o grupo carece de dados uh, filogenéticos, então... Uh, essas coletas desse material, como de outros, seria importante para preenchermos essas lacunas de informação, né, documentar essa diversidade 
Outra espécie interessantíssima é a Equinoporia aculeífera, que é um gênero, uh, Equinoporia é um gênero com três espécies descritas atualmente, somente três espécies, e é um gênero que uh, está classificado em esquizoporas, em e, e com, com dados moleculares também muito escassos. Então, também serão informações importantes para preenchermos lacunas de, da história evolutiva desses grupos. Outras duas espécies, é, uma é Coutrícia, uh, uma, uh, um gênero estipitado de minoquetás, uh, micorrísico, uh, micorrísico. Eu, eu destaco isso porque é o grupo, uh, é o único grupo, grupo, grupo micorrísico em, em, em minoquetás, que é um grupo de, de uma família com espécies encontradas uh, uh, gratando madeira, principalmente, e a coutrícia, as espécies de coutrícia, é um dos grupos que primeiros divergem, são os primeiros a divergirem ao, ao analisarmos uh, o grupo uh, imunoquetóide, né, em imunoquetais. Então, dados moleculares desse, desse gênero serão muito, muito importantes para entendermos uh, as relações uh, entre famílias e as delimitações de famílias em imunoquetais. Além, pensando também nesse mesmo sentido, uh, pseudoígeno, CF, uh, gelatinosmo também, com um, classificado em auricularialis, tem como família uh, incertas séries, ou seja, ainda não tem uma resolução filogenética de um posicionamento quanto a, ao seu nível familiar. E... Da mesma forma que base de micota, base de micota as, as amostras, as espécies encontradas, os espécimes encontrados de asco micota também, também são igualmente importantes e igualmente uh, novos para a área e para a ciência como um todo. Aqui eu trago, um, e vou explicar melhor, a composição dessas, dessas ordens. Aqui aparece hipocreales com uma grande... Uh, hum questão desses uma grande questão desses, desses registros acompanhados de pesisales e estilariales uh, eu trago duas espécies uh, com dados importantes para os seus respectivos grupos aqui uma possível espécie de orbília que no Brasil uh, são os dados são escassos de orbília e uma curiosidade ecológica desse gênero é que algumas espécies são encontradas uh, como capazes de, de capturar nematóides. É, são dados ecológicos importantes para as comunidades. E outra coleta interessante é de um possível microglossum, que no Brasil nós conhecemos somente a, a microglossum RIC e esse microglossum RIC somente da sua localidade do tipo. Então, ambas coletas vão preencher é, lacunas é, das, da taxonomia de cada um dos grupos e da história evolutiva de cada um dos grupos. Então, como comentei, quando, por que, que nós temos essa composição de ordens aqui com hipocreales em grande maioria? Eu trouxe isso aqui para destacar a importância ah, de inventários de macrofungos como um todo, mas também... Por exemplo, aqui é o exemplo de uma dissertação que, tem, que está sendo realizada em uh, uh, ascomicota uh, entomopatógenos, então uh, cordíceps e ofrocordíceps. Então, o incremento na diversidade de trabalhos uh, focados né, em determinados grupos ecológicos ou morfológicos vão incrementar, sim, a diversidade encontrada. E uh, algumas amostras do que essa dissertação é, vem levantando, são uh, cordíceps e ofrocordíceps, em diferentes ordens, outros gêneros em, em hipocreares, encontrados em diferentes hospedeiros uh, de insetos, né, diferentes insetos, uh, lepidópteras, coleópteras, uh, aracnídeos e assim por diante. Espero não ter 
ido muito rápido aqui na minha a, apresentação dos resultados, os principais resultados a, da diversidade encontrada de macrofungos nas matas angulares em Santa Catarina, mas eu gostaria de concluir com alguns pontos importantes a, do, do desenrolar né, desse inventário uh, desse inventário de longo prazo que vem sendo realizado no PDSJ desde 2011 e agora com o incremento de novas áreas pelo com o, através do PRONIM uh, eu venho aqui destacar uh, a importância de acessarmos e documentarmos né, com boas práticas a, a diversidade de fungos como eu vim, eu vim pontuando ao decorrer da minha fala que ao levantarmos essas essas espécies, várias lacunas de, de conhecimento vão sendo preenchidas, sejam elas ah, taxonômicas ou ah, evolutivas de cada um dos grupos. Ah, foi confirmado aqui, pensando lá em Homo Ruiz, que ah, a partir de uma revisão de literatura eh, e de coleções de todas as matas embulares neotropicais, ele, eles pontuaram né, que a diversidade, a riqueza de espécies nas matas embulares são tem um índice altíssimo, também como o endemismo foi aqui também, claro, com dados com os resultados preliminares, foi também observado tais informações com alta riqueza e endemismo. É importante mencionar que o um inventário de longo prazo é uma oportunidade, né? isso nos oportuniza coletar espécies raras, ou até mesmo aquelas espécies que, devido à sua biologia particular, ela vai apresentar a, o seu, as suas estruturas evolutivas, né? os seus esporomas, a cada cinco anos, por exemplo. Então, se você vai uma vez, vai duas somente, você talvez não encontre essas espécies. Então, é importantíssimo esse, uh, esse contínuo, né, levantamento de uma de uma única área ou de algumas áreas selecionadas para que possamos detectar essas espécies e preencher né, esses gaps, esses, essas informações quanto às suas as histórias evolutivas de cada um dos grupos e sejam eles é, informações taxonômicas de grupos problemáticos ou não. Se é isso, eu gostaria de agradecer uh, novamente ao, ao a organização do simpósio, uh, destaco novamente a importância de, de eventos como esse. Uh, gostaria de agradecer também todo o grupo de pesquisa Mainfunga, uh, seu coordenador e os pesquisadores envolvidos, como também a Universidade de Educação Santa Catarina, o, o programa de pós-graduação em Biologia de Fungos, Alves e Plantas, Laboratório de Micologia, e os nossos financiadores, CNPq, CAPES, PAPESC, Uh, e, recentemente, o Muhammad Bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund. Muito obrigado.
Thank you very much, Genivaldo, for your lecture. It's very interesting and, uh, and amazing, the new species from the southern Brazil cloud forests. And now we are going to finish our round table of, the, uh, of this morning uh, with the lecture of Dr. João Paulo Machado de Araújo. Uh, João is now in currently in the University of Florida in the United States, but uh, after uh, the, the next semester in July, uh, he begins a permanent position in the New York Botanical Garden. João, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And now it's in your hands. Thank you very much, João. Prazer te ver. All right, thank you all. Let me share. So I hope everybody is, is seeing this properly. Então, ah, primeiro eu gostaria de pedir desculpa para os meus amigos brasileiros aí, mas como o congresso está sendo todo em inglês, eu vou seguir a, a, o padrão e vou continuar em inglês. Tá? Mas podem per fazer perguntas depois em português ou me escrever separadamente que eu respondo. Tá bom? So I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present my work on the zombie ant fungus and other beautiful aspects of their uh, lifestyle. So my talk is called The Zombie Ant Fungi in the Brazilian Cloud Forest, Future Perspectives. Future Perspectives because I have been myself just once in the Parque Nacional de São Joaquim, but was enough to see its great potential for new discoveries. And so there is a student of Ricardo um, Wesley that he is studying uh, these entomopathogens there right now. So I will show some of his data he collected and we'll introduce uh, the group first and all the beauties behind its biology. So I will introduce the evolution of Pocrealian fungi, which is the order these, the zombie ants are, are within. And I will move to the, the zombie ants themselves and talk about their biology and other different aspects and then explore a little bit of the behavior manipulation and then jump into the, our finding, our last findings from the São Joaquin uh, National Park and the preliminary data. So to start, uh, I would like to, to start showing this uh, phylogeny of hypocrealian fungi. So here in the, in the beginning of the tree, we can see that this is the, the, phylo the round phylogeny of the order and the, as we can see the, the lineage, they were uh, originated as a plant associated lineage, which is represented by the, the dark green uh, branches. And this group, we see a, a huge diversity of plant parasites and, and some plant endophytes as well with few insect and fungi associ associated taxa. And as the group was evolving here, here a split that originated uh, Cordyceptaceae and other families. So we can see here that it originated as a fungus and then as a fungus associated taxa and then moved to the spider associated taxa and then originated the Cordyceps. So here we have the three major families of entomopathogens. We have Cordyceptaceae or Cordyceptaceae in Portuguese or uh, Claviceptaceae and uh, Ophiocordyceptaceae. So just zooming in, um, in those three distinct families, the major families, we see that the origin of Cordyceptaceae started as a micro, most likely as a mycoparasite or at least a fungus associated with another fungus. So, and this first lineage is represented by the Hippocreaceae family. And then a transition here occurred and originated the Cordyceptaceae family. So as we see the basal, uh, groups in Cordyceptaceae are mycoparasites, which are represented by Simplicillium and other genera. And the evolution of Cordyceptaceae started in the, in the arthropods uh, association, started as a spider association. So we see the basal lineages here associated with spiders. And then on beagles, uh, so here we don't know, it's still we need more taxa to strengthen 
these uh, associations here and define the, the host associations in this clade. But this originated uh, these huge uh, genus, the Cordyceps and Bovaria acantomyces and many other genera. Moving to the next family, Clavicipitaceae. Um, it, according to our data, it was originated uh, from um, a fungus associated with uh, scale insects, hemipterans or cochonilia in Portuguese. And as they diverged, this lineage here, which is still ambiguous, the, their, their origin, which um, originated Metarhizium, which is a really uh, important and, and famous genus of anthropopathogens. And so we don't know its uh, origin yet, but we know it came from uh, hemitran insects, but we don't know exactly how this transition from hemitran to Lepidoptera and other insects took place. But we know that we have here the, um, uh, a clade, important clade of uh, endophytic fungus, hypocrialian endophytic fungus yeah. like Epi Epiclo and um, other fungus like Balancia and Atkinsoniella. And here a small clade with uh, mycoparasites. So there was a two, uh, three interkingdom host jumps here from insects to plants, which are the, endo, uh, the symbionts and another jump here from plants to fungus. So from insect to plant and then to fungus. So three interkingdom host jumps, really interesting family to study. And the, the, the last one is the Ophiopordicipitaceae which are the zombie ants. So the, the ant associated taxa are represented by the, the red branches here. So there are two main lineages of ant associated taxa. One is called isuteloid, which means that they have the asexual stage uh, as the isutella, which is a, a fat cell with a long and big neck bearing a spore at the tip. And we have another group here that we still don't know exactly their how the transition from beetles, which means the, the, blue, the blue branches mean associated with beetles, to this um, new clade here. So we don't know the origins yet, but we know for sure that there are two main origins of ant associated taxa. One here, which are the unilateral, of cordyceps unilateralis is here, for example, and of cordyceps australis is here, for example, I will show later. So, but just keep in mind, there are two different origins, two clades within Ophiocordyceps that can be called zombie ant fungus. Well, zombie ant fungi, as we can see here, the goal of this slide is to show how beautiful they are. So, and, and it's not super difficult to do that because they are really photogenic fungi and they are really beautiful. Even here in, in the pictures or in, in the, in the forest, they are, they are very, very tiny, but if we look at the hand lens, we'll see how, how beautiful they are. And they are obviously really diverse, as we can see, and they infect uh, a, a broad diversity of different hosts. There are two, uh, there are four uh, main uh, complexes in, in this genus. So one is unilateralis, which is close related to Nephophioides. They, they're, they both are within the uh, isuteloid clade, that first clade I, I showed. And Ophiocordyceps australis and Lloydia and few other groups are the neocordyceps or the hemianosteoboids, which is that clade, the second clade associated with ants. But now for the sake of uh, explanation and just to, to show the basic biology of these fungi, I will use the unilateralis, which is the classic and a more complex uh, species of the classic zombie ant fungi. So that's, that's how we recognize them in the field. It's really easy. So they are always, doesn't matter which species within this clade, they are always biting onto the substrate. In this clade, they are biting an epiphyte or liana. And, <clears throat> and later on, a few days later, uh, the fruiting body will grow. The asexual stage is this stalk that's covered by isotella cells and sticky spores. And this part is called the ascoma. And they are uh, uh, responsible to produce the sexual spores or the ascospores. So that's a close up of this ascoma. And to do the taxonomy of this group and to study their morphology and their spore and other microscopy features, we need to section this uh, structure, the ascoma. And then it will, we will see this beautifully 
arranged pericytia that will produce ascos within. That's why the name ascomycete. So they produce the ascos and the ascospores within the ascos. So there is these chambers, and inside these chambers there is really long sacs uh, bearing uh, eight or multiples of eight spores. Sometimes it had 64 spores in, in one assay. And from these, um, from these structures, these spores will be shot. We have um, preliminary data showing that one single specimen can produce up to 300,000, 300 mil spores, uh, just one specimen. So here is uh, some aspects of why studying uh, ant associated taxa is important as a model study. So mostly because of the host aspect of the story, because ants are really well known and we know them really well, the ecology, their phylogenetic relationship, their diversity, behavioral life history. They have real fossil records that help us to calibrate phylogenies and do co-phylogenies. And of course, they are most abundant animals in tropical forests and they are everywhere, ants. And most importantly, the host remains identifiable after fungal infection. So we can identify the host. We know the whole species. So this way is much easier to relate functional morphology of the fungus with the, the host biology or the host life, lifestyle. And that's how a taxonomic plate looks like in this group. So here we have one, two, three, about eight to 10 new species just to show how, how we describe these species. So here we have a photo of the, the specimen, and then we have a cross section of the, the ascoma. And usually we have the, the, the pericytia to show the shape of the pericytia. So there are different shapes and different arrangements and different sizes. And ascospores, including the germination. Look at this uh, secondary spore here. Those are uh, trapping structures. So once the spore is shot and, and lays on the forest floor, it will grow the secondary spore and produce the secondary spore that's sticky. So once the ant is walking through these spores on the ground, these spores will eventually uh, stick to the ant and invade their body. So that's just to show how taxonomic plates looks like. And there is about 30 to 32 uh, species within these myrmecophilos or ant associated taxa. So describing new species is of course important to un un unravel the diversity of, of fungi in general, but also help us to create a, a phylogenetic framework for the more complex uh, studies. For example, these systematics studies and also uh, many other aspects, including the behavior manipulation, which is why they're called zombie ant fungi. So the behavior manipulation, which can be also called extended phenotype, which is a term coined by Richard Dawkins in 1982. So that, that is used to illustrate um, a phenomenon in which the fungus genotype, so the genes of the fungus is expressed on the phenotype of the host, which is the behavior manipulation. So the fungal genes are controlling the ant, basically that. So that's why it's called extended phenotype. And one of the aspects we proposed was the, and to illustrate how cool the biology of these fungi are, we proposed that this behavior manipulation is started from, uh, well, so the Ophiocordyceps fungus originated from uh, uh, ancestor associated with beetle larva. And only here, which is, uh, which is illustrated by the blue branches and ant associated taxa are represented by red. So we can see that the origins of the genus was a beetle associated taxa. And here we see a host jump from beetle to ants. And once they, they jump to ants, we can note here a big radiation. So the, the ants are promoting uh, biodiversity in fungi, we can say that. And once they switch from beetle to ants, we see also uh, the behavior manipulation started here. So our hypothesis is that both the ancestral of the, the beetle infected and the ancestral of the ant related taxa, which is about here, our hypothesis is that they were um, on the forest floor, on the, uh, living on the soil or in the tree trunks where the ancestral ants used to live and where 
extant species, the species we find nowadays, we find today infecting beetle larva, they inhabit these uh, trunks. So our hypothesis that due to the niche overlap, so the ancestral lineage of this fungi infecting beetle larva would have jumped to the, to the ant colony. However, once this lineage jumped from beetles to ants here, and in here in the, in the, in the trunks, like 100 million years ago, something like that, this uh, niche overlap facilitated the transition from beetle to ants. However, once this lineage here jumped from beetle to ants, they were exposed to something called social immunity, which is the immunity that the superorganism or the ant colony uh, display as a group. So they together, they recognize fungal infected ants and they kill these workers to avoid the uh, fungal disease to be spread across the, the ants nest. So our hypothesis is that the social immunity was a driver, driving force that, for, that, that, um, that forced the, the, the evolution of this trait. So the, this uh, social immunity forced the, the, the fungal lineage to remove the, the, the infected ants from the, 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 the nest, from the trunk, to climb up to a, a, a summit position or a, a leaf. This way, the, as the, the fungus remove the ant from the nest, the, the other workers cannot remove this ant here. They cannot kill. So the, the ant will bite here and shoot the spores from above to, the, to the, in the, the forest floor. And ants that leave the nest to forage, they will get eventually infected. So social immunity of the ant likely was the driving force that uh, uh, um, gave origin of the behavior manipulation. So I could spend hours here talking about behavior manipulation, but just showing a quick example that is not just one behavior manipulation, but within this group that change the behavior of the host, we can see that they, they can drive the host to, to die onto the base of trunks in the Amazonian forest, where it's humid because of this moss, or in minute ants, they, they uh, make the ants to climb onto these uh, pines of, uh, um, sp uh, sp uh, sorry, spine, uh, pine, uh, sp no, I'm sorry, is the, um, so these are our, our uh, tip of palm trees. So we have these spines pointing downwards. So in every morning, a drop of dew is formed at the tip of these spines of the palm trees. So th this way, the fungus, the, the, the fungal driving the end to die here, it will ensure that it will have the source of water every day in the morning. So it, this is a really clever way to ensure that it has water every day. And another aspect here is fungus that are, are, are uh, lead to, to die onto tree trunks. And this way they will produce these fungal uh, structures that will uh, infect passing by ants that eventually touch these uh, structures. Another interesting aspect is that in the tropics here, we see that these fungi tend to bite onto twigs and temperate forests, they tend to bite, sorry, in tropical forests, they tend to bite onto leaves, which is represented by the, these green icons. And in temperate forests, they tend to bite onto twigs. So to uh, leaves in the tropics, twigs in the temperate system. That's because uh, in the tropics, the leaves are there all the time. In, uh, in contrast with the temperate forest that they bite onto twigs because the leaves will fall on the, the fall season, the autumn, and the fungus would not be able to, um, to overwinter and, and reproduce in the next year. And we also found that biting twigs arose at least three independently times uh, along the evolution of these fungi and that the ancestral state is biting onto leaves. Another just to wrap up the, the introduction of uh, these zombie ants, another interesting aspect is that they're mycoparasites. It's a really rich diversity, unexplored, of course, of, the, of fungi mycoparasitizing these fungi. So this is really interesting. So it's an ant infected by, or another insect, infected by an entomopathogenic fungi that is infected by another fungi. So there's a three trophic relationship here. And now I will show a little of our preliminary data. 
of uh, Parque Nacional de São Joaquim. So it's really unique environment. It's a high altitude. And we have these, um, these fields here that are, they don't have large trees and, and, and like huge vegetations, but it's more short. And we have these entrances in, in the, I, I don't know the name of these, the, these valleys that they get really humid and we have clouds here. That's why they're called cloud forests. And as we study these fungi here, it, it looks like there's just a few trees here, but once we get in there, the environment changes completely. So you basically move to another world. So you, you just change. It looks like you went through a portal from being outside of the forest. And once you enter in the forest, it looks completely different. This looks like a Lord of the Rings movie, right? So it's really beautiful. And all the trees are covered on moss and lichens and many other types of epiphytes and has some streams. And it's really great place for anthropopathogenic fungi. So I visit this place a few years ago with Joseph Gemmel that just gave a talk and Ricardo that will give a talk later and it's one of the organizers of this symposium and his students and we went there to sample. I went there just for two or three days and we didn't find too many uh, fungi because it was quite dry back then, but we still find some cordyceps um, infecting Lepidoptera pupa. We found these unidentified hosts, these really, really strange um, Ophiocordyceps. We have this naked periticia, so they're not immersed. And in the first day, we found quite a lot of zombie ant fungi. And we could split them into at least five to seven morpho species. But they were dry because the, the environment was quite dry back then. And but we have to hydrate the fungus. So they were quite dry. And once we brought them to the lab, they were hydrated and started to shoot spores. So we just collected the spores. And even with these really simple, this was a really, really simple microscope, like these size. And I took the pictures with my own phone. So this is really preliminary, but we can, we can actually see that these spores are more, are different among each other and the spore, is a really great proxy to split these species. The spore is a really important taxonomic feature to be looked. And we can even see here that these spores are more chunky and that these are straight and darker and these are more curved. So these traits indicates that we have for sure at least three new species of zombie ants there based on only two days of sampling. And interestingly, most, the vast majority, like 95 or even more percent of these ant parasitized fungi, they were biting onto epiphytes, onto uh, these uh, mosses or uh, lichens or other different epiphytes. And other interesting aspect is that this, fun, this species there uh, display a really interesting feature is that these asexual structures here. So these asexual structures is only found in another species in the Atlantic rainforest in Minas Gerais state. And these structures here, as I said, is the asexual uh, transmitters of conidia. So those are conidia that are produced from these filaments uh, that grows from the, the leg of the ants, um, in addition to the, of course, to the sexual stage here. So this is really interesting fungi and that would be really interesting to investigate how the ants get infected by these uh, presumably sticky spores. And even queens can be infected. That's a queen of Camponotus. And in the case of queens, most of the time they can produce multiple stalks here because they have more resources because the ants are bigger. And we even found uh, these really interesting species infecting these um, fungus oh. gardening ants, the, the, one of the leaf cutter ants, Acromyrmix. It was by a, 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 a waterfall in this, um, uh, pteridofta, this fern tree, it's in Portuguese called shashin. And we found them, th these uh, ants there, infecting there. So this is the second clade, the hymenosteoboids, and this is certainly a new species, which we found in the same group, also infecting uh, Camponotus queen. And as we can see, they produce multiple stalks because again, the queen uh, has more resources. And now there's a, as I mentioned, that is a student, Wesley Nardis, is uh, working with this with uh, Ricardo and myself. And he found, uh, which is for sure four new species, maybe not this one because 
Camponotus melanoticus is also infected in Minas, but we need to compare the features to see if they are different species or not compared to Minas. But this is much more robust, and this is slender and dark, and this is this ant is black, and this ant is really slender, and the, the fungus is, is different from the other ones. But when we look at the microscopy, it's totally different from each other. And just to, to finalize, I'd like just to show a few of the, the, the findings. This is one of the most amazing specimens I saw in my life. I didn't collect it myself, it was where Wesley collected this recently. But this is really amazing. I have absolutely no idea which is this, not even the family. I wouldn't know which family is this. I would say Ophiocordyspacy, but we definitely need to look at that. It could be easily a new genus. I think this might be a new genus. It's totally unique. I've never seen anything like that. So they're really, really uh, unique fungi in this reserve. So as we can see here, just as a, a last uh, slide, so we see here the uh, tarantula infected by Cordyceps calloceroides. These beetles infected by Ophiocordyceps curculionum sensulatu, it's a group, or gibelulas that uh, infect spiders, other beetles. And here is staphylinid beetle, it's really interesting beetle that has uh, vestigial wings here. So, and this produce a really strange fungus that is likely an Ophiocordyceps and larva infected by this uh, Paraisaria fungus and Ophiocordyceps on uh, Ophiocordyceps melolonti infecting uh, beetle uh, larva. It's really large and produce really chunky um, fungus. And Acantomyces tuberculatus group, which th this one is a new species for sure. This is a most likely new species, 100% sure is a new species, might be a new species, might be a new species. So there's a bunch of new species just waiting to be described. So what is the true diversity of entomopathogenic fungi in Brazilian cloud forests? We, we just don't know. We are still starting to understand that. And as we move forward with that, we can build up the phylogenetic framework. And as Jenny Valdo just pointed out, we, as we build this frame, uh, phylogenetic framework, we can move forward and ask more complex questions regarding the evolutionary pathways uh, of these fungi and how they evolved in, related, in relationship with their hosts. So there are two different aspects to look in these associations. So I wish I had more time to show more photos and videos, but it has to be on the, another occasion because time is limited here. So I would be happy to take any questions you might want. Então, se vocês quiserem fazer alguma pergunta, pode fazer no chat ou me adicionar no, no, no Twitter, que eu sempre estou adicionando é, fotos novas de, de espécies novas e respondendo perguntas das pessoas lá. Tá bom? Então, muito obrigado pelo convite e por todos por estarem aqui é, assistindo essa, essa palestra. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you.
Okay. João, thank you very much for your amazing and very interesting lecture and so many uh, uh, unknown fungi from, from Cloud Forest, especially here in, in the southern Brazil. Uh, and now we are going to begin a, a brief session of uh, discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we have a uh, very short of time and then uh, only some of many, so many questions that we received will be uh, answered uh, uh, live, uh, in live form, okay? The other will be answered uh, by chat. So uh, I will begin in the order of the, the lecturers. Uh, uh, in my case, uh, there is a, a question from Mona Lisa Ribeiro. Uh, professor, have you ever uh, thought of doing the analysis of sequencing by nanopore technology? Yes, of course, <laughs> we, we, are, we are currently doing that. We have this in the, in, in the lab. Uh, we mostly, we uh, have been mostly using this for genome sequencing of, of complete uh, genomes of fungi. But of course we can do and use uh, a, a long read nanopore technology to do that. There is some, some questions of doing amplicon metagenomic using nanopore, but now you can use hybrid uh, uh, assemblies and so on. So yes, definitely yes. Okay. Uh, one question for, for Joseph. Uh, Joseph. Uh, from Kelmer Martins uh, uh, Cunha. Joseph, do you consider that the elevation gradient has a direct influence in the community composition or it influences other variables displaying an indirect impact in the fungal community? I guess I, I have to start with the translating the altitude into uh, uh, variables that the uh, fungi themselves can uh, feel, of course. So I think uh, most of the uh, 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 the explanation of that is the uh, 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 changes in the temperature along the uh, gradient. So, I mean, altitude is uh, basically the the uh, mean annual temperature. But at the same time, of course, uh, there are also changes in other aspects, like. Uh, 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 precipitation, uh, 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 relative hu 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 humidity, and as you saw in my talk, uh, the uh, 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 soil uh, 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 variables can change as well. Uh, for the most part, uh, uh, predictably, like in uh, in the upper um, um, mountain zone, the uh, 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 soil carbon mostly is higher, and the pH is uh, lower. And, uh, and that may be 
because of the uh, slower uh, uh, rate of uh, decomposition at the uh, lower temperatures. So, of course, all these uh, in, in uh, environmental aspects, of course, uh, not only influence the uh, uh, fungi, but the plant communities as well, and also uh, uh, the animals. So it's hard to tease these apart. Uh, that's why I, I uh, used the, the uh, uh, per manova analysis to at least uh, uh, try to account for the co uh, correlations among uh, the uh, variables that I have measured. But, but there are many more that that we don't that that we that we do not have information about. So yeah, it, it is a complex uh, question indeed. Okay, uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, for Genivaldo. There is a commentary of Gustavo Menecucci that uh, he's always developing an, a, a, an inventory and wants to, to talk uh, to you a little bit. And for João, uh, we have uh, two questions here. One for, from Malgorzata Mikalska. Sorry if I didn't uh, uh, pronounce correctly in your own language. Uh, the, the question is, what are your predictions about the number of species awaiting description? Okay, and the second one, João, just to, uh, does, from Fernanda Garcia, does every species have a specific host or are there generalist species? Very interesting because generalism versus uh, uh, specialist species. John, the first one, please. All right. So let me start with the second one because it's more okay. simple. So there, <laughs> there, there, are, there are some groups that are. Um, so it was in Portuguese. So should I answer in Portuguese? Joan, uh, uh, I, I prefer that you answer in English because oh, that's fine. The international right. one. But as the the, the second question was made by a, a Brazilian, if you could translate just after, mm -hmm. uh, I will, yeah. uh, it, it will be mm -hmm. very good. Right, so there are uh, different, different scenarios. There are some genera, for example, Metarizium and Boveria, there are generalists, while other genera like Gibelulus only infect spiders. And there is one species that infects scale insect, but this is another species or different, but we need to sequence that to confirm. But the zombie ants groups always infect it's one to one, one fungal species, one ant species. So for the zombie ants is really, really specific as for the majority of species in anthropathogens. So now translating, there are some genes of fungus that are generalists, like Boveria, Metarhizium. So they infect a large number of hospedeiros. Enquanto a maioria dos gêneros de anthropathogens are very specific. É uma espécie de fungo para uma espécie de hospedeiro. A espécie de hospedeiro é muitas vezes até usada como um proxy, né? ou como uma indicação de que aquilo é uma espécie nova, porque geralmente é um para um. Então, se você acha um hospedeiro que ainda não foi é, é encontrado infectado, provavelmente aquilo é uma espécie nova. Isso é particularmente é, verdade para as formigas zumbis. Então, todas elas que a, gente, que a gente achou até hoje, mais de 30 espécies, todas elas infectam uma espécie diferente de formiga. Tá? Então, existem, a minoria dos gêneros são generalistas e a grande maioria é especialista. Uma espécie de fungo para uma espécie de hospedeiro. Now, back to the first question, the estimations. I can, I can say something for the zombie ants, because that's the group I dedicated more time and my PhD was on that. So, I, I studied zombie ants for about 10 years, the diversity. And I have a colleague that is myrmecologist. He studies ants in Brazilian Amazon as well. And he collected over 10,000 specimens. 
So we know that there are at least 32 species of Camponotini ants in the Amazon, which are the, 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 the hosts of the classic zombie ants, the Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. So in, among these 32 species there are in the Amazon, I found 17 are infected by Ophiocordyceps unilateralis species. So it's about half, so roughly half. So roughly 50% of all Camponotus species are infected in the Amazon. We are absolutely sure it's more, but let's be conservative and keep the 50%. So if we extrapolate worldwide, there are 1200 species of this Camponotini species worldwide. So if we extrapolate, if half of those are infected, we end up with an estimation of 600 species to be described. But this is an underestimation. I believe it's more, but this is just to show how we calculate how these, how many of these species there are, again, based on the host identification and biology. Okay, thank you very much, João, Genivaldo, and Yusuf for this uh, round table. And now we have, unfortunately, to finish it because uh, uh, we are a bit late and we have uh, another lecture uh, uh, just now. And so thank you very much for the so uh, prophetic discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alison, Alison.
Ok, obrigado. É... Well, now we are going to uh, uh, the, uh, the last session of, of uh, this first day in the morning. I would like to introduce uh, uh, Clara Baringo Fonseca. Uh, he, she is biologist from University of Barcelona and Master, Master of Science in Climate Change Management. Uh, from Aidney E. Eberswald in, in Germany. Uh, nowadays, she, act, she uh, is the manager of biodiversity data on the information system about the Brazilian biodiversity, the famous SIBBR that every uh, researcher in Brazil that works with biodiversity knows a lot. Uh, Clara, thank you very, very much for your uh, for accepting the invitation. É, muito obrigado. E é, agora é com você. And now it's up to you. Thank you very much. É, hi. Olá a todos. Eu vou falar em português, mas vocês podem fazer perguntas em inglês ou em espanhol. É, vou compartilhar aqui minha tela. Acho que está tudo bem, se não alguém pode reclamar. Então, tudo sim. Está ótimo. É, então, boa, boa tarde. Primeiramente, queria agradecer o, o convite de última hora para falar sobre o sistema de informação sobre a biodiversidade brasileira, é mais conhecido como o CBBR. É como falou, é, meu nome é Clara e eu sou responsável pela entrada de dados e informações bem como a operação da plataforma, produção de conteúdo e apoio à equipe da, de TI. Dúvidas, sugestões sobre a plataforma, precisando de suporte para a organização dos dados, interesse em divulgar um conjunto de dados, imagens, deixo aqui meu e-mail. E minha apresentação é de domínio público, vocês podem usar, misturar, compartilhar como vocês querem, quiserem. É... Ups. Aí. Acredito que muitos dos participantes já conhecem o CBR, mas caso que alguém não conheça o Sistema de Informação sobre a Biodiversidade Brasileira, é uma plataforma nacional online de acesso livre e gratuito que integra dados e informações sobre a biodiversidade provenientes de fontes diversas do Brasil e do exterior. Eu deixo aqui embaixo o, o link de acesso à URL. É, a minha apresentação é breve, não é técnica focada no, no reino fungi, mas é, é para vocês conhecerem um pouquinho mais o, o, o sistema e vou mostrar algumas novas é, ferramentas e, e funcionalidades da plataforma. É... Ai, ai, ops. Então, primeiramente, o CBR é uma plataforma coordenada pelo Ministério de Ciência e Tecnologia e ele é operado pela, pela RNP, que é uma organização social que oferece infraestrutura e rede de internet para vários ministérios, inclusive eu, da educação, defesa, cultura e ciência e tecnologia. Vou mostrar um pouco o, o CBR, é um, é, é um projeto GF do Fundo Global para o Meio Ambiente, foi aprovado em 2012. É, os dois primeiros anos, os recursos desse projeto foram direcionados para, para trazer dados para o sistema, dados, estou falando dados de ocorrência de espécies, uma evidência que fala que uma espécie foi encontrada naquele lugar e naquele momento determinado. Quem tem esses dados são as coleções biológicas, é, grandes acervos como o Museu Geude, o IMPA, é, o Museu da USP, é, o Museu Nacional, o Jardim Botânico do Rio de Janeiro. Então, o grande esforço desse projeto foi trazer, por, me, é, mediante a implementação de bolsas, a pessoas que iam digitalizar esses dados e colocar em planilhas para colocar no sistema. O projeto, o CBBR, foi lançado em 2014, 
2014, 2017, foi a implementação do projeto, parcerias, bolsas, capacitação em padronização de dados, digitalização de informações. Continuou, foi durante os três anos. 2018, a gente institucionalizou o sistema, é uma porteria do MCTI. 2018, foi, foi passada toda, todo o projeto para a RNP, para ela manter e operar o sistema. É, 2019, a gente lançou uma nova plataforma, pois não estava, a 2014, não estava atendendo toda a integração de dados que a gente precisava para cobrir a biodiversidade brasileira. Então, a gente, em agosto, lançou a nova plataforma que eu vou apresentar agora. 2019 também foi o ano que o CIBBR virou representante, o um membro votante da rede do DIB, participando ativamente das decisões da rede e dos editais que apoiam a capacitação e entrada de dados no CIBBR. Então, agora a gente participa ativamente das decisões e prioridades do DIB e, além disso, é, pode ser candidatar a editais e a outras é, atividades do DIB. Então, o, queria mostrar aqui que o, o CIBBR vem crescendo bastante desde o seu lançamento. Como podemos observar aqui no número de instituições, coleções, conjuntos de dados e registros de ocorrência, foi lançado em 2019 com 191 coleções e quase 15, mi, 15 milhões de registros. 2020, no Congresso de Zoologia, último congresso presencial até hoje, é, a gente conseguiu... É, cadastrar mais coleções, aumentou mais um milhão de registros, e agora, em 2021, a gente continua crescendo com mais coleções e mais registros de ocorrência, bem como outras instituições. Além disso, a gente está lançando sempre novos módulos da plataforma, e eu queria mostrar também esse módulo de regiões, que é bem interessante e é uma novidade agora para a plataforma. É, antes eu queria falar um pouco do DIB, eu já sei que todo mundo deve conhecer, mas para quem não conhece é interessante. O CIBBR é o representante brasileiro do, do DIB, uma rede intergovernamental com uma plataforma de dados e informações em biodiversidade do mundo todo. Tem mais de um bilhão e meio de registros e mais de 1.600 instituições publicadoras. É o DIB que ele... ele desenvolve padrões é, e ferramentas para a gente conseguir publicar dados e compartilhar dados no mundo todo. É, essa aqui é a rede do, do DIB. É, tem gente que é membro votante, que são os, os que estão em verde, e eu tenho os, os participantes associados, que eles são observadores, que não participam ativamente, mas fazem parte da, da rede. Eu fiz uma pesquisa com, com fungos, é, talvez já foi mostrado aqui no, aqui no Congresso, mas se não é interessante, a gente tem aqui no, tem 21 milhões de, de registros de ocorrência de mais de 234 mil espécies, tem imagens e tem a taxonomia completa. É, quando a gente faz uma pesquisa para o Brasil, mantendo o reino fundo, a gente diminui bastante a os registros de ocorrência, tem 252 mil registros. E quando... Gente, ah, bueno, e aqui eu queria mostrar também a busca de, do Reino Fund também no, no CIBBR. É, essa aqui é a cara do, do sistema. É, a gente pode colocar é, o Reino Fund e a gente vai obter os resultados os resultados com mais de 4.841 espécies é, catalogadas no, no CIBBR e os pontos de ocorrência de espécies de, desse reino. Já queria navegar um pouquinho para a plataforma, eu, a minha internet está um pouco instável, então assim, eu decidi fazer um sprint screen, mas vocês podem acompanhar isso online, ao vivo, no sistema. É, esse aqui o, é a ficha de espécie, da ficha para o taxon, fund, a gente tem uma, um menuzinho aqui na o é, um menu de acesso a várias informações, temos os, os registros, é, temos também a classificação taxonômica do, do reino, a gente, essa classificação é interativa, então a gente pode ir descendo 
nível é, taxonômico até a espécie, e ele vai ir mostrando todas as informações e, e fichas sobre o taxo. A gente tem também uma, uma web service, um consumo automático de informações do GenBank. É, então, é por espécie, ele puxa, ou por taxo, puxa todas as informações associadas a esse taxo. Se a gente quiser saber quem tem informações ou, ou espécimens e amostras dentro dos herbários ou, e, e de fundo, a gente tem aqui, umas, aqui os parceiros de dados, a gente tem aqui todas as instituições que têm dados sobre ocorrência de, de fungo, e a gente tem aqui os registros, então você pode clicar numa, num, aqui nos registros e vai diretamente para você observar a base de dados, inclusive você tem aqui ops, foi mal, a licença de uso desses dados. É... Então, mas antes de tudo, é super importante, fundamental para o funcionamento do CBR, a gente sempre fala isso para todas as palestras, é mostrar que o CBR trabalha com a lista oficial de espécies brasileiras, é um banco taxonômico nacional, é fruto de duas iniciativas que juntou mais de 300 taxonomistas brasileiros, curadores de coleção e outros especialistas para catalogar e elaborar essa lista oficial de espécies. E a... A flora do Brasil é, a, é, a, é a, a iniciativa, é o catálogo que inclui toda a parte de, de fungos, que não microscópicos. É, mas, então, é importante falar desses dois catálogos, porque a, a taxonomia é a chave para o funcionamento do CIBBR. Então... Uma vez a gente tem a taxonomia completa, a gente tem vários módulos na nossa plataforma, como o catálogo de espécies, os, os, as ocorrências, camadas ambientais e listas de espécies, imagens multimídia, que validam as informações junto com a taxonomia. Se a gente colocar um dado com a, com uma, com a taxonomia antiga, uma espécie virou um sinônimo, ou, assim, a gente, o sistema bate é, com a taxonomia e corrige os dados. Como vocês podem ver aqui, o valor original numa planilha de um pesquisador ou de um publicador foi, colocou um filho que já não existe, um antigo, e o, o sistema validou a taxo, com a taxonomia oficial e corrigiu para facilitar as buscas dentro da plataforma. É, outra das ferramentas interessantes do, do CBBR são a, as coleções biológicas, a gente tem um catálogo de coleções, então você aqui no, na aba busca e analise, pode colocar busca por coleções, e vem aí o um mapa com todas as coleções de história natural do, do Brasil, pelo menos as cadastradas, a gente ainda está cadastrando coleções, a cada, o cadastro é voluntário, mas a gente sempre tenta recomendar fazer esse, esse, esse cadastro, porque é, uma, é a vitrine que para para ver que essa coleção existe e, junto com outras. Então, quem não tiver cadastrado a sua coleção, a coleção pode entrar em contato comigo. Então, aí a gente pode selecionar aqui no mapa uma, uma coleção. Eu, eu escolhi a da Herbário do Departamento de Botânica da, da Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. A gente pode acessar os dados clicando aqui em ver registros. Tem uma informação sobre o que é a coleção, a finalidade, etc. É, aqui a gente tem todos os registros, você pode fazer umas, um, uns filtros por tipo, de, por tipo de, de forma de vida, por exemplo, aqui escolher os, os fungos, e você tem dessa, desse herbário 9.213 registros de ocorrência de fungos. Aqui, o que eu estou falando em vermelho, é isso aqui é uma linha de uma planilha de dados. Aí você pode clicar aqui em, em ver registros, e você vai ter as informações dessa ocorrência, desse registro, informações associadas ao, ao evento, a taxonomia, o, a parte geo e outras informações. Quem publicou, quem coletou, quando coletou, e todas as informações... Ops todas as informações. 
É, então, e outra, outra ferramenta que eu queria mostrar também, que a gente lançou recentemente e ainda está trazendo, to, indexando todos os dados nessa, nesse módulo, é o Regiões. O Regiões é uma ferramenta ótima para gestão, para manejo da conservação, política pública, que ele permite fazer buscas por região. Por região. A gente colocou umas camadas ambientais, tem aqui a biomas, regiões, estados, municípios, o C estadual, municipal, é, federal, de uso sustentável, de uso de proteção integral. Então, eu vou, eu vou colocar um exemplo aqui de por estado. A gente escolheu Santa Catarina. É, aí você clica aqui no, em Santa Catarina e aparecem todas as informações da região. Isso é possível fazer é, por, por C, como eu falei, e, e, outro, e biomas, por exemplo. Aqui você tem a classificação, as espécies e por, por grupo taxonômico. E nesse caso, você pode baixar os dados, você pode ver os registros e os dados em outras plataformas dentro do CBR, como é o Portal Espacial. É, aqui a gente já entrou no Portal Espacial e o Portal Espacial é um pouquinho mais... É, mais organizado e com mais possibilidades de, de, de análise de informações. Por exemplo, a gente aqui agora pode adicionar bases de dados. É, a gente pode filtrar por atributo, então por coluna da planilha, de uma planilha e pode adicionar camadas, por exemplo, aqui adiciona uma camada de UC, e você pode clicar em cada ponto, que você vai ver as, as informações associadas a esse, a esse registro. Outras ferramentas muito interessantes que a gente tem aí no CBR é o cálculo de área de ocupação e extensão de ocorrência de uma espécie. Essa, esse cálculo é a mesma metodologia que usa a UCN, então, assim, a gente pode plotar os pontos e clicar nessa ferramenta, que ela vai calcular a área de ocupação conforme a metodologia da UCN. É, aqui temos o resultado. E essa, essa, esse... esse esse resultado a gente pode exportar em, em, com mapa, com pontos, ou a gente pode pegar o URL e trabalhar ele no ARGIS ou no QGIS para continuar análises talvez um pouco mais elaboradas. É, então, agora estou quase no final, talvez eu fui muito rápido, não sei se tem ainda mais tempo, mas eu queria mostrar outra ferramenta que o CBR que tem, que é uma página de espécies icônicas, brasileiras e a gente não tem as espécies icônicas de fungos e a gente gostaria muito uma uma força tarefa para construir essa lista e e a gente publicá-la e divulgá-la com os as informações e o devido crédito de quem organizou essa lista e de onde que saem essas informações é, para publicar uma lista de espécies, uma, uma, uma lista de icônicas, é bem fácil, no CBR a gente tem a parte de participe, e nessa parte de participe tem publique um conjunto de dados, que tipo de dados a gente pode publicar no CBR, são dados de ocorrência de coleções biológicas, tem lista de espécies, tem dados espaciais, imagens, sons, é, tem a parte de metadados apenas, de projetos, dados ecológicos e outras informações, como descrição de espécies, é, etc. Nos passo a passo aqui, a gente também tem umas planilhas para download, que são um template, uma, uma planilha já padronizada, em Darwin Core, que é o padrão que a gente usa para publicação de dados, e tem um formulário de cadastro onde você preenche os metadados de, de escolhe a licença de uso da lista, o, um, como deve, você deve ser citado, e os metadados, a descrição, o autor e o título. Então, é, é basicamente isso, é, e muito obrigada.
Thank you very much, Clara, for your presentation. It, it, uh, this, the, the system is fantastic. It's uh, uh, global and, and national and regional and um, multi-scale, so uh, many filters uh, for everything, primary data, uh, metadata, associated data. So it's uh, uh, very, very important that everybody, especially here uh, uh, in Brazil and for the, the frame people who wants researchers, who wants to uh, make, um, want to make searches in, in our uh, biodiversity. Uh, muito obrigado. I, I'm going to, to speak in both languages. Muito obrigado, Clara. Eu acho que é, foi fantástica a palestra e é importantíssimo para que todos entendam e usem né, e alimentem esses BBR. Tá? Temos três perguntas. We've got three questions. One uh, from uh, from my dear friend, <laughs> Professor Leonor Costa Maia, from Federal University of Pernambuco. Leonor, tudo bem? É uma honra. Você está aqui assistindo, Leonor, coordenadora né, da parte do INCT de, de, de fungos, né, que foi um dos, dos, dos das bases de dados citadas. É, Leonor Costa Maia is one of uh, the coordinators. que é a responsável pela atualização da taxonomia, que é o catálogo taxonômico da flora do Brasil. Eles atualizam no sistema quase diariamente, mas e aí a gente pega essas informações e coloca, coloca no Banco Nacional e coloca no, no, no CBBR. A gente ainda não estabeleceu uma periodicidade constante, a gente tem vários fatores... Tem áudio... Tem que começar de novo? Tem que começar não, de novo? Como que é? Não. não. Ah, então. Tá ah, então. Tá ah, quando a gente quando... É, atualiza a taxonomia e coloca no sistema, a gente precisa de um processo de reindexação completa de todas as ocorrências de espécies. Então, a gente tem que atualizar, sim, a, a taxonomia, mas não pode ser cada dois meses, porque o consumo de recurso informático é muito elevado, porque se mudou um sinônimo, apareceu uma nova espécie, os 16 milhões de registros, junto com a lista de espécies, precisa ser reindexado para para para, para fazer o match, para, para mostrar os, os, os dados. Então, acho, acho que isso é uma coisa que a gente precisa decidir com vocês, que são os responsáveis de, da taxono, taxonomistas. É, uhum. Se vocês acham que seriam uns três meses, talvez quatro meses, semestralmente, ou como que deveria ser. 
E a parte da taxonomia, acho que já respondi quem é o, os responsáveis, é a Flora, a Flora 2020. Então, a gente, a gente referencia eles no sistema como a Flora, do, Flora 2020 do Brasil. Ok, just making a, a summary of ok. <laughs> Uh, uh, for the, the, the first part of the question about how frequent the data are updated uh, almost daily, okay? Uh, as for the second part, which is the references for the, uh, to update the classification of fungal species, uh, they, they, this is BBR, use the Flora do Brasil 2020. Okay, that's the, the, the main points. Uh, the other question for, for Clara is from uh, Dr. Paula Moraes, uh, and she's asking if the platform uh, also uh, accepts uh, data from a microscopic fungi. Microscope, not macroscope, microscopic. Então, eu acho que no Flora 2020 eles não contemplam né, os microscópicos. É, a gente está com uma demanda é, para ter uma lista taxonômica de micro-organismos, incluindo os fungos microscópicos. A gente não tem ainda uma lista oficial. A gente uhum. quer... quer trazer os, os especialistas nessa para elaborar essa lista oficial para colocar também no sistema. Uhum. Então, ainda ainda a gente está com essa demanda atrasada, mas precisa mesmo, porque micro também é uma é o um mundo e a gente precisa colocar também na, na plataforma. É, é, making a, a summary of the, the, the answer, uh, this is BBR, uh, currently Uh, does not uh, have uh, uh, data registers, records uh, uh, about microscopic fungi, but uh, the idea is to have a list of all the culture collections and then uh, they will be, in, in a near future, they will be a part of this BBR. Uh, as the macroscopic fungi, okay? Uh, Clara, uh, the last question is because you present in, a, in the slide, uh, in one of your slides, the iconic species, and unfortunately, there were no uh, fungi uh, still there. <laughs> So uh, I would like to know uh, what is the next steps to have this? É, a ideia é, é montar a lista. É, a gente pode, não sei, vocês, grupo de trabalho de vocês em, em, em elaborar essa lista. É, a gente está em contato com o pessoal que organiza esse esse simpósio. A gente já publicou uma lista, é, a primeira lista de fungos ameaçados, é, validada pela UCN. Essa lista é muito legal, a gente já tem ela publicada no, no sistema. É, e a ideia é a gente ir construindo juntos essa lista de icônicas, é, também com a descrição das espécies, tem muita, muitos dados para serem inclusos. É, então, assim... É, a gente pode entrar em contato junto é, e a gente publica essa, essa lista de icônicas. Aí a gente publica no ambiente de homologação para vocês validarem que todas as informações estejam corretas e depois a gente sobe para a produção, para divulgação. Queria deixar é... claro que o PR não, 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 não produz dados, não tem acervo. Os dados são de vocês, para vocês. É, então, assim, é, o crédito é só, só do pessoal que trabalha mesmo com isso. Great, perfect. Just to make a, a rapid summary, I, I have asked her uh, about uh, the next... Oh, uh, uh, desculpe, fazer a tradução da pergunta em português. Eu perguntei uh, o que fazer né, para já citar as espécies icônicas de fungos. Uh, 
uh, I have asked uh, about the, 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 the absence of iconic species of fungi. And she asked us that the first list of uh, endangered fungi of Brazil uh, has already been done, uh, especially uh, with the Federal University of Santa Catarina Mind Funga uh, Research Group, uh, leading by Dr. Ricardo Drexler Santos, who is one of the, the, the uh, with me, one of the organizers of this symposium. And uh, in a very near future, we will have uh, in the in the CSDVR the iconic fungal macro fungal species uh, uh, records in the the system to be searched. Once again, uh, thank you very very much, Clara, for your lecture. And uh, I hope that all of you uh, who is uh, attending the, the, the symposium, uh, we will finish uh, uh, this morning <laughs> section, okay? Then we will have a lunch break and we will begin uh, after the lunch. Uh, I would like to to ask for, uh, 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 apologize for the problems uh, that we have. Uh, of course, all of our team have uh, trained a lot. We have constantly uh, uh, tried to, to, to make all of these presentations and so on, but always, uh, some unexpected problems <laughs> emerged. So uh, sorry for these the, this problems in the transmission. I hope that uh, at the afternoon today we will have uh, a much much more uh, calm <laughs> transmission. Okay. Thank you very much. And now uh, we finish the first part, uh, morning section of our symposium. Thank you very much for all of you.
Then we are now uh, beginning our afternoon section here, session here in, in, in GMT minus three in Brazil. Uh, and this is the second part of the fungal diversity and ecology neotropical cloud forest round table. We will have four lectures. Uh, the first one uh, that will be the, the, the speaker of the, the, the following uh, lecture will be Dr. Emerson Luis Gumboski from the Joinville Regional University in the state of Santa Catarina in Brazil. And he will uh, talk about lichenized fungi in cloud forests from southern Brazil. Uh, Emerson, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and it's now uh, with uh, on your hands. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Just open the presentation here. Um, okay. So uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, but I will um, speak in Portuguese because my English is not so good, sometimes with beer, but it's <laughs> not the case. Uh, and I have a, a lot of students here and I hope you will enjoy. The, the lecture is uh, right in English, so I think that you could um, follow the, the, the explanation, okay? And then uh, we have uh, questions after. Bom, pessoal, uh, primeiro, muito obrigado à, à comissão organizadora pelo convite. Eu fico extremamente feliz de poder uh, divulgar esses, de certa forma, né, esses dados aí uh, iniciais, uh, mas bastante expressivos para o que a gente tem encontrado. Então, eu vou falar sobre os líquens uh, das florestas nebulares aqui do sul do Brasil, especificamente a uh, de Santa Catarina, né? Aí uh, as primeiras, né, incríveis impressões que a gente tem encontrado. Eu sou professor da região da Univille, né, da Universidade da região de Univille, e leciono nos cursos de biologia e biologia marinha. Uh, e aí, felizmente, uh, até por uma amizade com o professor Ricardo Dresta, uh, eu acabei entrando também no no projeto Mind Funga, de certa forma, e a gente está coletando, pelo menos a minha parte de coleta vem a partir do ano passado, né, no na final, de, final de 2020. Então, o que eu vou apresentar para vocês hoje é basicamente o que a gente encontrou do final do ano passado até agora, ou seja, o tempo é curto, mas de coleta, inclusive, <risos> mas eu acho que vocês vão conseguir entender bastante, né, desculpa, vão entender bem do que, que a gente está falando, tá bom? Então, assim, primeiramente eu tentei fazer uma busca a respeito do que a gente já sabia sobre fungos liquenizados em matas nebulares né, na América do Sul. E, dentro disso, né, procurei basicamente no Recent Literature on Lichens, uh, no site, justamente, trabalhando com a palavra-chave, né, Cloud Forest. Uh, e aí, para minha surpresa, foram apenas 31 artigos que eu encontrei. Eu realmente esperava mais no primeiro momento, mas aí, lendo os textos uh, e também, de certa forma, pegando um pouco da história do que a gente tem aqui no Brasil, né, eu realmente compreendi que são áreas de difícil acesso, né? Então, geralmente. Então, faz sentido também a gente ainda ter pouca pesquisa sobre fungos liquenizados nessas áreas. Tá? Desses 31 textos, basicamente, cerca de 40% né, uh, pertencem à América do Sul. A gente tem outros uh, textos da América Central, América do Norte, uh, e desses da América do Sul, principalmente esses quatro países que tratam né, de alguma, em alguma esfera, não necessariamente toda a diversidade uh, liquênica desses ambientes, mas Colômbia, Bolívia, Equador e Venezuela têm informações né, em que cloud forest é, é uma das uma das palavras-chave no texto, né, ou no título, enfim, tá bom? Uh, infelizmente, ou felizmente, eu não sei necessariamente qual <risos> seria a expressão, mas a gente não tem ainda nada exclusivo né, para florestas nebulares no Brasil. Tá? Certamente a gente tem textos, uh, aliás, espécies registradas em outros momentos, mas, enfim, 
algum artigo que fale exclusivamente dos líquens em florestas nivulares do Brasil, a gente ainda não tem. Tá? Então, compilando esses dados que, que eu encontrei, né, a gente tem aí por volta de 250 espécies uh, de fungos liquenizados para a América do Sul. Tá? Esse número é relativamente baixo, se a gente pensar justamente na diversidade de líquens que a gente conhece né, ao redor do, do globo, mas eu deixo aqui um apontamento importante que Certamente a gente tem mais espécies né, em artigos que não trataram exatamente de florestas nivulares, mas tem exemplares dessas regiões, tá bom? Então a gente tem muito mais informação, certamente, entretanto aí precisa de um estudo muito mais, uh, muito mais fino, né, muito mais uh, laborioso. E até pelo pouco tempo que eu, que eu tenho de execução desse projeto, né, eu ainda não consegui fazer esse tipo de, de análise mais ponderada de ambiente, tá bom? Mas a ideia é que futuramente eu possa fazê-lo, né? Parcerias, espero eu, tá bom? E, bom, o que, que a gente tem, então, né, de fungos liquenizados, ou o que a gente sabe de fungos liquenizados para o Brasil? Né? Então, o Brasil ele tem mais de 4 mil espécies de líquens né, registradas, e aí a gente né, pode ter uma discussão a respeito do que a gente considera como sinonímias, nomes antigos e tal, mas para a gente ter um parâmetro né, de número, esse número é bastante expressivo. E logicamente que contando, né, porque a gente tem uma, um número de descobertas de espécies novas bastante expressivo ao longo desses, pelo menos dos últimos 20, 30 anos. A gente tem muita coisa sendo descoberta, que é absolutamente fantástico, né? Uh, entretanto, dessa quantidade grande de espécies que a gente tem de líquens no Brasil, a gente tem pouca coisa registrada em mata nebular. Tá? Até então, que eu consegui apurar, a gente tem por volta de 40 espécies, ok? Uh, uma boa parcela delas uh, é, diz justamente respeito aos estados do Paraná e Santa Catarina, né, que compreendem a região sul do Brasil, uh, junto com o Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, entretanto a gente tem algumas questões né, relacionadas a, a, a esses textos também, né, com, com espécies ou revisões de gêneros, por exemplo, né, com espécies perdidas no sentido de não citado o ambiente. Né? Então, coletou em alguma, alguma cidade potencial, mas não registrou exatamente o ambiente. Então, fica difícil a gente encontrar esse tipo de, de informação também. Tá? Então, essa compilação de dados ela vai tomar um tempo, mas certamente ela é bastante importante para que as coisas ah, sejam melhor compreendidas, né? a diversidade seja melhor compreendida nesse ambiente. Tá? A gente também tem a questão de São Paulo e Rio de Janeiro, que tem ambientes né, a, que podem conter essas matas nessas né, florestas, ou minimamente os ecossistemas de, de altitude, de mata nebular, nesse sentido, e assim... Temos esses ambientes lá, entretanto, muitos dos registros, inclusive registros históricos, eles não constam, né? eles não têm essa informação clara. Então, é bastante comum né, de alguns registros históricos ter a localidade, talvez, a, a município né, em que foi realizada a coleta, mas não necessariamente o ambiente. Então, como a gente também tem municípios que são extensos, né, a pessoa, o pesquisador pode ter coletado tanto, por exemplo, em topo de morro, quanto na base do morro, né? e aí os ambientes acabam se diferenciando. Então, a, ali precisa, de novo, de um trabalho mais complexo para a gente entender. Talvez existam essas espécies nessas regiões, a, acredito que sim, tá? ou talvez não, a diversidade a, registrada até então né, seja ainda baixa. Tá? Mas são só algumas características que eu gostaria de, de apontar nesse momento. Tá? E aí o que a gente sabe, então, dos líquens para o sul do Brasil, né? a região sul aqui, que tem essa, essa característica, digamos assim, né? de um misto entre um clima subtropical, tropical. Né? Os estados eles têm umas diferenças bastante expressivas em ambientes né? entre eles. Né? A gente tem Mata Atlântica, a gente tem uma, um fragmento de cerrado no Pará, no Paraná, <risos> desculpa, e até o Bioma Pampa no Rio Grande do Sul. Então, percebam que temos né, importância, uma, uma diversidade importante em, em, em biomas, inclusive. Tá? A gente tem no Rio, na, na região sul aí por volta de 1.500 espécies né, de, de fungos liquenizados já registrados, sendo que o Rio Grande do Sul é o estado, digamos assim, mais bem conhecido até o momento, 
né, em comparação com Santa Catarina e Paraná. Santa Catarina deve ter aí agora, atualmente, por volta de 700 a 800 espécies, não, não sei o número correto, e o Paraná talvez aí por volta de 400 a no máximo 500 espécies registradas. Então, vocês percebem a discrepância né, de, de, de informação que a gente tem. Tá? E ainda assim, né, aqui para a região sul, 1.500 registros, mas poucas né, indicando né, que ocorrem em florestas uh, nebulares. Tá? E dessas poucas, aí, cerca de 30 espécies. Tá bom? A gente tem bastante uh, dúvidas ainda com relação ao que a gente né, tem de biodiversidade real né, para florestas nebulares no Brasil como um todo. Tá? Tratando-se de líquens. Dos outros grupos também, mas estamos falando de líquens aqui, né? E algo que é bastante interessante é a gente apontar as questões, por exemplo, até de ambiente, né, fatores abióticos né, com relação ao ambiente, ou seja, a gente pode comparar áreas né, mais ensolaradas, áreas abertas, né, e aí a gente pode considerar, por exemplo, campos de altitude, né, ou mesmo borda de mata, em comparação quando a gente tem né, áreas mais assombreadas, como geralmente o interior da mata. E aí é muito importante porque a comunidade de líquens também re, a, responde a esses fatores. Né? Então, a, inclusive, até em, pelo que eu tenho conhecido aí nesses, um, vai lá, nesses 12 anos de, de estudo de, de diversidade de líquens e percorrido, felizmente, uma boa parte do, dos ambientes de altitude aqui de Santa Catarina e do Paraná, dá para perceber... Uh, essa diferença de comunidade, né? aquelas que habitam ambientes muito mais abertos, muito mais expostos à intensidade uh, luminosa, uma comunidade diferente, diferenciada, que ocorre na borda da mata, certo? E uma outra comunidade que é aquela que ocorre nas áreas mais sombreadas. Logicamente que a gente sabe né, que na liquinologia, uh, espécies que ocorrem em áreas bem sombreadas, bem densas, né, geralmente tem uma diversidade menor. Entretanto, a gente precisa pesquisar para saber se isso é realmente real. Tá? Aí a gente tem o mesmo esquema, tem registros históricos, mas nem todos eles, né, ou a maioria deles talvez, não traz esse tipo de informação. Então, né, dado esse, essa introdução aí, a gente começou a estudar os líquens também em florestas nebulares em Santa Catarina. Então, só para situar né, a nossa região aqui, né, o Brasil, Santa Catarina aqui no Rio Grande do Sul, e basicamente nesses três pontos que eu marco aqui, Benedito Novo, São Bonifácio e Urubici, são as três áreas né, de alta montanha aqui que a gente ah, realizou as coletas nesses últimos meses. E, né, felizmente, as coisas foram bem legais. Ah, então, a gente encontrou aí 65 famílias, 105 gêneros e 462 espécies. E contando, né, esses números, ah, eles também dizem respeito a, a taxons que eu estou utilizando como unidades né, para trabalho, porque, enfim, a gente queria já ter uma noção do que a gente está tendo, entretanto, né, várias espécies para confirmar, vários gêneros apenas em SP, taxons que a gente sabe que são diferentes, mas a gente ainda não faz ideia do epíteto específico, né? e 27 ao menos, que a gente não faz a menor ideia né? a que família pertence, a que classe pertence, enfim. Né? Que isso em liquinologia até não é tão incomum, né? porque temos muitas espécies de líquens que elas são assim, chamadas popularmente como estéreis, né? elas não apresentam as comas ou não apresentam base de idioma. Tu consegues ver um talo, mas não encontra as estruturas reprodutivas, então geralmente é complicado a gente definir, né? Tem uns, uns poucos grupos aí que a gente já conhece bem, inclusive, mas a maioria ainda está por ser descoberta, tá? Então, esses são os dados preliminares que temos, né? Já são bastante ah, empolgantes nesse sentido e... Né? muitas espécies novas, muitos novos registros, e como a gente também tem muita coisa que a gente não faz ideia, certamente são coisas bastante importantes. Inclusive, pegando o gancho né, que o Genivaldo, na apresentação dele que ele fez é, pela manhã, né, esse número de informações e essa coleta de dados também para né, análises genéticas são absurdamente importantes, porque vão trazer né, mais informações para a gente conseguir... 
a trabalhar né, com, com a questão evolutiva dos líquens, com as relações entre gêneros, espécies, enfim, as relações evolutivas entre esses diferentes taxa, tá bom? E aí, então, né, eu não vou me focar nos nomes, especialmente né, de gêneros e espécies, mas eu vou trazer para vocês aqui um apanhado geral dos principais grupos, né, até porque eu sei que tem, tem várias pessoas que são... Hum, e geralmente não vem os líquens, né? Mas eles existem, eles estão lá. Então, de repente, mostrando essas imagens, vocês conseguem começar a reconhecer os principais grupos também e, pelo menos, né, enxergar eles um pouquinho melhor quando vocês forem ah, em trilhas, em matas, enfim. Tá? Então, do que a gente tem de principal, fam família Peltigerace, né? Peltigerace é extremamente diversa nesses ambientes, né? Ela é muito bacana, então tem muita espécie provavelmente muita espécie nova, né? então os dados moleculares, principalmente trabalhados pelo Dr. Robert Luke e pela doutora Bibiana Moncada, né? mostram isso, que a gente tem uma diversidade incrível escondida dentro dessa família, né? outrora tratada como lobariace. É importante que eles apresentam uma biomassa muito densa, uma biomassa muito expressiva, né? então a gente tem muita espécie, muito tal, e esses talos geralmente são bem volumosos, e são espécies, geralmente, que ocorrem em ambientes sombreados, né? como, por exemplo, a esticta, né? um, uh, não é difícil de encontrá-la, digamos assim, em matas nebulares. Na verdade, entrando um pouquinho na mata, é relativamente comum, né? espécies de esticta em geral, tá? e a gente tem várias espécies. Então, eu estou aqui só ilustrando alguns dos principais grupos para vocês. Tá? Essa, esse exemplar em especial... Percebe que está tudo em SP, né? Até porque a maior parte das nomenclaturas que existentes não está batendo. Então, a Bibiana certamente vai... Espero que ela nos auxilie também nessas, nesse projeto aí. Ah, esse exemplar é bastante interessante. Eu nunca tinha visto uma morfologia dessa aqui na, na, região, na região sul, né? em Santa Catarina, principalmente. Das áreas que eu encontrei, essa, esse exemplar ocorre basicamente ali no, no Parque Nacional de São Joaquim. É né, uma espécie muito interessante. Tá? Manuelia, um outro grupinho bem bacana, né, uh, recentemente descrito, inclusive, esse gênero. Tá? Crocodia aurata, né, possivelmente aurata, é né, uma espécie que ocorre em vários outros ambientes também, tá? inclusive litorâneos. Tá? Peutígra, né, que dá nome à, à família, é uma espécie que não... Uh, não ocorre com tanta quantidade quanto eu esperaria para esse ambiente, porque ela é mais de áreas, digamos assim, de climas mais frios, mas quando ela ocorre na, no, no, na área de estudo, ela geralmente ocorre em grande quantidade. Então, um grupo bastante interessante para ser estudado. Né? Outro grupo bem bacana, grupinho de artoniales, erpotalum, a criptotécia, enfim, outros grupinhos nesse sentido. Artônia até não tem muita, né? pelo menos não encontrei muitas artônias, mas ah, é um grupo que geralmente ocorre em grande quantidade. Em especial, né, os, o, as espécies relacionadas a Hipotalum rubrosinctum ocorrem em grande quantidade nesse ambiente. Né? Provavelmente muito associado a essa alta umidade né, e esse ambiente um pouquinho mais, mais sombreado. Né? Então, são espécies bem, bem interessantes, né? de Cusporidium, Uh, temos também muito basidioliquin, né? uh, dictionema, que são esses talos mais crustosos, né? eles têm, têm uma ocorrência bastante expressiva nesse tipo de ambiente, mas ainda assim, né, espécies do gênero Cora são bem, uh, bem diversas, bem numerosas nesses ambientes também. Tá? Os baqueromices, um outro grupinho bem bacana que encontramos, uh, e eles geralmente ocorrem nessa região mais de barranco, né, próximo a estradas. E aí sim, né, o grande número de, de base de olíquens que a gente encontrou né, diz respeito a espécies do gênero Cora. Né? Sabe-se aí ah, que Cora é um complexo de espécies fantástico. Né? Então, um pouco tempo atrás, saiu um artigo indicando né, que a, o que até então conhecíamos como uma só espécie, na verdade, representam mais de, de cento e, 140 espécies, não lembro o número correto, mas certamente isso tem sido atualizado aí por, pelo Robert Duque, pela Manuela Dalforno, principalmente, né, que tem trabalhado nesse sentido. Né? Então, aqui, 
alguns exemplos de cora ocorrendo em madeira, tá? e o substrato e a morfologia deles em campo é muito importante também para a taxonomia. Tá? Aqui, possivelmente, uma cora reticulífera, mas aí a gente vai precisar ainda conferir né, com as análises. Né? Geralmente são aquelas coras que ocorrem, ocorrem em barranco. É bastante comum, de certa forma, que elas ocorram em grande quantidade, né, onde elas ocorrem. Né? Então, se tiver um barranco com um solo exposto, geralmente elas ocorrem em grande quantidade. Tá? E aqui um exemplinho extra, né, uma corela que encontramos lá em São Bonifácio. Eu realmente não estava com muita esperança mais de encontrar esse gênero, mas é um, ele ocorre quase que de maneira, digamos assim, rara, mas a gente está encontrando com, com uma certa frequência até, pelo menos ali nos campos do Quiriri, né, que é no Planalto Norte aqui de Santa Catarina e algumas outras regiões. Então, é interessante também algo a ser pontuado. Certamente a gente tem muito líquen crustoso. Tá? A questão é, eles ocorrem menos em lugares sombreados e mais em lugares né, com menor diversidade em locais sombreados e maior diversidade em locais mais ah, iluminados, digamos assim, né? como, por exemplo, borda de floresta. Então, eu trago aqui uns exemplos, por exemplo, de Bactrospora, né? e tem outros em volta ali bem complicadinhos. Porina é um gênero relativamente comum dentro da mata. Tá? Pertussarias também a gente encontra com muita frequência, tanto na borda quanto dentro da mata, né? nesses ambientes nebulares. Tá? Muito líquen folícula. Então, eu fiz coleta de vários talos, entretanto, eu ainda não consegui trabalhar com eles, né? mesmo em nível genérico. Ah, esses, esses provavelmente vão ficar mais adiante, né? e é um trabalho bastante importante. A gente sabe que essa diversidade é muito grande. Tá? E a pro... é possível até que o hospedeiro também possa ter alguma influência, mas isso precisa ser melhor estudado também. Né? Filopsora é um gênero bem bacana, né? bastante frequente na, na área. Tá? São talos né, escromulosos, mais pequenininhos. A gente talvez tenha aí 11 espécies ou mais, principalmente de ambientes sombreados, às vezes formam colônias bem intensas, né? bem grandes. Né? Então, vocês já devem ter visto em algum momento, né, em campo, talvez, essas, esses exemplares. Né? A Doniace, precisava mostrar essas fotinhas para vocês, né? são... Uh, espécies muito bonitas, né? geralmente em áreas mais ensolaradas e provavelmente uma, né, representam uma biomassa muito importante nesse tipo de ambiente, dada a quantidade de cladônio que a gente encontra em várias, né, em várias áreas diferentes. Né? Então, algumas características abióticas também favorecem a presença dessas espécies. Parmeliace também é relativamente comum, entretanto mais em áreas ensolaradas, né? ah, na borda de floresta em áreas abertas. Dentro da mata elas são mais raras, mas ainda assim algumas hipotraquinas, por exemplo, a gente acaba encontrando. Né? Grafidáceas e aliados, né? depois das recombinações aí, de origma, grafis, lifes, rabidodiscos, né? que é outra família, a gente tem, então, principalmente em lugares ensolarados, mas as que ocorrem dentro da mata são bem legais. Né? Eu vi alguns grupos que eu ainda até então não tinha coletado em outros ambientes. Né? Muito cianolíquen, né? então, e aí a gente tem ah, uma carência de estudos muito grande dentro dos cianolíquens, né? os líquens que fazem essa associação com os cianobactérias, e, portanto, né, uma possibilidade aí de novos, de novidades bastante grande. Né? Temos espécies raras? Provavelmente, sim. Ah, raras no, em que sentido? Aí já não sei muito bem explicar, mas... São exemplares que a gente encontra muito pouco né, nessas andanças aí de, de, de campo. Bonodoforum é um exemplar, por exemplo, que não, né, é um espécime, por exemplo, que a gente não tem muito registro no Brasil, são muito esporádicos e provavelmente representam outras espécies que não por exemplo, as europeias, né, mas isso precisa ser melhor visto. Né, ou que antigamente era chamado de Everniastrum, atualmente hipotraquina, ah, que é esse, esse talinho mais dendrítico que vocês podem ver ali, né, entre os músculos, ah, ele também basicamente ocorre nesse tipo de ambiente de altitude, é, em pouca quantidade, pelo menos aqui na região sul. Tá? Então, espécies raras também temos e, felizmente, encontramos elas. Ou ainda, 
o que eu estou chamando aqui de talvez uma espécie exclusiva. Exclusiva por quê? Porque eu só encontrei essa espécie de leprocaulum, que não bate quimicamente com nenhuma outra já conhecida, tá? e essa espécie de leprocaulum só ocorre nesses ambientes sombreados e só ocorre nessas matas nebulares. Tá? Eu não encontrei esse tipo de espécie em outros ambientes. Tem o um registro de leprocaulum para o Rio Grande do Sul fora de mata nebular, mas é arbúscula e aí provavelmente né, não, não seja... Né? não seja essa aqui também, lógico. E só para fechar, então, a apresentação, eu acho que eu passei um pouquinho do tempo, me perdoem. Então, assim, líquens em matas nebulares, temos uma diversidade absurdamente fantástica, tá? então, percebam que só, só, são só três pontos né, mostrados em Santa Catarina, faremos mais coletas, mas já temos aí dados muito legais, muito divertidos <risos> nesse sentido, tá? Muita espécie nova, certamente, mas muitos novos registros, e como diz meu amigo Adriano Spielmann, né, os velhos registros também são muito importantes. Né? É interessante que líquens nesse ambiente me, me aparentam ter uma importância né, em valor de biomassa bastante expressiva, entretanto, ah, estudos ecológicos seriam né, melhor, ah, trariam respostas melhor né, a essa minha hipótese, mas eu acredito que a biomassa sim é bastante expressiva, né, nesses ambientes, e logicamente que se a gente trabalhar numa perspectiva de monitoramento dessas comunidades, né, previamente estudadas, a gente talvez consiga né, avaliar esses, a qualidade ambiental dessas matas, né, que elas são bastante, ah, elas sofrem muito com distúrbios, né, então são ambientes muito frágeis, de repente monitorando essas comunidades de líquens, a gente pode detectar possíveis distúrbios, tá bom? Então, novamente, eu quero agradecer muito a, a comissão, né, ao Mai de Funga, a FAPESC também, tá? e, enfim, todos os aux, aux, auxílios que tivemos para a realização desses campos. Ok, e estou aberto aí a perguntas. Quem quiser também mandar por e-mail, fique extremamente à vontade. Ok? Obrigado.
Uh, Emerson, thank you very much for your lecture and uh, so beautiful, amazing, and very interesting. So many unknown species. Uh, that's fantastic, fantastic work. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Emerson. Emerson will be with the other uh, lecturers uh, in, in this afternoon se session here at the end to answer the, the questions. Thank you okay, very much. Obrigado. Até mais. Até mais. Now, uh, it's a, a great pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Aldo von Wangenheim uh, from Federal University of Santa Catarina. Aldo is our computational arm of the mind funga, and Aldo is titular uh, full professor of Federal University of Santa Catarina <laughs> uh, from the computer science coordinate the National Institute of Science and Technology for Digital Convergence and uh, also coordinates the Santa Catarina Network of uh, tele, Telemedicina, <laughs> uh, te, um, uh, Telemedicine. It's simply uh, translated Telemedicine. It's Telemedicine, telemedicine. in English. Thank you only have much, to translate Aldo. it. Aldo, uh, it, once again, it's a great pleasure. And uh, we hope we all, <laughs> biologists from, uh, uh, will learn a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, uh, neural networks, convolutional neural networks, and deep learning with you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Aldo. It's in your hands now. Thank you very much, Ari. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think everyone is hearing me. I will give this talk in Portuguese. Uh, Ricardo asked me to talk in Portuguese. So if you have questions in English or if you don't understand any term because I'll be using them in Portuguese mostly, ask me <clears throat> at the end of the talk or at the end of this session, I'll try to answer you in English. Okay, so let's try to share my screen. Let's see if this is possible. So, where is it? This is the screen. Are you seeing it? No. Yes, Aldo. Oh. Everything's okay. You're seeing my screen, not me, the screen. No. The PowerPoint presentation. Now, uh, we are seeing the presentation and you. And, oh. and myself. Ok. Bom, oh. então eu vou mudar para português. Tá? E a ideia aqui é a gente falar um pouco tá, de inteligência artificial e coleta de espécimes, de imagens de espécimes de macrofungo com apoio da comunidade. Tá? E isso é um dos trabalhos do Mindfungo, a gente já vai passar lá. Tá? Então, a ideia é o que, que é? Ciência cidadã e micologia. Como é que a gente pode incentivar a comunidade a participar e a contribuir? Ou seja, como é que a gente pode formar aí, é, cientistas mirins em escolas públicas do interior de uma maneira que essas crianças sejam motivadas a participar, de maneira que jovens secundaristas sejam é, motivados a participar e de maneira também é, a que... É, botânicos ou micólogos amadores, pessoas que vão passear no mato no final de semana, não só tem a possibilidade de ter acesso a esse conhecimento, a gente viu agora há pouco é, na palestra que é uma coisa muito complexa, né? não é algo que você abre uma cartilha e dá uma olhada, né? também não é algo que você olha um catálogozinho e diz ah, isso aqui deve dar para comer, né? a gente não se arrisca a fazer isso, é importante a gente ajudar as pessoas, então, tanto ajudando-as a classificar o que estão vendo, como permitindo a elas também que participem, é, coletando espécimes, perguntando o que, que é isso, eventualmente até entrando em contato com especialistas para fazer isso. Tá? Então, como é que a gente vai poder fazer isso hoje? 
Então, a gente volta um pouquinho na história. Eu coloquei aqui é, uma foto bem antiga, que é da década de 1950, é de uma parte da equipe lá do Herbário Barbosa Rodrigues, de é, Itajaí. E essa foto está aqui, junto com outras, não? porque... Isso não é novidade de você incluir a comunidade na coleta de espécimes. Lá na década de 50, já o padre Raulino Reitz chamou a comunidade para participar. Ele chamou escolas aqui do estado de Santa Catarina, inclusive o meu pai era aluno secundarista na época aqui no Colégio Catarinense, e ele participou da coleta de espécimes que, de alguma maneira, foram parar lá no herbário Barbosa Rodrigues e foi uma coisa da qual ele ficou orgulhoso a vida inteira. Tá? Então, a ideia não é nova, tá? é, e é uma coisa que a gente vê que, é, para um adolescente ou para uma criança, é algo muito importante poder participar do momento de criar ciência. Então, como é que, hoje em dia, a gente pode fazer isso? Ninguém vai sair em lombo de mula no meio do mato fazendo alguma coisa. Tá? Hoje em dia, a gente tem outras formas. E tá? isso já começou. O maior exemplo é esse aqui, o iNaturalist, que é um software para celular, tá? que usa inteligência artificial e redes neurais convolucionais, a gente já vai ver o que é isso, para processamento de imagens e ajudar você a classificar um monte de coisas que tem por aí. Esse aqui é um software que é financiado pela National Geographic Society, tem bastante dinheiro atrás, e eu não sei se eles usam contribuições da comunidade ou se eles só classificam, eu acredito que até eles aceitem contribuições da comunidade, mas é um exemplo de um tipo de aplicativo que você usa para tirar foto de coisas e ele te dá depois a classificação. Às vezes fala bobagem, eu tenho um isolador de poste telegráfico que é verde assim, ele faz questão, ele insiste em dizer que é uma melancia. Então, isso acontece. Mas, a partir daí, surgiram muitos, e não só é, na área agora de botânica e micologia, mas também para insetos, Aldo, pássaros... Aldo, Oi? me desculpe, mas os teus slides não estão passando, está fixo ah, o primeiro slide. Ui, 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 eu estou com... Tá, é o Zoom que tomou conta aqui. Não? Oh, oh. Aqui, pronto. Agora sim, Agora sim Aldo, obrigado. obrigado. Vocês deviam ter me interrompido antes. Não? Você estava tão empolgado que a gente ficou. Não, não, relaxa. Tá, então, eu vou passar rápido agora, senão a gente vai explodir o tempo aqui. Não, tá? não tem problema, Aldo. Então, Você... O padre Raulino Reitz com o Jeep dele e a turma que o ajudou aqui. Tá? É, aqui o pessoal em lombo de mula, subindo a, Serra, subindo a Boa Vista. Tá? E aqui está o iNaturalist e os outros softwares que eu estava falando. Né? Então, identificador de inseto, passarinho e, inclusive, um de fungos bastante simples. Né? Esse aqui não tem nenhum tipo de contribuição da comunidade. Né? Então, qual é a ideia que a gente tem? A gente tentar reproduzir isso aqui, mas a gente incluir muito mais a comunidade. Então, ao mesmo tempo que a gente cria uma infraestrutura para coleta tá, é, de imagens de fungos, a gente também está permitindo que as pessoas, ou vai permitir que as pessoas usem para fazer classificação, vai permitir que é, todo tipo de naturalista amador se registre, profissionais também, obviamente, e também oferecer uma ferramenta para escolas, para que as escolas possam usar em saídas de campo, onde as crianças vão ter a oportunidade de fotografar um macrofungo e ver a que espécie ele pertence, ou eventualmente ver que não pertence a nenhuma, e assim, possivelmente, contribuir com o conhecimento. Essa é a ideia, tá? então isso é o que um, uma das coisas que o Mindfunga se propõe a fazer, aqui está o nosso contato, tá? e para isso a gente está desenvolvendo uma série de coisas, e eu vou falar um pouco disso e vou explicar um pouco da, do que, que é visão computacional e do que, que tem por trás disso. Tá? Então, né? essa aqui é uma imagem do nosso software rodando num computador. Tá? Eu não usei um fundo aqui, porque eu quero mostrar o mesmo software rodando no celular. Vamos ver se a minha câmera funciona. Eu estou com o feedback da câmera aqui. Dá para ver alguma coisa, né? Então, a gente usou um enfoque diferente. Então, nós usamos um enfoque que a gente chama de aplicação web reativa. Ou seja, você abre no computador, tá? você tem a cara que você está vendo ali aparecendo é, no vídeo, aparecendo no YouTube, etc. O pessoal do YouTube... Ah, viu sim, no YouTube tem meu vídeo pequeno, né? 
Tá? Se a gente vai para o celular, aparece desse jeito aqui. Tá? Então, é o mesmo software. Opa, consegui, consegui. É o mesmo software aqui. Você pode rodar aqui. Então, essa é a nossa interface do contribuinte de imagens. Para poder trabalhar isso, a gente desenvolveu um protocolo de fotografia que vai ter um manualzinho online. Tá? Esse manualzinho vai aparecer como página aqui dentro do software também. A gente, vocês veem aí é, uma, um mesmo... Uma, diferentes fotos de diferentes espécimes de uma mesma espécie de fungo, e a gente tira fotos de cima, tira fotos de baixo e tira fotos de lado. A ideia é a gente poder registrar as diversas vistas desse, desse, desse fungo. Vamos ver se eu consigo mostrar aqui. Aqui a gente pode ter uma ideia. Tá? Isso aqui é uma imagem de uma parte da nossa coleção, é a espécie desse fungo aqui, o, o Panus similis. Tá? E a ideia é a gente poder... Agora, como é que eu faço isso aqui para voltar? Fiz. Voltou a aparecer meu PowerPoint, né? Então, é... E a gente coletar muitas fotos de cada espécie, tá? muitos espécimes e fotografar cada espécie de diversas formas, mas sempre enquadrando desta maneira aí, e com isso criar um grande banco de imagens que vai poder ser ampliado com contribuições da comunidade. A partir daí, a gente usa visão computacional, tanto para aprender a descrever este fungo aí, quanto para depois, quando a comunidade começar a usar isso aqui, poder classificar imagens enviadas por membros da comunidade, por escolas em saídas de campo e assim por diante. E isso usa uma coisa chamada redes neurais convolucionais, o CNN de Convolutional Neural Networks, e para a gente entender o que, que é isso, eu vou falar um pouquinho de visão computacional como ela era antes. Tá? Antigamente, a gente tinha, para a gente conseguir fazer um computador entender o conteúdo de uma imagem, a gente tinha uma coisa muito complicada, que era o seguinte, a gente executava vários passos onde a gente ia sistematicamente simplificando a imagem, tá? extraindo informações delas. Então, eu vou dar um exemplo aqui. Por exemplo, primeiro, a gente filtrava uma imagem para ela ficar melhor, não? aqui exemplo sem chuvisco, depois a gente saía simplificando a imagem, isso aqui são exemplos de segmentação, de maneira a extrair partes que interessavam, tá? aqui ressonância magnética, um outro exemplo, tá? depois a gente, a partir daquelas partes, descrevia características matemáticas delas, para a gente poder identificar, isso aqui é, são vetores de gradientes, tá? Ah, ou aqui outras ideias. Oi? Está sem passar de novo. Ah, sim. Eu estou apertando o lugar errado. Tá, ah, vamos tá lá. Muito bem. Então, antigamente era isso aqui. Tá? Aí, esse, essa ideia dessa matriz aqui é que, na verdade, passa isso. Tá? Um monte de coisas. Então, filtros, simplificação de imagem, outra ideia de simplificação de imagem, descrever uma imagem aqui onde eu estava, os vetores de gradiente, aqui são exemplos de coleções de gradientes de uma garrafa de Coca-Cola, e depois você raciocinava a partir disso, classificando, usando um método estatístico, alguma coisa. E isso tinha uma enorme desvantagem, porque além de você ter que conhecer um monte de métodos muito diferentes e muito complicados, para cada tipo de imagem a coisa era diferente significava que não dava para você fazer uma aplicação para, por exemplo, sair classificando o conteúdo de foto de fungo de qualquer pessoa, em qualquer lugar, porque o substrato é diferente, a iluminação é diferente, as câmeras são diferentes, o fungo é diferente. Tá? Isso tudo mudou com o novo paradigma que surgiu, que foi a rede neural convolucional. O que, que ela faz? Tá? Essa ideia de que você tem vários passos e um monte de algoritmos diferentes, ela substitui por uma única coisa. É um bloco grande né, de um modelo de processamento organizado em camadas. Cada camada dessas tem uma coleção de neurônios artificiais que está conectada com a camada subsequente. E a ideia é treinar isso da mesma forma que um sistema nervoso aprende. Você passa estímulos... Você vê o resultado desse estímulo, a partir daí você calcula um erro e você leva esse erro de volta até lá na frente, consertando 
Bom, os caminhos por onde o impulso nervoso, entre aspas, passou. Muito bem, isso é uma coisa que já se conhecia há muito tempo, desde a década de 1960. Bom, mas o que, que foi a grande sacação? A grande sacação foi entender o que, que a gente pode fazer uma rede neural dessas aprender. E aí veio a ideia seguinte. Tá? Qualquer daqueles algoritmos bem complicados que tinha lá de processamento de imagem, ele pode ser reduzido a uma sequência de filtros. Tá? O que, que é um filtro? Na prática, matematicamente, um filtro é uma matriz que você aplica a um conjunto de valores dentro de um contexto e você gera um valor de saída. A gente chama isso de convolução. Tá? A ideia mais simples de entender o que, que um filtro faz é você pensar no aparelho de som aqui, tá? que tá, a velharia que está aqui atrás de mim, tem botão de grave, botão de agudo, etc. Aquilo ali é o modelo mais simples de um filtro. Você tem um sinal e você mexe no filtro e o filtro vai modificar uma característica desse sinal. Tá? Se eu for representar esse botão de grave, botão de agudo que tem ali, matematicamente eu vou representar exatamente como uma matriz que eu tenho aqui. Essa matriz que está aqui, por exemplo, desenhada. Tá? A matriz do meio. Mas qual é a diferença com imagem? Com imagem eu tenho um monte de pixels. Então eu aplico essa matriz numa região da imagem, faço uma convolução, e eu gero um valor de saída que está como verde ali é, no meu PowerPoint. Muito bem, eu faço isso sobre tudo. Tá? Então, eu tenho um filtro. Qual é a grande diferença? Na rede neural convolucional, eu vou pegar esse filtro, que a gente vê aqui numa animação, e eu vou fazer a rede aprender o filtro que eu preciso. Então, eu faço o quê? Eu faço várias camadas de neurônios, uma atrás da outra, todas elas interligadas por muitos filtros. Esses filtros vão passando por toda a imagem. E eu vou passando novas imagens, uma atrás da outra, e eu vou tentando classificar. No começo, a rede neural só vai dizer bobagem. Mas eu vou calcular o erro entre o sinal de entrada e o sinal de saída. Eu vou mandando esse erro de volta e uso um algoritmo para modificar essa matriz em cada uma das partes da minha rede neural. Tá? Então, o erro vai indo de volta, eu vou modificando todas as matrizes até chegar lá na frente de novo. Eu não posso modificar isso de uma forma muito intensa, porque eu vou bagunçar outras coisas que eu aprendi antes, se eu modifico intensamente, então eu faço sempre pequenas modificações, tá? e eu vou fazendo isso repetidamente. Então eu apresento muitas imagens de uma espécie, muitas imagens de outra espécie, todas misturadas, eu vou mandando a imagem, classificando, pegando o erro, mandando o erro de volta e fazendo pequenas alterações. No final, o que, que acontece? Entre cada uma dessas camadas, eu vou aprendendo filtros que vão simplificando a imagem e, no final, me dão a resposta que eu quero. Qual é a espécie? Então, isso parece mágica, mas... De 2012 para cá, se começou a se transformar na principal forma da gente fazer pesquisa na área de visão computacional, e é isso que nos permite né, fazer tantas aplicações diferentes, de carros que andam sozinhos, drones que fazem avaliação é, de ervas daninhas, de infestação de ervas daninhas em plantações, e muitas outras coisas. A gente usa essa técnica para as mais variadas coisas. Eu tenho vários projetos de pesquisa da área de meteorologia até esse daqui. E tudo está baseado dentro dessa mesma ideia. Então, isso é um próximo revolucionário. E, com isso, a gente consegue fazer uma aplicação como aquela que eu mostrei antes para vocês. Tá? E a gente consegue, com isso, tá? por exemplo, eu pegar... Tá? criar coleções de fotos de macrofungos e a minha rede neural ela vai aprendendo o quê? Para cada espécie, ela vai aprendendo características comuns, não? vai criando filtros especiais que deixam passar impulsos nervosos, entre aspas, quando aquelas características aparecem numa imagem e bloqueia os impulsos quando eles não aparecem. E com isso eu consigo criar um classificador que classifica muitos, muitos diferentes espécies de macrofungos. Deixa eu ver aqui onde é que está a minha matriz de confusão. Hum, aqui. Tá? 
Então, isso aqui é um código de computador que a gente usa para treinar uma das redes, permite a gente, por exemplo, ver é, para imagens que foram mal classificadas qual foi a área. Então, a gente tem esse aqui, por exemplo, foi muito mal classificado. Tá? E a gente pode ver aqui qual foi a parte do, da imagem que mais influiu. Então, essa parte do substrato e não o fungo. Tá? Desculpa, eu não sei se vocês estão enxergando, na verdade, aqui. Eu tô... O meu mouse, eu acho que não aparece para vocês. Aparece, né? sim. Aparece algo, o aparece. mouse, beleza. Sim, tá? sim. Então, então, vocês estão vendo aqui. Né? Esse pedaço do substrato aqui, na verdade, foi o que resultou na maior ativação de impulso nervoso. Tá, dentro da rede. E aí a gente sabe que o substrato está incomodando nessa imagem, tá? porque tem alguma outra coisa que tem a cara desse substrato e que aqui a rede neural pensa que isso aqui é o espécime e não o espécime de fato que está lá do outro lado. Né? Aqui a gente vê, por exemplo, que é, esse capim do substrato atrapalhou. Tá? Aqui, por exemplo, foi pego um monte de coisa do substrato, aqui pegou um algo do canto, Tá? E com isso a gente consegue entender o que, que são as partes das imagens que são ruins, tá? o que, que a gente precisa fazer para melhorar. Então, isso aqui é um resultado que a gente teve há quase um ano atrás, é antigo. Tá? É, e hoje, então, em função, inclusive, disso, que a gente desenvolveu esse nosso protocolo de fotografia justamente para nós criarmos imagens limpas, que a gente pode criar uma boa base e que, a gente espera sejam robustas o suficiente para quando os nossos é, naturalistas amadores começarem a sair por aí tirando fotos, tá? é, a rede também consiga classificar com sucesso essas fotos. Tá? Então, basicamente, era, era isso que eu tinha para falar por enquanto. Tá? Eu não quero me estender demais aqui. Não terminar a palestra nesse momento e eu vou estar aberto a perguntas eu imagino que vai ter muitas perguntas aí né, sobre as mais variadas coisas tá? gente, obrigado
uh, uh, thank you very much, Aldo, for this uh, so interesting and amazing people are crazy in, in, in the posts in the YouTube. So I think you will be many, many questions. But uh, uh, from now on, uh, I am, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor and Dr. Mario Hachenberg. Mario was uh, one of my uh, advisors in, in PhD thesis. So it, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's uh, a kind of emotion. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to see you here. And uh, Mario is from Centro de Investigação e Extensão Forestal Andino Patagônico uh, uh, and Patagonic uh, Forestal uh, Investigation Center. Uh, uh, Mario is senior researcher from CONICET. Uh, uh, it's, it's the federal agency and uh, for research uh, in, in Argentina and a professor of national... Eu, eu estou aparecendo no YouTube e não você. Sim. <risos> Estranho. <risos> ah, então, foi, deu algum problema. Ah, ok. Oh, sorry. O que é que fazia? A apresentação okay. do Mário foi engolida aí. Não, it's ok. Não, it's ah, ok. Eu, eu começo... É, just a minute, é, é, Mário. Eu começo novamente, Alisson? Uh, and Professor Mario Hachenberg is, is from the National University of Patagonia, senior researcher in CONICET from Argentina. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, his here. And uh, from now on, I would like to uh, pass <laughs> to Dr. Mario uh, for him to begin his presentation. Mario, muito bem-vindo. Seja muito bem-vindo. Thank you very, thank you very much for the invitation. Hello to everybody. As you know, I am speaking from Patagonia. It's already collecting time here, and it's a pleasure for me. And I thank the organizer, the the organizers for this invitation. So. I will leave you with my video, which I I have already prepared. So if you have any question afterwards, I will be happy to answer them. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mayor Rachimber speaking.
Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mayor Rachimber speaking. First, I would like to acknowledge the organizers of this symposium, their invitation for this presentation. I will not deal with fungi in the cloud forest. I am not an expert in this subject, but rather I am, I am going to deepen on the possible relationships between fungi from the Neotropics and those from Patagonia. The title of my presentation is Links between a Philophoraceous Fungi of Patagonia and the Tropics. The aim is to present examples of wood rotting fungi from Patagonia that have recently been discovered to be present in neotropical regions. This will be shown on the basis of either molecular, morpho morphological, and or compatibility test. Cloud forests are tropical or subtropical, evergreen, montane, moist forests characterized by a persistent, frequent or seasonal low-level cloud cover, usually at the canopy level. They are distributed around the world and in Central and South America, they are present mainly along the Andes and the high altitudinal ranges along the Atlantic seashore. Olmo Ruiz and colleges recently summarized the knowledge of fungi from the neotropical cloud forest in what it refers to their distribution patterns and composition. In this conference, I will try to show and relate fungal taxa from Patagonia with the neotropics. Patagonia will be taken here in a large sense, from Tierra del Fuego up to the vegetation in central Chile. Already in 1882, the Argentinian scientist Francisco Moreno proposed an independent origin of this sort of microcontinent from the rest of South America due to the remarkable landscape and flora of Patagonia, which presents strong affinities to other southern landmasses like Antarctica, Australia and New Zealand. Indeed, the paleoconstructions suggest that Patagonia has witnessed successive periods of breaking and drifting during the whole Paleozoic with the amalgamation of Patagonia to the Antarctic Peninsula during the late Carboniferous and a gradual separation from Antarctica into the Cretaceous. Also, during the five million years that Gondwana and its fragments existed, the Earth's global climate system has shifted, has shifted from ice house conditions to hot house conditions four times. These climatic fluctuations have constantly affected the biotic evolution and, bi and, bio and biogeography. Three major separation events of Gondwana have affected the evolution of the South America flora. First, the separation between West and East Gondwana during the, the Jurassic. Second, the separation the separation between America and Africa, and third, the split between Antarctica and southern South America. Different studies have shown that the landmasses and biota of southern South America are more related to the southern hemisphere countries than with other ones. As we can see in these graphics, different analyses showed the relationship of southern South America with southern countries and not with other ones. In Patagonia, the number of known polypores can be distributed in the following patterns cosmopolitan, tropical, antitropical, endemic, austral and paleoaustral species. As we can see, there is a relatively high number of endemic species. Within, these, within the endemic species, there are at the least four species that have recently shown to be distributed in the tropics. Bondarsevia guaitecasensis, Pisipes austroandinus, 
Physis Porinus Crocatus and Physis Porinus Eminens. Bondarsevia whitecasensis is a parasite of Nothophagus, forming large and attractive basidiums. Recently, it has been shown that the gasteroid Ibogaster giganteus is the same taxon. A few years ago, the discovery of Bondarsevia specimens in stems of standing Drimis angustifolia forest in a cloud forest of southern Brazil showed that it matches molecularly quite well. A maximum likelihood phylogeny was built on the basis of ITS sequence data. It showed 99.16 percent similarity between the Brazilian specimen and those from Patagonia, pointing out that they may belong to the same taxon. Nevertheless, there is a need to add more molecular markers in the analysis. The second example is that of Pisipes austrandinus, formerly named as Pisipes melanopus, it was distinguished from the European species on morphological and molecular grounds. In Argentina, Pisipes melanopus was recorded from the north northwest Jungas forest and from the Polylepis cloud forest. A recent molecular examination showed that specimens from North Argentina match perfectly with those of Patagonia, as shown in the graphic, suggesting that this taxon is more widely distributed than imagined and is present in Patagonia, in Polylepis forest and the, and the Jungas cloud, cloud forest. Two other taxa belong in the genus Physisporinus. One taxon was named as Physisporinus eminens, a species known from China, and the other as Physisporinus crocatus, a species known from Europe and Tunisia. In both cases, the determinations were based on morphological ground comparing with original and authentic herbarium specimens. Molecular studies, however, gave us the surprise that Physisporinus eminence from Patagonia was different from the taxon from China. This is not quite a surprise, but they also showed that they match with the specimen from Brazil, as shown in the graphic. And the same happened with Physisporinus crocatus from Patagonia. The specimens matched other from Panana, Paranapiacaba and Campos do Jordão in Brazil and are different from, from Crocatus sensus stricto, as we can see in this uh, phylogenetic tree. Now, at the genus level, we can offer a different type of example. It is the case of Omitiporia chilensis, an endemic, an endemic species that is strictly distributed in southern Chile. But phylogenetically, it is related to other species of the genus known from the Neotropics, that is, the species from southern Chile is totally is uh, related with other other species from the Neotropics, not from other parts of the world. And now we go to the austral polypores. Among the austral polypores, I will show the example of Stecherinum meridionale. Stecherinum meridionale was originally described as a variety of Jungunia colavens from Patagonia, as Jungunia colavens variedad variety uh, meridionalis. Since then, it was compared with materials from New Zealand that were named as Jungunia nitida. Compatibility tests, as shown here, show that specimens from both areas, from Patagonia and New Zealand, were compatible and independent from colavens and nitida sensu stricto, and that this, this variety indeed 
deserve a species rank as Junjunia meridionalis or, or as it is known today, Stecherinum meridionale. The species was also recorded from Brazil and phy phylogenetic studies confirmed that specimens from Patagonia are independent from Nitida and from Colavens. We can see in, in this graphic meridionalis different from Nitidum and, nitid and different from Colavens from the Northern Hemisphere. But, but uh, in this analysis uh, we still need strains from the cloud forest from Brazil to be incorporated in the, in the phylogeny. As presently known, then, the distribution of Stecherinum meridionale includes New Zealand, Patagonia, and the cloud forest of southern Brazil. Regarding the polypores of Patagonia with a tropical distribution, I will present the situation of two of them, Fomitiporella umbrinella and Neodictiopus dictiopus. Neodictiopus dictiopus is a taxon that belongs to a species complex whose taxonomy has been clarified by Palacio and co-workers in 2017. The herbacidiums are quite distinct by their small size, they are dark reddish brown pilae and they are small lateral reticulated stipe. The species was originally described from Juan Fernandez Islands, an iconic place from where many interesting fungi have been described already in 1835 by Leveillé. And presently it is known from Patagonia where it is widely distributed and also known from Mato Grosso in Brazil. Phylogenetic studies have shown the independence of this taxon in a genus of its own, the genus Neodictiopus. But the inclusion of specimens from, Pat from Patagonia and eventually from Juan Fernandez Islands is still needed. The other tropical example refers to Fomitiporella umbrinella. This resupinate species has been given several names in the past. It is, a, it is a saprophytic fungus, but in Patagonia it is responsible of a white heart rot in standing Austrocedrus chilensis trees. In this case, it has been possible to show that specimens from Patagonia are conspecific with those from Brazil and the USA, as shown in the graphic. And the, and the species is widely distributed in the Americas. Finally, the last example will concern the Corticioid genus Aleurodiscus, which belongs in the order Rusulales. The species of Aleurodiscus from Patagonia were studied several years ago morphologically. Recently, we searched the phylogenetic relationships of the 11 taxa found on the basis of ITS and LSU markers. As a result of this study, we found that several species of Patagonia clustered in two clades, now recognized as the genus Gloiosoma and the newly proposed genus Stereodiscus. The genus Stereodiscus is exclusively Austral in distribution, with taxa present either in Patagonia or New Zealand, or with taxa in both areas. The genus Gloeosoma is typified by the well-known Gloeosoma vitellinum. The genus is Austral in distribution, but one species, as we can see, Aleurodiscus mirabilis, is pantropical. It has been recorded from many areas around the tropics. How can we explain these Patagonia neotropics relationships? First, 
we should know that Patagonian flora also present the same distributional patterns, the vascular flora. Therefore, it is logical to assume that fungi will display similar patterns. In, in fact, in pan-biogeographical studies, the generalized tracks that represent the distributional patterns of Chilean vascular plants show, among others, the austral tract from one side and also the so-called South Amazonian tract, the Central Andean tract and the White Neotropical tract. This shows that it is not unexpected that fungi might also present similar distributions. As conclusion, we can state that, as it is well known, biogeography stands on taxonomic monographs and taxonomic monographs stand on accurate taxonomical records. On this basis, we can state that according the knowledge on the diversity of fungi is improved in different regions, we will, we will witness an increase in the number of species that pertain to either the Patagonia South Amazonia tract, the Patagonia Central Andes, or the Patagonia White Neotropics tracks. Nowadays, we are in the onset of biogeographic research that incorporates fungi in their analysis. This is just beginning. Before finishing, I want to acknowledge the help by Ricardo de Rexler Santos, Viviana Motato Vázquez, Carlos Salvador Montoya, Gerardo Robledo and Mauro Westfanen, who provided data that was relevant to this presentation. Thanks a lot to them and to you for attending this presentation. Thanks a lot.
Uh, Están viendo la pantalla, ¿verdad? Sí. I'm going to... Eh, pero... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like to, to thank uh, Mario Hachenberg once more for the fantastic lecture. Uh, biogeography is one of the, uh, for me, <laughs> one of the most fascinating themes in the whole uh, biological sciences. And Mario, thank you very much. And now we are going to go further Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Sharon Cantrell uh, from the University, uh, Ana Mendes uh, University, uh, Ana Mendes Gurabo University in Puerto Rico. And uh, uh, Professor Sharon Cantrell Uh, is uh, uh, currently the vice president of the International Mycological Association, IMA. Uh, Sharon, es un placer muy grande de, de uh, usted ter aceptado la invitación, <laughs> yo creo. Okay. It's a, a pleasure to, to, for us. Uh, uh, and now it's your turn. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking in English. So I will be talking about diversity of fungi along an elevation gradient in Puerto Rico and some thought about the importance uh, in understanding how these changes can happen and why we should cons uh, conserve, conserve them. I ha I'm having trouble here. Oh, here. Okay. So... First, I'm going to give a brief introduction. This is from a paper I did uh, in 2013, uh, where we studied. There's something wrong. Hay algo que está pasando en la. There's some. that 
study also the diversity along an elevation gradient. But in that paper, we use only, you know, uh, fatty acids. First, there are several studies lime moles along elevation gradients in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. And they, they show that diversity and abundance were inversely related to elevation. So there will be more diversity lowland than in the higher elevations. Similar studies with basidium isets uh, were found to have lower diversity at higher elevation, including neotropical tricholometiaceae <clears throat> and polypores. But in contrast, there was another paper by Bailey that found that higher fungal to bacteria ratios and higher fungal activity with increasing elevation in the dry northwestern US, USA. This study showed that microbial groups we behave differently along elevation gradients and they respond to environmental factors, abiotic and biotic. And the microbial distribution pattern is different among studies depending on the range of environments encompassed. So in that paper that Cantrell et al. of 2013, uh, we found that there was a peak of fungal abundance basically on the, um, the fungal, uh, sorry, the uh, fungal fatty acid marker that we were using, which is the 18S. So there was a peak fungal abundance at mid elevations. We studied also dry coastal forests at that time, but I'm not going to include it in this study. But as you can see with elevation, the marker decrease. Uh, so in this study, uh, we are only, I'm only going to include Tabonuco, Palo Colorado, and Elfin. And I'm going to say something about the Elfin Forest. The Elfin Forest is the higher, it's in the high mountains and it's covered with clouds. So it can, it's equivalent to cloud forest. So it is, it is our cloud forest, let's say that. We also saw that in the multiple linear regression model, there were two factors that affected this pattern. One was the soil moisture and the other one was the forest type. These two were predicted of the diversity of soil microorganisms. And I'm just going to say this paper not only included fungi, but it also included other uh, microorganisms, other groups. So, but the study site that I'm going to be presenting today, of course, is located in El Junque National Forest, previously known as the Caribbean National Forest. And I'm, we, we collected samples before Maria, Hurricane Maria in July, 2017. We collected from palm forest, which is these plots here, and also mixed forest, which are this one here. Uh, today, I'm just going to concentrate on mixed forest. And the elevation gradient goes from 300 meter to 1,000 meter in elevation with plots every 50 meter. Uh, and the, as I say, already said that, and the higher elevation is what we call F in forest and it's usually under clouds. So what we did, we took 10 soil core at each elevation and we made a pool sample of adjacent plots in the mixed forest. And I'm just going to, I will explain this in a, in a moment. DNA was extracted using key power, power soil DNA kit. We amplify the ITS region. And I just want to, you to know that one of the prime, when you do TRFLP, that's what we did. And I'm sorry, I don't have the Illumina sequence data. That, that's what I wanted to present, but I don't have it. So we amplify the ITS region. And for, to, for TRFLP, one of the primers, has to be Florence Lily label, and the other one not. And then after you make the amplification, you take that region and you digest it with an enzyme, a restriction enzyme. We use HAY3 for fungi. Then the samples are run with a standard, of course, because you need to add a standard in order for the program to identify the fragment size. So we use the standard GSCAN 600. 600, and we run it in our sequencer here in my lab, which is an ABI th uh, 3500. Then we analyze the samples in a program that the 
computer has, which is called the gene mapper software. This, this program, what, I, what it does is identify the allele, alleles in the sample. But I don't use the alleles. I use the percentage, the percentage of abundance. So to calculate the percentage of abundance, what I do is I take the, I, I add all the fluorescent of all of the sample, and then I divide each fluorescent of each peak in the sample and divide it by the total. And that gives you a relative abundance of that peak in the sample. Then I use a free program, which is called PAST. And I, I use Bray Curtis Similarity Index because Bray Curtis use abundance. And I construct, I did a principal coordinate analysis. After that, I also run a one-way permanova to determine significant differences between the forest type. So I'm not now to just show you how did we, we did this. So here are my 10 plots in initial elevation. And what we did was we, we paired these two. So I made a composite sample of A and F, B and G, C and H, D and I, and E and J. Why I do that? I did that because, first of all, I don't have a lot of money to run the, all the 10, 10 core, soil cores. So that's one reason. So I had to, you know, this lower the amount of money I have to spend. So we, and it is commonly done in order for soil. It is commonly, you can make a pool sample of, of the soil. So it, it usually done. It's not something that is not done in other studies. And actually this is a, a big project. So I just wanted just to tell you, you know, that there's a lot of things that are going on in that elevation and grading. So there's people analyzing trees, there are people looking at a gastropod, there's people looking at decomposition and liter invertebrates, seedling. This is the part I do. So we do microbes and we also do chemistry. And in, in that elevation also there's a transect where they look at bird, reptiles, amphibian and canopy invertebrates. So it is a huge project. It's not only me, I'm just doing one small small part of the project. And um, we are planning to do this every six years uh, because we want to understand how the community are changing every six years. So it is going to be a long-term study. So these are basically my results. This is from my previous study. So in, in the previous study, as you can see here, one of the things we found was that the there was a higher alpha and beta diversity for fungi than bacterial communities. That was one of the results we obtained. This is the one-way permanoma. And even though, and that happened a lot, even though we don't see specific groups here, even though we don't see specific groups, the one-way permanoma is saying that there are significant differences between the different forest types. <clears throat> and as before, we can see here, as before, the, the diversity of fungi decreased with elevation. So that's something we found the same as before. Also, <clears throat> we found a high alpha diversity and a high beta diversity. So basically, we are confirming what we obtained before with this even though this is only cherry field peas, and I know people probably don't like them that much because it doesn't give you a lot of information, but it is still telling me that the diversity, the forest types are significantly different. So in conclusions, as previously found, diversity of fungi decreased with elevation and there are significant difference between forest type based on the number of abundance of TRF and as before, alpha and beta diversity is higher for fungi. <coughs> Sorry, even though people think that TRF data is not useful, in our case, it has provided evidence that fungi decrease with elevation and that there are significant differences between the forest type. 
Understanding how fungi change along elevation and gradients will help us understand how climate change will affect the diversity of fungi. And this is very important in order to establish a strategy for the conservation of fungi. And like I said before, in the future, we are going to analyze the metagenomic community using HiSeq, with the collaborator I have in Oregon, University of Oregon. But unfortunately, that data was not available at this moment. So hopefully uh, by summer, I will have that data and maybe I will present something during the Mycological Society of America meeting in July. I have to thank the, 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 main, the main grant that sponsored me, which is the, the LTR6, which deals with understanding ecosystem change in our eastern Puerto Rico. I have another grant, which is the, the is I call an MRI major research instrumentation. And this grant also uh, support this grant. And of course, this work is not done alone. This work is done by mainly my students. So I have to thank two undergrad students, Paola Aran and Genesis Reyes, and three graduate students, Darian Alvarez. Darian Alvarez is my PhD student, which is paid by the LTR6, and she helped me supervise my, my undergrad students. And Carlos Cruz and Luis M. Garcia were the two students that worked with the fatty acid data. And it is interesting to see that fatty acid data also is showing the same thing I'm seeing with the, with the TRFLP data. So basically that's it. And said in my chat, uh, my workshop was canceled so I can stay in the discussion.
Thank you very much, Sharon, for your lecture. Uh, it will be very interesting to see this uh, program of long uh, standing uh, and temporal series. Right? It's, it's, it's uh, very informative for everything. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions here. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, to ask each of you uh, individually, okay? Uh, that there is one for uh, Mario, Mario, uh, from Eduardo Perez Passos. Uh, what about other genera with disjunct distribution, like Acanto Corticium? Information. Um, so, okay. So, okay. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge all the messages that you included in the chat. I am unable to answer in the chat. I don't know why, but the technician at my institute does not allow us to use the chat. So I acknowledge in this moment. Um, I have seen that, uh, that question, Eduardo. And of course it is very interesting, but in fact, you are asking for a genus that is very little known. So I am unable to give an answer. In fact, uh, when you go back and you have time to, to see my, my presentation again, uh, you will see in the map in the biogeographical map, that there are also uh, several plant species that, that are antitropical in distribution. So fungi may also present an antitropical or amphitropical distribution. But, in, but there are very few records of specimens in Acantocortisium. So I can I can't say nothing, uh, so I, I apologize for that. Okay, thanks, Mario. Uh, Aldo, uh, there are some questions for you. Uh, first one from Suzanne Surel. Uh, what are your picture sources? Are you including data from Mushroom Observer and I naturalists also too? No. Uh, <clears throat> at the present time, we are only collecting data ourselves. This, uh, this means all the data we have, we are using, we have about, uh, Ricardo, correct me please, uh, 230 species of uh, <clears throat> macrofunga and uh, about 20, 30 uh, uh, images or specimens per, uh, per species. And this is all, are all images we have collected ourselves. The idea is to go <clears throat> to open the software to the community in order to collect more software from the community. But for that, we need to implement a few roles. No? We have to have um, a small team of curators that is able to review the, the images that the image sends us. Sends us. No. And, no. Also, and also, so uh, correct images make the, <clears throat> uh, make the cuttings so that we have only the fungi present in the image, trained in your, uh, retrained in neural networks and so on. Now we are only working with our own images. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to say uh, uh, now uh, for Sharon uh, from uh, Diogo. Uh, do you know if the other organisms studied in the big project uh, present the same diversity patterns as fungi, as fungi? Uh, actually, I don't know yet. Um, uh, 
and I haven't seen the data analyzed yet. Uh, so I really, I really cannot answer you that question. Uh, but I guess when we finish, because one of the ideas we have for that project is to make a, a synthesis paper. And a synthesis paper will include all the data. So let's see. But we haven't, we haven't compared it yet. Okay. But, but good question. And I, I'm really excited also to see if we see the same pattern or not. I would like to see too. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Emerson. Uh, the 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 pattern all the the lichens that have uh, the cyanobacterial symbiont occur only in shady place or you can see in more sunny sunny sites. Oh, you can see in sunny uh, sunny places, but it's not so common. Um... Well, a gente não encontra, aliás, a gente encontra eles em áreas ah, ensolaradas também, mas é bastante variável do grupo. Né? Então, você consegue encontrar leptógeno em costão rochoso ou outras espécies nesse tipo de ambiente, mas elas são menos diversas. De um panorama geral, eu tenho encontrado estalos menores também quando expostos a pleno sol. Né? Então, digamos assim, são mais raros. Num panorama geral, eles ocorrem em áreas mais sombreadas, tá? Mas aí também tem uma pequena variedade, justamente da quantidade de umidade do ambiente, né? Em Costão Rochoso, você entende que tem spray salino, ela mantém uma certa umidade, embora haja salinidade junto. E febres iliensis, que é uma espécie anfíbia, digamos assim, né? Que ela ocorre dentro da água e fora da água, é basicamente em áreas bem ensolaradas, mas ela está dentro da água. Então, é, é, é diferente. Né? na maioria das espécies eu acho que daria assim para pontuar que elas ocorrem em áreas mais mais sombreadas. Ok, thank you. Just a, a, a summary in English. Uh, Emerson told us that usually uh, as a general pattern the the the, the lichens with cyanobacterial uh, symbiont or uh, uh, preferentially occur in shady place, but uh, it uh, they may occur in sunny place if uh, the humidity is quite high as and and he he uh, gave us some examples in in distinct uh, environments thank you emerson now there is another for aldo aldo uh, how is calculated the error um rate over the classific uh, over image classification. So for image classification, it's extremely simple. Uh, <clears throat> you have a list of classes, and these are the outputs of your neural network. So if you have 20 classes, uh, and you should have a specific output, let's say class one, and your output is class uh, three or something other, uh, then you have an error. Uh, this error can be up to one. Uh, okay. And this error you calculate backwards through the network, changing the weights of the connections of the, uh, the layers of all, uh, <clears throat> of all neuron layers in the network. There's a specific algorithm for that, that is the error backpropagation algorithm. This is an algorithm that was developed in 1980, between 1984 and 1986. It actually was developed three times, but this is the, pub, <clears throat> the, the seminal publication from the MIT in 1986. And this is a uh, gradient descent algorithm. It changes very little the weights so that when we correct one thing, we don't uh, destroy other things that the network has already learned. This is a very simple form uh, to describe this. I would have to use mathematics to describe it in more detail. There's a lecture from me. It's a very introductory lecture. I have put it into, into the answers here on YouTube. 
I can put it again. So people that didn't see it can see, see it again. So look here, there's the lecture and you can look at it. Uh, in this lecture, I provide a very, very simple explanation of the mathematics involved. So that's it. Okay, if, thank if you, Aldo. If we go further, I have to talk mathematics. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, uh, Mario, from Valesca, Veronica. Uh, Mario, I would like to know if the species which are present in distinct regions, for example, Patagonia and tropics, uh, are they fructiferous? I think is, are they uh, with reproductive structures, I think. Uh, at the same time, I don't remember if you said it. No, uh, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't say anything about it. Okay. In Patagonia, because of the climate, we have a very narrow period of fructification. Mm -hmm. That is, it, is begin, it, it begins in mid-April. At, at the end of May, we, we are covered with snow. So fungi have that uh, open moment to fructify. In, in the tropics, it is different in the sense that uh, the, um, the, 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 do you say pulsation, when it fructifies, it depends on, on variations of, uh, of other kind. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in Patagonia, I, I am telling the same in a, in a different way. Now, the, because of the cold mornings, and more humid mornings, now we are going to receive the wave of fructification. And that will last until the end of May or the beginning of Jan, and that is all. This is in the Argentinian side. In the Chilean side, mm -hmm. thanks to the overwhelming precipitation they get, the, fructif the fructification period may last until August or even September. But there is, no, there is no comparison between one and the other areas. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, Cheryl, another one here. Uh, Cheryl, uh, uh, you said about uh, fatty acid analysis that is currently uh, done in bacteria, uh, but uh, there are some markers of fatty, uh, fatty acids characteristic or typical for analyzing uh, uh, in typical of bacteria. And how do, uh, what is the, the typical or a biomarker, a fatty acid biomarker for fungi, for fungi? For fungi, uh, it is the 18, it was there in the presentation, it's the 18 W something like that. I don't remember the other, but it's, it is an 18 marker. So it's a, it's a, a fatty wow. acid with 18 carbons, but it mm -hmm. also has a, a double, a double, bond somewhere oh. in the change mm -hmm. so and yes for bacteria there are other ones we did analyze a lot of markers it was not only the fungal one i just because it was a fungi presentation i just put the fungal one okay. uh, but but in the paper she can go and look at cantrell 2013 which was in the in the presentation and uh it is it cover all different markers for a lot of different group of, of bacteria and and fungi also. So it was not only that one. It just okay. I just did. I just wanted to concentrate on the fungal one. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, what else here? Aldo. Aldo. Um, where is it? Uh, Emanuele Burgos. Uh, is there? any perspective of creation 
for create uh, for of creation of 3D models from the images that you have from the fungi fungi fungi. In theory, it's possible. There's a whole uh, research branch in uh, convolution neural networks uh, towards this kind of uh, data production. Yeah? You have uh, lots of photographs from different angles and even from different species, but you use all of them to produce a 3D model. We are not researching in this direction now. Our interest lies in a different area. We want to produce something that's useful for the community. I don't think that this would be immediately useful. It's interesting. It's a gadget. Look at that uh, mushroom from all directions. Uh, but you, you would be looking at an artificial uh, a generated image, you wouldn't be looking at the real mushroom. So I don't think for uh, mushroom classification uh, <clears throat> purposes, it, it has an immediate use. So it could be a later project, to make it more interesting uh, for people that want to look at it from every side and so on. But uh, there's a point we need a model we don't have these models yet, yeah? so we, we need to produce them. And we would need a lot of images. Yeah? There's um, one site, maybe, so this will take a bit of time, but not so much. Uh, there's a research from Facebook uh, uh, where they do this for human images where you can take human photographs or you can take movies mm -hmm. and you can have 3D renderings, but I'm not finding it yet. So uh, okay. it's called Detectron. You can look for it, yeah. but this is because they have lots and lots of images from human beings. So it's easy to produce this model and infer a uh, 3D structure of a given human from one single image of this human. Huh? So it's much more difficult for mushrooms because we don't have so many images from mushrooms. Huh? So that's it. Okay, thank you very much, all of you. Unfortunately, of course, uh, and in all the se uh, sessions, there are many other <laughs> questions. I, I received only some that uh, were previously filtered by the team. And that's it's our, we passed a little bit of our time. Now we are going to the break. Thank you very, very much for Emerson, Mario, Aldo and Cheryl for this round table and thank you very much. And let's go to our coffee break. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Oi, pessoal, obrigado, hein? Obrigado, hein?
thank you very much. Uh, we are finally returning from our uh, break, uh, our virtual coffee break. Uh, now we are going to continue our roundtable about fungal diversity and ecology in, in neotropical cloud forests. We have four uh, presentations, uh, one uh, lecture from each country. So we have Dr. Jonathan Trujillo uh, from uh, Ecuador, uh, Dr. Peter Trutman from Switzerland, uh, Dr. Tina Hoffman from Germany, and Dr. Ida Palacios from Colombia. Uh, so uh, in this order, it's a great pleasure uh, to announce the first uh, lecturer of this second part of this round table uh, at our uh, first day here in the symposium. symposium. Uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Jonathan Trujillo to deliver his lecture. And uh, it's very interesting because it will be uh, the, the first lecture on ethnoecology. Uh, Paul, please go on. It's your turn now. Bueno, buenas tardes con todos. Eh, un gusto de, y, y gracias Ricardo por la, por la invitación. Yo voy a dar mi, mi charla eh, sobre justamente la importancia etnoecológica de los bosques nublados en el Chocó ecuatoriano. Es importante saber de que es, es una de, de las áreas poco estudiadas en nuestro país. Eh, lastimosamente, eh, los efectos antrópicos han hecho un, un han, han casi deforestado todos estos bosques y la única forma como estos se han protegido es porque eh, la topografía es muy eh, difícil para las personas que hacen tala selectiva. Entonces, en esta ocasión les voy a presentar justamente este tema que tiene que ver con macro hongos de los bosques nublados, ¿sí? Eh, yo voy a dar mi charla en español, pero tranquilamente pueden hacer las preguntas en portugués y, y un poquito en inglés también vamos a, a adaptarnos. Gracias eh, también Ricardo por la, la invitación eh, y es un, es un gusto estar compartiendo con ustedes. No sé si está corriendo bien ahí el, el, la presentación. Está ¿Sí? todo bien. Perfecto. Entonces... Eh, Sí. Tomemos en cuenta de que esta área de, de conservación del Chocó está dentro del, se extiende obviamente desde el Tumbes, ¿no? del norte de Perú hasta el Darién en, en, en la parte sur de Panamá. A esto le vamos a denominar todo lo, lo que son los Andes tropicales. Se, el área de extensión es más o menos en 200 mil kilómetros cuadrados. Lo compartimos justamente con nuestro país hermano, Colombia. Y en la parte de abajo ustedes pueden ver justamente la, la, las áreas que están eh, protegidas, eh, la Cotacá Chicayapa, la Reserva Cotacá Chicayapa y la Reserva Mache Chindul, entre algunas otras que son eh, también reservas privadas, por ejemplo, en donde estamos actualmente realizando eh, la parte del estudio de post, del postdoctorado eh, en algunas reservas también privadas, como el caso de Mashpi, el Bosque de los Sueños, eh, y también eh, algunas um, partecitas también del FCAT, que es una fundación para la, la conservación de aves. Esta es el, la imagen de un bosque no, eh, nuboso eh, en el amanecer, ¿no? en, en la, desde la reserva de Mashpi. Justamente hay un, un lodge ahí que eh, este está protegiendo estos bosques. Eh, se hace turismo y conservación al mismo tiempo. Eh, nosotros vemos que justamente el, uno de los fuertes problemas que, que tiene es que eh, cada vez se va quedando eh, con menos bosque, ¿no? Entonces la parte más afectada del bosque es más o menos va hasta los 400 metros sobre el nivel del mar y tenemos una pérdida de casi el 68% de millones de hectáreas, ¿sí? 
Eh, aquí solo queda el 39% de bosque, eso quiere decir 1.17 millones de hectáreas en los rangos de elevación. Aquí se va perdiendo todo el tiempo eh, no, eh, especies que ni siquiera han, han podido ser descritas. No se diga pues los hongos, que es uno de los grupos eh, poco estudiados en, en el neotrópico. En nuestro país mismo eh, somos pocos los especialistas que eh, nos dedicamos a, al estudio de la, de la funga eh, neotropical. El, claro, el, el Ecuador tiene muchas especies por unidad de área, ¿no? Y nosotros vemos, es una, una visión desde la parte superior en un teleférico ubicado en esta reserva Mashpee, en donde podemos ver cuerpos de agua que también son muy importantes para la conservación. Las amenazas, las principales amenazas es la tala selectiva. La tala selectiva es uno de los problemas más fuertes porque eh, estos bosques albergan una gran cantidad de especies o de maderables, madera fina que nosotros les decimos, por ejemplo, chanul, de la familia, eh, o bueno, del género miriastrum, eh, entre las más importantes. ¿no? Se convirtieron también en áreas de pastizales, eh, básicamente zonas ganaderas sin ganado. Ese es uno de los problemas más fuertes que también pasa el Ecuador, porque este, estos sitios, al no tener buena producción ganadera, los dejan abandonados y obviamente devastados. Un bosque de neblina, según eh, Sierra en el 99, en la propuesta preliminar para la, la vegetación, ¿no? las formaciones vegetales del Ecuador continental, está ubicada entre los 1,800 a 3,500 metros sobre el nivel del mar, Sí, eh, y como les decía al inicio, pues gracias a la, a la poca, a la poca accesibilidad a estos sitios por la topografía, esa ha sido la forma de, de protegerse, ¿no? Vemos ahí eh, justamente la dinámica, el dinamismo de este bosque, cómo se va eh, cada vez eh, en, en, cada vez en este proceso de, de, de sucesión vegetal, cómo los hongos también hacen su papel importante. En, la, en, el, en, la, en el dinamismo, ¿no? Abren gaps, estos claros de bosque. Uh, aquí vemos la, esta imagen en donde eh, los hongos le conquistan, obviamente, le, 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 le descomponen, el árbol cae y se forma estos claros de bosque. Esa es la dinámica muy importante de estos bosques de neblina. Nosotros trabajamos eh, a lo largo de estos años, en, justamente en esta partecita del, del, cho, del chocó ecuatoriano, que eh, alberga algunas comunidades indígenas interesantes, por ejemplo, los chachi, los de pera, eh, los áchila, los afroecuatorianos y los quichuas de las montañas. Sin embargo, nos faltó una, una comunidad, la comunidad de Agua, que lastimosamente por, eh, por problemas, obviamente, eh, de, acce, de acceso, no por la comunidad, sino más bien por la, eh, los permisos que necesitamos nosotros eh, solicitar a la guerrilla, pues no hemos podido trabajar con ellos. Eh, apenas tuvimos unas dos horas de contacto y tuvimos que salir rápidamente, ¿no? Eh, vea, ve, vemos justamente en esta gráfica de la parte superior izquierda, la cordillera del Toizán y todas estas, estas partes importantes que poco han sido estudiadas, ¿no? La descomposición gracias a estos organismos fúngicos y lo que nos llama la atención es que siempre están en, en ese proceso, ¿no? Porque la misma neblina, los bosques nubosos, eh, dan este, estos ecosistemas húmedos, ¿no? También eh, trabajamos con algunas localidades importantísimas, como el caso de los chachis, ¿no? Eh, aquí vemos justamente el, el, el apoyo de Simón de la Cruz, en donde ve, veíamos esa relación hongos y personas con diferentes categorías de uso. Y eso fue súper interesante, ¿no? Porque, por ejemplo, la comunidad chachi les denomina a, a los hongos como eh, kistiutiu, que quiere decir en, en lengua eh, o en la traducción hongo. ¿sí? Aquí vemos un listado muy interesante de especies usadas eh, que eh, tienen su nombre vernacular, su, su, su etimología, su significado y al mismo tiempo su categoría de uso. Entre las más conocidas, por ejemplo, tenemos el caso de la, las famosas, eh, los Angkitutu, de los géneros Pleurotus. Vemos a Pleurotus cóncavus, algunos, eh, eh, también algunas volvarielas que crecen directamente 
en hojas de palanda, como dicen ellos, en hojas de, 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 de plátano, ¿no? También tenemos el caso de las gilarias, ¿no? que muy, muy, muy vinculadas como los dedos de los muertos, les dicen también como los ujkuns en gulu, en, entre los más importantes, ¿no? Por cuestión de tiempo, pues no voy a, a hacer mucho énfasis en eso. Los sáchilas es una de las comunidades súper interesantes también, eh, denominadas también como los colorados, ¿no? Eh, la característica principal, pues, eh, el, con Vixa Orellana se realizan estos peinados eh, y aquí tuvimos un meeting, una, una conversación en donde eh, so, eh, sobresalieron estos honguitos como el caso de Filipsia dominguensis en la parte de abajo y Filóbalo de Tus Gracilis en la parte de arriba, que le dicen el Kevin Luli, que es un honguito muy utilizado para, para reactivar energías, se, se lo cocina y... Eh, se toma un baño con eso, ¿no? Es muy interesante. La familia Calazacón tiene esta, esta tradición de ser una familia muy, eh, muy vinculada con el espiritismo también, el buen espiritismo me refiero, ¿no? Aquí tenemos algunas de las, de las, de, del listado de, las, de los honguitos encontrados y eh, también, pues, aquí les tienen varios nombres vernaculares como el caso de Pian o Con y Da, Dodo Quiste, y el, el nombre justamente para decir hongo en lengua safiki es Quiste. Muy interesante la comunidad afroecuatoriana, que ellos se han dedicado en, justamente en la, en la parte del río Onsole, eh, cuando nos acompañaron eh, tanto Barrito Mina, es, es su, su, su apodo o su apellido, como se dice en portugués, y Melita Angulo, que nos acompañaron por toda la parte hacia Capulí, con la conexión de la comunidad eh, Chachi, aquí ellos eh, identifican muy bien a estos eh, hongos del, eh, del orden falales, ¿no? como el caso de Falus, Induciatus en la fotografía, y también esta Elomice Cintus, que les dicen también como las pichas o los penes del diablo, ¿sí? eh, muy interesantes, o, del, o, el, o el pene del muerto también. ¿no? Esta comunidad que viene desde la parte de Colombia, es muy interesante porque eh, básicamente eh, se unieron al grupo de la Conalle, ¿no? que es de justamente los Épera. Un, me pareció una comunidad muy importante porque el, un alto porcentaje de uso de esta, de esta comunidad es, eh, es que los hongos los usan para jugar. ¿sí? Y pues todo es para jugar. Por ejemplo, ahí está eh, Doña eh, Rosita. Eh, mejor dicho, perdón, Doña Santa Garabato, ella eh, les utilizaba, decía que eran como copitas para tomar así el agua, ¿no? Al caso de los honguitos, como lo estamos viendo, a cocaína especiosa. Eh, aquí algunos de los más interesantes, miren, les relacionan con galleta, galleta chai, también les dicen los famosos wendó, o los bas, basuchaki, ya una mezcla de ahí entre español y también la, la, la lengua de ellos, ¿no? El, el eper, epera pdd. Y tenemos a los mestizos, justamente una comunidad muy interesante, miren estos hongos, el caso de Fabolus tenuiculus, que los utilizan también como, o denominados también como los busungala, que son hongos que eh, se los cocina, se los come acompañado como una sopa, Sí, y eh, principalmente esto es de la cuenca del río Intac. Algunas de las comunidades interesantes también eh, las utilizan, por ejemplo, hasta Cayamba de Finados, en, en, justamente en la parte de la cordillera eh, de los Andes, ¿no? Y tenemos eh, también en esta parte, en esta partecita de las estribaciones del Chocó Andino, está también la presencia de Ustila Gomaidis, llamado también Cuscungo, que es un honguito muy interesante también para dar de comer a los chanchitos. Bueno, rápidamente veamos algunas especies más frecuentes en los bosques nublados. Eh, justamente de Basilio Micota, miren, Marasmius cladophilus, es uno de los hongos eh, muy presentes, casi todo el tiempo se lo ve, ¿no? Eh, también vemos a Marasmius cubensis, eh, descomponiendo la, eh, los, eh, las ramas, los troncos, esto es muy frecuente en áreas abiertas, pues el caso de Coprine, eh, Coprinus diseminatus antes, ahora Satirella diseminata. Eh, Rimbaquia paradoja, un registro desde 1892, la, las primeras colecciones de Patular. Eh, también tenemos a Tremela eh, fusiformis, 
un hongo comestible muy riquísimo también, y estas pues las famosas auricularias, el caso de auricularia delicata también, muy, muy consumida por todas estas comunidades que les había mencionado, auricularia fuscosuccinia también, eh, un honguito que inclusive sirve para jugar también. ¿no? Este, tenemos a Lentinus crinitus, en esta, eh, estos son hongos muy frecuentes en caminos, en senderos, Geastrum sacatum, que también les dicen sopapos, que ayudan para la cicatrización de, de heridas. Phallus induciatus, el caso de... El, el, también le dicen como el haya huyo, los quichos, ¿no? Pero bueno, si hablamos de la parte ya más de, lo, de los bosques nubosos, les dicen como la, la picha del muerto, ¿no? O el pene del muerto. Igual que está Leomicecintus. Y también estos honguitos que sirven muy parecido a, al, al uso de geastro, ¿no? El caso de Ricoperdon eh, periforme, ¿no? Tenemos a Poliporus eh, el, eh, Leprieri, antes Melanopus Leprieri también, muy frecuentes en senderos, igual que Trametes escabrosa o antes Erliela escabrosa. Eh, Ganoderma australe también, eh, un hongo muy, muy interesante en estos bosques que básicamente están todo el tiempo, ¿no? Pignoporus sanguíneos que avanza casi a las estribaciones de la, del volcán Pichincha, que se lo vio eh, eh, justamente en el proceso de sucesión, ¿no? en la descomposición. Algunos ascomicetos ophiocordyceps dipterígena, que eh, también llamado como los supay, supayala, los, los quichuas, ¿no? pero acá son más conocidos, son de una forma muy interesante también de, de, de conocerlos aquí en algunas hormigas también, el caso de Ophiocordis eh, calocera y también Bauberia, no recuerdo ahora, eh, acri, bueno, no, no recuerdo en este momento, eh, Daldinia eh, concéntrica y también eh, Hilaria telfari, que son hongos que se toma el agüita también para dolores de garganta. Lo que nos ha llamado mucho la atención es que eh, tenemos muchos procesos de bioluminiscencia en toda la parte de, del Chocó y vemos justamente estos registros tomados en la, en la noche, como los, los, los troncos básicamente se prenden, ¿no? Y por eso también es interesante, hasta para la parte de micoturismo, es muy interesante esto. Eh, lo que estamos haciendo ahora justamente... Eh, procesando en la micoteca, eh, guardando me, en, en medio de cultivo y también haciendo un banco de ADN con especies promisorias. Hacemos educación y aplicación de esto. Y, eh, bueno, en algunas charlas ya eh, he dado esta primicia, tenemos el librito de hongos del Ecuador, eh, que ya obviamente está li completamente libre. Y lo que hemos hecho ya es la, la guía de, también para Mashpi, el caso de macrongos para el bosque protector Mashpi y algunas publicaciones de hongos comestibles. Es interesante saber esto de que, eh, a pesar de que somos pocos micólogos en el, en el Ecuador, tratamos de dar el mejor aporte en lo que podemos y justamente para la protección de estos bosques eh, nublados, ¿no? los bosques nubosos o bosques de neblina que nosotros les denominamos aquí. Un agradecimiento y a los créditos fotográficos de estos amigos que siempre nos están apoyando. Eh, a las entidades, tanto públicas como privadas, que básicamente nos están apoyando con alojamiento, con transporte, con toda la logística, ¿no? A la gente del herbario, a la gente también que nos formó en la Universidad Federal de Pernambuco. Actualmente... Eh, estoy cursando el postdoctorado eh, gracias a la dirección de la doctora Laura Guzmán también. Eh, Mateo Roldán, tenemos también eh, de Mashpi, Luis Carrasco y los colaboradores también del FECAT. Al profesor Felipe Barcho, que también nos a, apoya mucho en la parte de identificación, con quien trabajamos mucho. ¿sí? A Christoph Pellet, también del Bosque de los Sueños. Y a todas estas entidades que han sido parte de estos estudios a nivel pues de la funga ecuatoriana. Aquí algunos de los colaboradores y obviamente a nuestros estudiantes de la Facultad de Ciencias Biológicas de la Universidad Central, que siempre están prestos a acompañarnos en las expediciones, muy curiosos por la microbiota. Hoy por hoy tenemos también ya la cátedra de introducción a la micología como materia obligatoria, además no como optativa como antes era, ¿no? Eso les quería compartir este día.
Muchas gracias. So, Paulo, uh, Professor Jonathan Paulo Gamboa Trujillo, thank you very much. Professor uh, Paulo Trujillo is from Central University of Ecuador, and uh, it's our uh, uh, first lecture in ethnomycology and, and fungal ethnoecology. So, Paulo, thank you very, very much for, for your lecture. And now I will invite Dr. Peter Trutman. Uh, Dr. Peter Trutman is president and principal investigator of the NGO Global Mountain Action. And uh, it, uh, he will talk with uh, 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 his experience in, in Funga of neotropical cloud forests. Uh, Peter, thank you very much uh, for accepting the invitation and it's your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, and um, also for the invitation for, um, for this very important um, um, symposia on, um, on cloud forests. I'm surprised that it, uh, this is the first one because it's such an important topic. Um, um, I'm talking to you actually from Peru. Um, so uh, I hope it's not just the Swiss flag that's sort of associated with this with this presentation, but also the Peruvian flag, um, because of course, no, first of all, no work can be done alone. It's always uh, a team of people who are behind everything. So, uh, but uh, what I really want to do is to, to base my talk on the Andean micro, uh, macromycete survey uh, of the Andes and uh, in Peru. And uh, with that, uh, <coughs> I worked um, uh, with Global Mountain Action together with collaboration with uh, the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia, with the Universidad Nacional Santo Abad de Cusco, with the uh, Universidad Cesar Vallejo, and with uh, Ceprostad in Lima. Um, and of course, it's a, a uh, with permission and, and uh, blessings from CEFOR, from which it's a registered project uh, uh, from the government of Peru. Um, um, the, the bulk of this work is really from uh, collections of between 2011 and uh, 2017, maybe in the central uh, Corridiera de, of, of, of the Andes of Peru. Um, and um, these are uh, uh, currently being evaluated. Um, we, we, we've done the collections now. It's, it's sort of evaluation time, identification and all that. 
Um, it's useless. We're hoping that this long survey that you see uh, over here uh, from one end of the Andes, uh, Peruvian Andes to the other, will serve as a baseline record of diversity for future climate and land use changes uh, and, and studies of that nature. We've collected about 950 samples, 850 uh, providing information for analysis, uh, 730 only survived to be, become part of the collections. Um, the rest were really destroyed as part issue. You probably all know how difficult it is. Uh, it's another discussion altogether. Um, but um, what I want to do here is to take the example of, um, of, of uh, forest systems. Uh, for example, this is one way we use the collection. I want to show you that perhaps that this is one valuable way that the collection can help feature work. And that is, for example, um, <clears throat> we have, uh, we surveyed a number of forest systems in the, in the, uh, in the Andes. Um, and a number of them are mountain cloud forests. Uh, uh, some of them, as you say, which are in green labeled are the polylepis cloud forests between 3,600 and 4,000 meters in, uh, from Cusco, from Sierra de Pasco and from Ancash. And um, <clears throat> the white labeled ones are actually forests on the Pacific side of the Andes, non, mostly non-cloud really non forest systems between 150 to uh, 1,500 meters above sea level in Ancash, in Lambayeque, which is around here, and, and, and Tumbes, which is up the top, very, very close to the, the Ecuador border, which seems to connect to Paul's work a bit too. Um, then we also have a, uh, um, a um, um, Pedocarpus, Podocarpus of cloud forest, uh, which we uh, collected in, in Apurimac um, between uh, 2,700 and 3,500 meters whereabouts. And also very interesting labeled yellow, a mixed polylepis forest, a mixed forest which also contains polylepis um, parts in it. It's also on the Western Pacific side. Um, I suppose it could easily be classified as a cloud forest some parts of the year because it, uh, it becomes very humid there at, at times. Um, finally, in the Northern side, there's this Northern relic Amazonian mountain forest systems, um, which we collected. And so uh, each of them <clears throat> can probably, uh, we hope uh, form part of a a, a baseline information um, in these systems. <clears throat> so not to bore you all with, uh, with just data and graphs, uh, I want to show you something, of course, these beautiful friends, these incredible spirits that, that, that we found um, in, in, the, in the cloud forests and everywhere else. Um, here are some, I won't even try to name them. We, we name most, uh, oh, yeah, quite a lot of them to about the genus level, um, some to species, uh, a lot of work still needs to be done, um, but they're all, all extraordinary creatures. Um, for this um, talk, um, what we're gonna do is, um, what I've done is um, selected uh, just two systems, two cloud systems, two cloud forest systems to talk about. Firstly, the Northern Relic Amazonian cloud forest of Cañares in Lambayeque, and the Colossae uh, cloud forest in Cajamarca. Um, and the second group is really putting uh, three sites together uh, of uh, uh, polylepis cloud forests um, in part, and we're doing this to, to actually get enough uh, baseline information uh, of samples to be able to really do any analysis. Um, but um, these are, you know, found in Cusco uh, um, as well as um, the um, in Ancash, as well as said it with the Pasco. Um, you all probably know what they look like. The poly polylepis cloud forests um, and systems are are, are classically cloud um, type um, trees. They're 
They're short, stunted, epiphytic, uh, lots of epiphytes with lots of moss, lots of moisture. Um, and in this case, here is in Cusco, where we did a lot of uh, sampling or uh, work with uh, Universidad Nacional de San Antonio de Bad. And this is in Yanganuca in Alcash. And this is uh, La Quinoa in uh, Cerro de Cusco. But uh, uh, relic uh, highland Amazon um, systems. So what we find, uh, we, we've just started really analyzing the this type of data um, uh, uh, really a few days ago, and, and but I think it's uh, worth showing that. Um, we, to, to, we can compare between these polylepis systems and the relic Amazon, as you can see in this table. And we find that the relic Amazon system really has a richer um, uh, diversity in terms of orders, families, and genera than the polylepi systems, uh, a little bit higher in higher altitudes. Um, but um, um, that is taking about the same number of samples as you can see, one is 118 polylepis and we have 104 samples to make uh, that, that uh, analysis. Um, to add to that, um, the, uh, the, the data shows something else, really that we're very much on the lower side of the, the, the knowledge curve of the real uh, extent of diversity. For example, in the polylepis forest, it took 2.3, 2.4 samples to sample, uh, uh, 2.4 samples to get a new genus in that system. Whereas in the relic Amazonians, it took 1.6 samples before we found a new genus. Um, so um, yeah, as you can see, it, it's almost every second sample is a, is a new genus already in these systems. So there's a long way to go. Uh, so, uh, but who, what do we compare this with? Um, I suppose the only thing right now we can compare it to is a study in Colombia by, uh, of the Amazon forest by, uh, by a, a group, uh, Lopez uh, Quintero, Stasma, Franco Moleno, and Buchheit, in, in, which is published in uh, 2012 in Biodiversity Conservation. And they looked uh, at two, two Amazonian forests in Colombia, uh, um, 300 kilometers apart. They used 888 samples. They found 403 uh, macrofungal morpho species, 48 families uh, compared to ours, 26 and 35. They found 129 genera whereas uh, we only find 50 and 65 uh, respectively. Um, but I suppose we can't really compare directly right now and we haven't really been able to uh, aggregate the information to really compare those. Plus we only have 200 samples, whereas they have 800, almost 900 samples. Uh, we can, we can um, compare with another comparison we quickly did with the overall systems in Peru, not not in, in the Amazon, in the Amazon, in the Andean Peru, uh, where we for 684 samples we found seven classes, 17 orders, 51 families that compares well, 162 genera, and 529 morpho species of Basidio and Ascomycotina. So there we, we, we do see uh, a lot of similarity of, of the type of levels of diversity. And uh, of course, we're already diluting uh, some of the samples if we're only looking at, if, if we're looking at the whole system, not just the very diverse uh, uh, forest systems. Um, to continue uh, to compare the diversity between ecosystems, we also find that the the, the uh, cloud forests have a richer diversity than the natural grasslands. Um, and they also have comparable diversity, surprisingly, 
to the plantations of pinus and and, uh, and eucalyptus. Um, so an old, older Older, uh, uh, older data using uh, Simpson similarity index shows that forests as a whole have a greater richness in plantations though. So um, <clears throat> we have to be, analyze this, all this data a little bit more to make uh, clear comparisons. But um, that, that is the trend. Um, to put value on the on differences of diversity, of course, uh, the function of members of each community needs to be better understood as well. Um, so, um, but let us go a little bit more to looking at the, the cloud forest uh, uh, distribution um, of, of, uh, of diversity. Now, uh, in this case, we are looking at the polylepis forests. Um, we have 118 samples. 22 families uh, of rich, uh, the diversity of uh, quite rich diversity. And here we see quite a little, quite a bit of variation of the evenness between large groups that the groups have occupied quite a large percentage of the community and smaller groups uh, shown in white areas. So, <clears throat> for example, here, the, the large group, uh, the Agaricaceae and the Entomotaceae, the Hagophoraceae, the um, Marasmiaceae, the Plutaceae, and the Steraceae occupy quite substantial portions in, this, in these, these uh, polylepis cloud forests. Uh, in comparison, if we look at the chart of the Northern Relic uh, Amazonian cloud forest using 104 samples and a species richness of, we have a species richness of 36 families, they appear to show a greater evenness, sort of less dominance of one species or other. Um, we do get um, similarities with, uh, with other cloud forests, like the Polylepis cloud forest, like for example, the Hygophoraceae occupies substantial poly, Marasmiaceae, as well as the Steriaceae occupy um, a substantial portion still. Um, but the uh, Agaricaceae and the Entomolaceae occupy far less of this uh, um, importance in these systems, uh, as well as the Plutaceae. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> we're getting others, other groups such as the uh, Polyporaceae and the Mycenaceae, which, which are beginning to, which also take up bigger percentages with, with the, uh, is found in the, Polypor uh, in the Polylepis forests. Moving to another comparison, like the in, in, the, the in, in, in intraspecific within each group, um, this is using older data, uh, perhaps not as accurate, but uh, still gives trends. Um, and we see that the polylepis forest in one case from Zurite on the left and from Yanganuko in Ancash on the right uh, do show different similarities, but also different patterns. For example, the similarities you see um, in the Agaricaceae, they, 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 they form a, large, a substantial part of the population of the community. Um, of the, um, and um, the Entomomataceae also. Uh, whereas um, in Zurita, you have quite a bit of difference in the Hagophoraceae, quite a lot of difference there. So each, each site has its own diversity and its own um, uniqueness. Uh, and we get the same trends with the Amazonian cloud forests. I won't go into details with it, but it's the same types of trends uh, in the one case. And of course, we're dealing a little bit with problems with numbers here. We're only dealing with 53 samples. And the one with in Cañares on the right, uh, left, and then the Colosai on the right. But um, you know that you can see that each one does um, show differences. And um, <clears throat> so, so, so there are differences interspecific and between these forests. There also appear to be differences uh, with distance. So uh, if we look at some sort of similarity uh, in a rough scale, and I really don't want you to look too, too deeply into this table. It's meant to show, uh, it's all the data, uh, but it's meant to show cloud forest systems uh, over distance. So you have Surite, which in Cusco, a, a polylepis system, is 100 kilometers from Ampai, which is a, um, 
for the Kapu system, uh, Ankash is 750 kilometers from, from Ampai, which is a polylepi system, and, uh, and Canyares, which is a, a, a um, relic Amazonian, which is again 350 kilometers from Nyanganuku. And what you see in the diversity is, of course, 100 similarity between Zarate uh, or the Cusco, this is polylepis for with itself. It has 50% of the same genera uh, as Ampai. It has 45% of the same genera as Yanganuko polylepis forest. And it has 45% of, of similarity in, in, uh, in, in its population of of genera also found in the Canyares systems. Um, and you, you see the same type of trends in others, more with younger Nuko than, of, than with Canyares. In Canyares, you don't really see as much difference, but there seems to be, and that's, I suppose, logical that there is some change of, of um, similarity, uh, reduction in similarity with distance. Although, of course, in this case, we might also have the the, the altitude or other factors that influence uh, diversity. Finally, um, I want to say something about uh, cloud forest destruction, particularly the northern cloud forest, um, that, which are unprotected. Uh, and they're basically being destroyed. They were being destroyed as we collected, as you can see in this picture. Um, and the other forests uh, as well, they, they, they are being destroyed or, or um, in some way or other, or, or, uh, under some stress because of burning, because animal and animals, uh, domestic animals that come in there, uh, or for other reasons, uh, and information is, is needed to protect them, uh, to, to improve policies. So in conclusion, um, the most diverse macrofungal systems in the Andes are forests. Um, Composed, then they are composed principally of mountain cloud forests. Um, there are intra and interspecific differences in these cloud systems, um, and particularly those studied uh, polylepis and the northern relic Amazonian. Um, the most diverse cloud forest systems uh, are the relic Amazonian forests in the north. Um, also, another point is that the data suggests that we only really have a small percentage of the diversity as yet um, sampled, and really we need further sampling. And um, it is one example, this study is sort of, uh, one, this analysis is one example uh, from the collection of how it can be used to improve understanding of macrofungi and to help promote improved conservation strategies um, uh, and use of fungal genetic diversity in Peru. And of course, as I said, the Northern forest, but in general, all forests are being destroyed and highly endangered. Um, and Peru stands to lose much of its valuable remaining diversity if it is not uh, stopped soon. And with that, I just like to acknowledge other people, of course, who involved, uh, have been involved in this, this project. Firstly, Amari de Luque, uh, who works uh, with uh, uh, Seprostad and Global Mountain, uh, Mario Lopez, Mesones, with whom we wouldn't have been able to reach the uh, cloud forests in the north, um, Aaron Luque, um, uh, who's grown up now, but he's been, he was a great help, the little guy. Um, and in, uh, in Cusco, particularly uh, um, Universidad Nacional, uh, the San Antonio Bad with um, Dr. Maria Encarnacion Olgado and others like Ruth Lazarte and Albino Quispe. Um, and uh, not, uh, not to forget, of course, uh, Mag Magdalena Palvich, who's been a, a big friend and help uh, from the Cayetano in Lima with laboratory. Um, she was uh, accepting the collection and also with help uh, in various ways with the, with the um, report uh, and with the, the compendium, which we're, which we're still working on and we're hoping we'll, we'll, we'll put online for everyone to have a look at and, and comment on and help with that. And of course, the students, um, we never forget the students. Many people have helped uh, in, in the study already so far. And with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, here's a bit of contact information 
but um, uh, please contact me and uh, thank you for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, for your lecture. Uh, it, it's very interesting, very different for us from Brazil. We can say cloud forest in 3,000, 4,000 uh, meters. It's uh, 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 unbelievable for us. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go uh, to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Tina Hoffman from uh, Universidad Autónoma de uh, Chiriqui uh, from Panama. And uh, uh, Tina will uh, uh, talk uh, 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 about uh, cloud forests and fungi in, in Panama. Thank you very, very much, Tina. Uh, and uh, we are going then to the to to the lecture, Tina. Thank thank you very much uh, for having me. It's uh, thank you for the kind invitation to this symposium. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm also very happy to see so many participants. That's really important, so that we connect, right? So that we can do new collaborations together, uh, motivate people for working with fungi. So I'm very happy to be here today and to present my talk, which will be about an Altaxa fungal inventory that we did in a mountain forest in Western Panama. Thank you very much. And the video will start right now.
Welcome to the first symposium of fungal diversity and conservation in cloud forests. I'm very happy to be here and share with you some of our experiences from Panama. My name is Tina Hofmann. I work at the Universidad Autónoma de Chiriquí in Western Panama. And today I will present some results of an inventory of fungi and plants that we did in the Peru Volcano National Park in Western Panama. So the title of my talk will be Fungal and Plant Species Richness in a Mountain Rainforest in Western Panama. So one of the big questions that mycologists want to answer is how many species of fungi do exist? And there are different approaches in order to respond to this question. So one was proposed by Hawksworth in 1991. He proposed a fungus vascular plants ratio of 6 to 1, meaning that per vascular plant species or um, for each vascular plant species there exists six different species, up to six different species of fungi. So this ratio was obtained from long-term inventories that were done in England in temperate forests and there exist different um, inventory projects also in other countries but mainly in temperate regions. So these ratios help us to um, infer fungal diversity on regional and global scale. However, the um, tropical zones are mainly not taken into account when uh, defining these ratios. So today, if we talk about fungal diversity in, on the planet, we have described Colleges have described 148,000 species of fungi. However, um, scientists estimate that there can be 2.2 to 3.8 million species worldwide present, but they are not described yet. So if we put this into um, a graphic uh, representation, uh, this could look like this. We have in the center this orange dot are the known or described uh, species of fungi and the gray circles represent the estimated uh, numbers of species of fungi. So if we compare this with plants, in the case of plants the green dot is bigger. You see that there are more plant species that have been described about uh, roughly 347, more than 347,000 plant species, vascular plant species have been described and the estimates are that there are between 400 to 500,000 plant species um, that exist on the planet. So you see that we have this huge knowledge gap in the case of the fungi. This map shows the diversity zones of vascular plant species on a global scale. You see these red or pinkish areas that re represent um, highly diverse zones where uh, there's a high number of vascular plant species per 10,000 square kilometers. And Panama lies within such a highly diverse zone. So now, what does this mean for the fungal diversity in this area? So, is Panama a hotspot of fungal diversity? Now, in Panama, we know about, or we know more than 10,000 plant species. And they are described from Panama. And if we apply this fungus plant ratio proposed by Hawksworth, we would estimate that there exist 60,000 species of fungi. Until now, we have 3,103 reported species in the country, which means that up to now we only know 5% 5 of the total estimated fungal diversity in, the, in Panama. So this means that we are definitely in a pioneer phase of mycological research in Panama, and it is um, we have a lot of work to do in order to increase our knowledge of the fungal diversity in the country. 
in Panama. We have done an all taxa inventory in a lowland tropical forest, a seasonal uh, tropical forest highly influenced by dry season. And now we wanted to repeat the same experiment at an oak forest at higher elevations. So we selected the Parque Nacional do Cambaru, especially, uh, specifically the western side which is called Paso Ancho. So there we um, defined a 500 meter transect where we collected monthly fungi and plants. So the fungal inventory was two hours and the plant inventory was two hours as well every month. And we had about um, a minimum of three collectors in the field and a minimum of one experienced mycologist this seems low, uh, however, we have very few mycologists um, at the university and um, this was a similar experiment conditions like in the first inventory project. So um, it is unfortunate that we had only one experienced mycologist most of the time, but it's a reality that we are facing. So we also um, collected abiotic data on temperature and air humidity in order to correlate this with the diversity of fungi and plants. So in this 500 meter transect, we had different vegetation types. This was similar to, we choose these different, we choose this heterogeneous um, vegetation because in the lowland tropical forest, we also had a heterogeneous vegetation so in the case of Paso Ancho, we choose the first part of the transect was a savanna-like open vegetation with Poaceae species, with different Poaceae species, grasses. Also um, in agave, which was very uh, prominent, uh, agave species, which was very prominent in this area and some um, smaller, uh, and also some solitary smaller trees. Then we had these Comorostophilus arbutoidus patches this is an ericaceae, and this plant is known to form associations with mycorrhiza fungi. And then we had an oak forest, different oak species, also other tree species, and this typical um, Chuskia understory. Chuskia is a bamboo like plant, and this gives this, this uh, typical appearance uh, in these oak forests. It's very typical to see this at least in the oak forest on, uh, that we uh, have ob observed in, on the Panamanian side of the Talamanca mountain chain. So it's a very typical um, vegetation type for the higher altitudes in Panama. During the inventory, we had 24 sampling events. We visited the area every month during two years and we collected uh, floating body forming mushrooms mainly and also microfungi that had uh, visibly um, or colonies that were visible with the naked eye so we did not uh, look for endophytic fungi we did not look for soil fungi um, we did not do environmental sequencing yet so we were just focused on the those fungi that form structures that are visible to the naked eye. And we collected everything that we tried to collect everything that we could find. And then we um, tried to identify the, the different specimens. We collected more than 10,000 specimens and uh, we tried to document the macro and micromorphology with these index cards. So on these index cards, we try to include um, different uh, measurements and also um, the macro and micromorphology in order to be able to recognize the, spe the species later. And then we also uh, preserve the specimens and uh, they are now housed in the herbarium of the university in Chile. 
Here you can see the identification progress of the collected specimens. In the case of plants, we had a relatively high percentage of progress uh, related to the identification on species level. However, in the case of fungi, it was very difficult, very challenging uh, in order to try to identify the specimens on species level. So we have a, we have a high percentage of unidentified um, species or species identified on genus level. And in this case, um, it is very important to incorporate also molecular data, not only base the inventories on morphological data, but also uh, include molecular data and try to uh, sequence as much specimens as possible. So that would be something that uh, we would have to try and do in the future in order to have uh, more ideas about how, how many different species occur in this area. Right now, most of the identification is based on morphological features. Here you can see the species accumulation curves or preliminary species accumulation curves that we obtained for fungi in plants. On the left side you see the accumulation curves of fungi and on the right side the accumulation curve for plant. In total we collected uh, 690 species of fungi or identified uh, 690 different species of fungi and 202 species of plants. In the case of plants you can see that this curve is about to become saturated. So the darker green line represents the collector curve and the uh, brighter green line is the rarefied species accumulation curve. And we see that after 24 sampling events we have a relatively sat saturated curve which means that the uh, monitoring or the inventory of the plants in this 500 meter transect is nearly complete. In the case of fungi, we cannot say that they say this. We have a curve that is not saturated, and um, we had not, we have not yet um, the estimations of how long we would have to continue our sampling in order to get a saturated curve. But it surely would take. So we still have to work on some of the identifications of the uh, fungal specimens that we collected, but um, we can see that the fungal inventory is far from complete after two years. We will have to continue sampling for many years in order to have a complete inventory. So now we can compare the fungus plant ratio from Paso Ancho, from the higher altitudes of Western Panama, and this um, inventory project that we did in the uh, lower seasonal uh, forest, so in, in the lowland seasonal forest, so in Rio Mahagua, we obtained a fungus plant ratio from 1.8 to 1, and in Paso Ancho, a fungus plant ratio from of 3 to 1. So. Both cases we have species accumulation curves that do not saturate. So in both cases we have to continue collecting for years in order to get saturated accumulation curves, uh, which indicates that the diversity of fungi in both places is much higher than the diversity of plants, and that the sampling strategies or sampling events have to be extended for many years to get the idea of the uh, true diversity that exists in these areas. So now I wanted to talk also about some aspects that has to have to do with conservation of this area. So we do not have for Panama or for any region in Panama a red list for fungi. In the case of plants, there's more information present and of course the fungi need um, fun fungal protection of fungi is also protection of ecosystems so if the ecosystem is um, 
threatened, of course, the fungi in this ecosystem are also threatened. And we could also um, compare now the conservation status of the plants because many, many species of fungi are dependent on a symbiotic um, plant partner or on the, on the plant as substrate. So in the national park, we have different plants that are known to form associations with mycorrhiza fungi, for example, Cumulostaphylus albutridis, which uh, is considered by Rodriguez et al. from 2011 as near-threatened, Quercosalicifolia as well, near-threatened, and Quercus costaricensis is an endangered species and it occurs also in this national park. And there are also substrates that are important for saprotrophic fungi, um, for example, different Quercus species where uh, wood inhabiting or wood degradating fungi uh, are present. And then we have uh, Tuskia species, for example, Tuskia subtesselata, which is endangered and it also occurs in this area. So in order to um, have ideas about what could be the conservation status of fungi, we could take into account the conservation status of the host plants that uh, these fungi have. So in the inventory project we also found some uh, fungi that we were able to identify and that are considered by Müller et al as endemic for or putative endemics for these oak dominated forests. So there's for example Lectino monticula uh, that we found repeatedly in the forest, Boletus crecophilus, which seems to be um, uh, we have find found it in the savanna like open vegetation also inside the forest and Amanita flavoconia inside the forest. So these um, fungi are present and um, due to their, so they are very typical for these forests, for these oak dominated forests. During the inventory we found a lot of different uh, specimens that we could not identify on species level. What I wanted to show you here is the example of Entoloma. We had a, le a lot of um, specimens with Entolomatoid spores. So we had this uh, student, Jose Rodriguez, who did his bachelor thesis on these fungi, on this group of fungi, and we had a lot of difficulties identifying the different specimens. So we had the opportunity to make a collaboration with Kai Reschke from the Goethe University in Frankfurt in Germany. And uh, Kai um, worked not only the morphological part but also the molecular part. And we now know that most of the specimens that we collected in Paso Ancho are actually undescribed species. So they have to be described as new species to science. And this is probably, well, the case in, in the case for most of the species of fungi that are uh, present in this zone, that these represent undescribed species. And so this again is very important that we have to um, do both morph morphological and molecular analysis in order to be able to identify the specimens. So, so apart from entoloma, there are many other potential groups of fungi that might contain a lot of undescribed taxa and that are present in this particular area. For example, there are many saprotrophic fungi that we could not identify on species level. For example, those that grow on Truskia. Truskia is a substrate, um, this bamboo-like uh, plant. It's a very interesting uh, substrate. Ma many different uh, species we have collected on this substrate. And then there are wood inhabiting fungi, for example, cortisoid fungi that are very poorly known in general for Panama, not only for this, uh, for Paso Ancho, but also for Panama in general, so that would be very interesting 
to have a collaboration with somebody who is um, interested in these fungi. And there are also many mycorrhizae or macrofungi that have not been thoroughly described in Panama. For example, Ramaya species or uh, Rusulasi. In the case of Rusulasi, we have now a collaboration with the Goethe University in Frankfurt and uh, um, the, the PhD student Katrin Manz and also the Rusula specialist Felix Hamper from Germany. They are working on different um, species of Rusula, Lactarius, Lactiflus, and they have found uh, many, many taxa that are undescribed and they are currently now describing these as new to science. Then we have also plant parasitic microfungi where we have a lot of new species that have been described in the last years. There we have especially a collaboration with many people bring and also with Roland Kirschner from Taiwan. Um, they have collected many uh, different uh, specimens here in Panama and described the new, a lot of new species. So uh, lastly, I would like to invite you um, to help us to identify, characterize the fungi of Panama. They need your help. Uh, we are very few mycologists and uh, we cannot do it but alone. We need the help. So if you are interested and you want to start a collaboration with us or want to come and collect, and, uh, you, you are very welcome. You can always contact me uh, with my email address, Sina Hofmann at Unachi. So, and with these images from our field work in Paso Ancho, I would like to finish my talk. I want to thank the Environmental Ministry of Panama for issuing the collection export permits. I would like to thank the collaborators at the different universities in Germany, in the Czech Republic, in Ecuador, in Costa Rica, and in Taiwan. Also, I would like to thank the funding agencies to make possible this research in the in Paso Ancho. And of course, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And please uh, contact me if you are interested in future collaborative work, because in Panama, we definitely need more mycologists to help us to um, understand and describe the diversity of fungi. Thank you.
Uh, Tina, thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. Of course, we are all very uh, excited to help you uh, in, <laughs> in uh, the identification and field works in uh, have, uh, I, I think uh, most of us will uh, have students that we can have collaboration. So, uh, of course you are going to, to help. <laughs> thank you, thank you, that's so nice. I'm really happy, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, of course, thank you very much. Now uh, we are going to receive uh, Dr. Aida Vasco from University of Antioquia. And Aida will uh, talk about fungi in, in the cloud forests of, of Colombia. Aida, it's a great pleasure to, to receive you here. And it's your time now. Bueno, Aristóteles, muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias para todos. Me confirman si se está viendo bien, por favor. Bueno, yo supongo que se está viendo bien. No los puedo sí, ver en este instante. Sí. Ok, está gracias. Todo ok, todo ok. <risa> bueno, no, muchas gracias. Es que ver, como queda uno como en otro mundo, entonces no sabe si, si todo va bien. Bueno, eh, creo que es la última charla del día y la última charla de, este, de esta mesa de trabajo. Eh, espero que no estén muy cansados, pero bueno... Eh, Quiero pues, reiterar un poco lo que, lo que vamos a ver ahorita en el caso de Colombia, es un poco lo que ya nos ha mostrado Paul, nos ha mostrado Peter y nos ha mostrado Tina, y es que hay un desconocimiento muy grande acerca de esa diversidad fúngica de los bosques nublados de Colombia, pues de, de toda esta región y ocurre lo mismo en el país. Eh, voy a exponer en, en español, eh, las diapositivas están en inglés, eh, yo espero que, que me entiendan y voy a tratar de hablar lento. Como hemos visto en el transcurso del día, eh, pues los bosques de nub, nublados, como los llamamos aquí en Colombia, o de niebla, eh, pues son unos ecosistemas muy especiales que ocurren en las puntas de las montañas y aquí en el país ocurren también hacia los lados de las montañas en ciertas altitudes, entre los 2.000 y 3.200 metros. Son zonas que están cubiertas constantemente por neblina o por nubes y eh, tienen una diversidad florística y de fauna muy especial y llega a tener una gran cantidad de endemismos. Entonces son ecosistemas que han sido eh, muy interesantes, pero son muy frágiles también porque tienen muchas presiones antrópicas, porque quedan, por lo menos en el país, como ya lo vamos a ver, en las zonas andinas de las cordilleras del país, eh, que es donde está ubicada la mayor parte de la población. Eh, estas zonas tienen, debido a procesos internos de evapotranspiración y la, como se condensan las nubes, pues es una zona con unas muy altas humedades que producen unos ecosistemas bastante particulares. Como había mencionado, son ecosistemas muy frágiles. En Colombia quedan solo 5% de, de lo que era el ecosistema eh, eh, inicialmente, el ecosistema prístino. Eh, esos bosques están res, eh, restringidos en pequeñas áreas y están en alto riesgo de extinción. Y pues no solamente el ecosistema, sino todo lo que hay internamente. Bueno, en el país, entonces, como lo estaba yo mencionando, estos, estos bosques están ubicados entre los 2.800 y 3.800 eh, metros sobre el nivel del mar y eh, en característica una de las características, o, o digamos que podemos dividirlo para este trabajo en dos tipos eh, de bosques, dependiendo de la composición florística. Uno son los bosques dominados por el roble, en Colombia tenemos eh, la, la especie de Quercus humbolti, 
que, eh, pues como ustedes saben, forma eh, asociaciones ectomicorrísicas, por eso separamos los bosques, y o, otros bosques mixtos donde hay, no hay dominancia de, ecto, de, de, pues, de, de plantas que formen ectomicorrisa, ectomicorrisas, tenemos bosques dominados por especies como Ocotea, Calófila, Weimania, Mircine, eh, también en otras áreas de bosques nublados podemos encontrar parches de podocarpus, que es una podocarpacia eh, nativa, y también unas asociaciones vegetales de Drimis y Clusia. Entonces, podemos como separar los bosques eh, nublados en dos tipos de vegetación, una donde está la dominancia por roble y la otra donde están esos otros bosques eh, donde pueden haber estos elementos que son los más representativos florísticamente. En el país, a pesar de que tenemos tres cordilleras, aquí eh, llega la cordillera de los Andes y en Colombia eh, ocurre algo muy particular y es que se divide en tres ramales, voy a poner acá mi señalador, eh, se divide en tres ramales principales, la cordillera oriental, perdón, la oriental, la central y la occidental. Eh, vemos que no, el bosque de, de niebla no está distribuido homogéneamente en toda la cordillera, sino que tiene que darse ciertas características importantes eh, como acumulación de nubes eh, para que se den estos bosques nublados. Además, eh, se da también en unos ecosistemas bastante particulares, en unas zonas, perdón, bastante particulares como son la Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, que es una serranía aislada que queda en la parte norte del país, y otra muy pequeñita, una serranía muy pequeñita y muy particular, que es la serranía de la Macuira, rodeada por, por desiertos. Esta es una foto de la serranía de la Macuira, vemos que está rodeada por una zona desértica, pero el hecho de que sea una montañita eh, en una zona muy plana y rodeada de mar, que trae mucha humedad, hace que a muy poca altura se forme un bosque de niebla bastante particular. Es similar a lo que nos mostró eh, Peter, que ocurre eh, en la costa peruana, es un ecosistema similar. Entonces, tenemos una gran cantidad o una gran extensión de bosques de niebla eh, en la zona andina, a pesar de, de que están con mucha presión antrópica, en la Sierra Nevada, aquí aislados, en la Macuira, y bueno, aquí no está, pero en la Serronía también aquí del Darien, en la del Baudou, tenemos remanentes de bosque de niebla. Eh, bueno, se me fue una diapositiva antes, perdón. Eh, qué risa. Lo que quiero mostrarles con esta diapositiva es que hay... A pesar de que hay una presión antrópica bastante grande con, en este tipo de sistemas, hay algunas zonas que no, el mapa no encontró un mapa mejor, que son estas zonas en rojo, son zonas de parques nacionales donde parte de los sistemas que se están eh, cubriendo y protegiendo son bosques de niebla. ¿Qué ocurre? Pues eh, una cosa es ver el mapa y bueno, de todas maneras los parques nacionales en el país tienen bastantes conflictos y hay de todas maneras presiones antrópicas, pero por lo menos a nivel eh, nacional pues tienen alguna parte de este bosque tiene una protección al quedar dentro de las áreas de parques nacionales. ¿Qué conocemos sobre los hongos de este tipo de sistemas en el país? Y creo que ahí aquí hay que hacer esa diferencia muy grande sobre los bosques de robles y el otro tipo de sistemas que ya les mostré. Eh, en Colombia en general, pues falta mucho por conocer sobre la diversidad de hongos en, pues, en, de todo el país. Aquí vemos un mapa de las especies publicadas eh, de los diferentes departamentos en Colombia y vemos que la mayoría de las especies es, son reportadas para los departamentos de Antioquia, los departamentos bueno, de Cundinamarca y de Boyacá, localizados en la zona andina y algunos de esos cerca a zonas de bosques de niebla. Sin embargo, pues la mayoría del país está desconocido, entonces muchos de los datos que les voy a mostrar es de zonas muy particulares, pero no están mostrando el panorama general de lo que podría ser la diversidad de hongos en los bosques nublados. Eh, buscando información me encontré este artículo, que salió este año, no lo conocía realmente, eh, no lo alcancé a revisar con, 
con detalle de dónde salen los datos, pero eh, está muy relacionado con la temática que estamos viendo hoy y es el conocimiento actual de los hongos en bosques nubados de la zona neotropical. Habla de patrones de distribución y de composición y vemos que ellos aquí hacen un reporte de que para Colombia hay 308, perdón, 268 especies eh, de las cuales 23 son nuevas especies descritas para este tipo de ecosistema. Como les indiqué, no tuve mucha opción de revisar el artículo, pero me parece muy importante porque aquí hay unas luces que de pronto nos pueden servir para todos estos trabajos que acaba de presentar Peter, eh, Tina y Paul eh, sobre lo que se sabe y los patrones de distribución de estas especies en, en este tipo de, de bosques. Entonces, de los bosques que no son dominados por roble, pues hay muy poquita información. Creo que relevante está un trabajo publicado en la época de finales de los 80 por Pulido y Bookout, eh, quienes estuvieron trabajando de la mano con uno, un grupo de holandeses y de investigadores colombianos que hicieron unos transectos eh, en las cordilleras, en las tres cordilleras del país. En esos transectos se estuvieron documentando diferentes grupos de organismos y para fortuna eh, incluyeron eh, dos especialistas, dos micólogos, Teun Bucauti y Margarita Pulido, los dos en esa época en formación. Teun, después es, tuve la fortuna de que fuera mi director de la tesis del doctorado y estaba a punto de ya de jubilarse, pero ellos estuvieron caminando por las montañas del país colectando o hongos. Eh, aquí traigo los resultados, mucho de este trabajo no se publicó, pero traigo los resultados publicados en, en uno de estos libros que recopilaba la información sobre eh, la diversidad de organismos en las cordilleras, este fue en el Parque de los Nevados, y vemos que ellos reportan un total de 138 especies, 40 de ascomicota, 84 de basidiomicota, y 10, bueno, de mixomicetes, que hace parte de los hongos aliados. Eh, ellos se centraron en este tipo de bosques no ectomicorrísicos y por eso la mayor diversidad de grupos reportados son de hongos aprofíticos de las familias marasmiase, misenase, estrofariase, tricolomatase y en ascomicota, silariase y alocifase. Pido disculpas si de pronto han cambiado alguna de estas familias, todo lo han movido bastante en los últimos años y es una base que yo he llevado un tiempo sin tocar. Eh, entonces, lo que vemos es que hay, una, hay, hay algunos reportes, eh, este digamos es el trabajo como más juicioso que, que podemos encontrar en la literatura, ya que se basa en un transecto donde había datos además de otros elementos como la vegetación, eh, como insectos, eh, y animales. De, en cuanto a otros trabajos, la información en general es muy dispersa, eh, se encuentra principalmente eh, reportes más de trabajos de tipo taxonómico, pero no tené, no pudimos, yo no pude, digamos, como realmente compilar como una información mucho más concreta sobre, en general, eh, los bosques nublados eh, donde no hay quercus porque la mayoría de los trabajos en el país se han hecho enfocado, eh, por lo menos en las zonas andinas, en los bosques de robles, en hongos principalmente asociados a este árbol y es realmente en el país lo que más conocemos. A pesar de que es lo que más conocemos, quiero reiterar que no lo conocemos por completo, eh, la mayoría de trabajos y de datos conocidos son de unos pocos sitios en, dos, en, en las cordilleras, principalmente cerca a ciudades y cerca a zonas donde hay micólogos especialistas, pero falta todavía mucho por conocer. Al año 2022 eh, salió un artículo publicado por Natalia Vargas y Silvia Restrepo, donde ellos hacen una recopilación de las especies reportadas eh, de ectomicorrisas para el país y encuentran que hay un total de 120 especies de hongos ectomicorrísicos eh, reportados a partir de ascomas y de basidiomas, esto es bastante importante, entonces este es como el enfoque que se ha hecho principalmente de, de estudio, simplemente 
algunas zonas donde se van a colectar y se han hecho descripciones y eh, se han caracterizado las, la funga de esas zonas. Eh, de ese trabajo, de esas 120 especies, pues es un trabajo que se ha venido haciendo a largo plazo, eh, hecho por micólogos extranjeros y también por micólogos colombianos, sobre todo más en tiempos recientes, y además de la alta biodiversidad, creo que es muy importante resaltar que de las 120 especies que se conocen para este tipo de ecosistemas, 47 han sido descritas de material colombiano, que es casi la mitad. Eh, muchas de estas especies se comparten con eh, Costa Rica y posiblemente iremos a medida que se profundice en el, en el estudio de la funga en Centroamérica, donde hay poblaciones de robles, pues iremos viendo qué tanto se comparten estas especies, pero creo que es un número bastante relevante, casi el 50% eh, eh, resultaron o han sido especies que, que, que se han encontrado nuevas para la ciencia, yo creo que ese número va a ir aumentando a medida que nos empecemos a estudiar grupos tan complejos eh, como cortinario, ¿cierto? con tantas especies crípticas y como otros grupos que vamos a ver que son relevantes para este tipo de bosque, aunque muchas veces no eh, vemos las fructificaciones. Bueno, aquí algunas fotos de, de las especies que se han eh, eh, descrito de material colombiano, algunas son ectomicorrísicas, también puse unas eh, saprofíticas, eh, y los grupos como más, más diversos son amanitas, boletus, cortinarios, aunque sigo insistiendo que es un grupo que nos va a dar muchas sorpresas, craterelos y cantarelos, inocibes, lactarios, lexinus y todo el grupo de las reosuláceas. Eh, estos bosques y estos hongos de estos bosques son muy importantes para muchas comunidades, sobre todo en ciertas regiones del país, no para todo el país porque son utilizadas por grupos indígenas y campesinos en la alimentación. Entonces, eh, los bosques enurados pues, generan, o los bosques, los, los hongos que crecen ahí, pues son un recurso bastante importante en la seguridad alimentaria de muchos de los pueblos eh, indígenas y campesinos más tradicionales de, del país. Entonces, tienen mucha relevancia también. Eh, voy a mostrar muy rápidamente unos datos eh, de un trabajo que tenía en un cajón y que traté de explorar un poco eh, para, este, eh, para este simposio y es un trabajo que se hizo de caracterizar las comunidades de hongos del suelo con eh, metabarcodin, en este caso pues son muestras que logramos secuenciar con pirosecuenciación hace algunos años, eh, para esto tuvimos solamente un pequeño muestreo de unos sitios en Santa Rosa de Osos y en Murillo de Bosques de Robles y encontramos un total de 933 unidades taxonómicas operacionales eh, con grupos, con representaciones, digamos que eh, de todos los grupos taxonómicos que uno espera encontrar y eh, los resultados son compatibles con otros trabajos que se han hecho, que no son muchos, eh, caracterizando las comunidades con este tipo de métodos y vimos que hay una dominancia de grupos como elotiales, hipocreales, eh, mortereliales, ordaliales, requisporales y también empiezan ya a aparecer grupos de vacío micote también bastante importantes. Eh, en cuanto a los grupos tróficos, pues una alta dominancia de hongos aprobios estas son las diferentes muestras, estas son las dos de Murillo y estas son las tres de Santa Rosa de Osos. Este es el total de, de oh, pues el, el, la, sí, el acumulado de las muestras. Vemos cómo entonces, igual que en otros trabajos, se ha encontrado que la comunidad está dominada por hongos aprófitos, seguida de, plantas, de hongos patógenos de plantas, ah, bueno, había micoparásitos también, eh, y hongos ectomicorrísicos que, bueno, estábamos trabajando en bosques de robles y son bastante importantes. Con respecto a los hongos ectomicorrísicos, pues encontramos, detectamos un total de 101 otus. Recuerden que les había contado que para este eh, tipo de bosque eh, hay reportadas 120 especies con base en fructificaciones. Nosotros de muestras de suelo eh, detectamos 101 otus y con los grupos o linajes ectomicorrísicos dominantes 
rúsula y lactarios y tomen tela y teléfora. Eh, recuerden que yo les conté que para, con base en cuerpos fructíferos, los dominantes eran grupos como amanita, rúsula, boletus, cortinarios. Y aquí vemos que eh, a nivel de suelo, pues nos está mostrando otra, eh, como aún riqueza y abundancia también como de los, bueno, riqueza en este caso, eh, de grupos que no se ven eh, reflejados en cuerpos fructíferos como son principalmente las tomentelas y las teléforas, también eh, vemos que las cebacinas no están tan, pues están, bien repre pues están representadas también y pues básicamente es porque estos tipos de hongos pues no forman cuerpos fructíferos muy eh, vistosos para los micólogos eh, y en general pues son esos grupos crípticos que, que hacen parte de la diversidad que está en los ecosistemas pero no la no la habíamos reportado con base en el tipo de, de trabajos que hacíamos de manera tradicional como la búsqueda de cuerpos fructíferos. Eh, lo que les cuento es, este trabajo sigue en evolución, sigo haciendo los análisis, quería era como mostrarles los datos eh, preliminares que me parece que concuerdan con lo que conocemos un poco eh, con base en los cuerpos fructíferos y nos van a permitir a medida que vayamos acumulando información empezar también a responder preguntas ya más de tipo ecológico cuando lo relacionemos con las condiciones edáficas y demás en este momento la mayoría de lo que conocemos es solamente eh, qué hay pero no hemos empezado a preguntarnos eh, o a hacernos preguntas ecológicas eh, en este momento tenemos la fortuna de que llegó al país, bueno, hace ya un par de años, Adriana Corrales, que está empezando a trabajar y a resolver y a, y a hacerse preguntas ecológicas sobre eh, este tipo de bosques, sobre todo bosques de robles, y creo que eh, su aporte va a ser maravilloso porque necesitamos ir más allá de, de hacer inventarios y saber qué hay, a empezar a, a entender cómo están interaccionando los hongos con los, entre ellos y con los eh, otros elementos de los ecosistemas. Eh, como les estaba contando, porque ya para terminar, eh, pues los bosques están en, eh, en grave peligro, estos bosques tienen mucha presión antrópica y por ende los hongos también. Eh, recientemente hemos estado haciendo un trabajo de eh, categorizar algunas especies, aquí les muestro dos relacionadas con bosques de robles, Lactiflus halingi, Lexinum andinum, eh, que han empezado a ser categorizadas tratando de visibilizar ante la comunidad internacional y la comunidad también colombiana eh, la importante que pueden ser los hongos y que también ellos están en, en algunos riesgos de extinción debido al uso y el manejo que tenemos en este momento de, de los ecosistemas y del país. Eh, para concluir, entonces falta mucho por conocer, eh, les mostré solamente cositas que sabemos de sitios muy puntuales, de la Sierra Nevada tenemos muy poca información y de la Macuira no tenemos realmente eh, datos, entonces de bosques eh, nubla, nublados conocemos muy poquitos, eh, perdón, de bosques de nieblas conocemos muy poquito, eh, sabemos mucho de bosques de robles pero todavía en un nivel más de de conocer la diversidad, pero no entender ya aspectos ecológicos que, que creo que son muy importantes en, para empezar a explorar, o de biogeografía y otros aspectos. Eh, con respecto a los bosques de niebla, que no, donde, no hay bos, donde no hay quercus, donde no hay roble, sabemos aún menos, muy poco, con mucho potencial también de nuevas especies que posiblemente se van a perder antes de que las conozcamos porque está más rápida la tasa de deforestación que la formación de micólogos. Y bueno, eh, creo que falta mucho por, por conocer. Eh, quería darles las gracias y aprovechar para invitarlos a que vean dos video posters de trabajos que están haciendo eh, micólogos en formación en el país, en, en este tipo de ecosistemas, eh, unos aprovechamiento de macrohongos como estrategia de conservación de los robledales nublados en los Andes orientales del país, y el otro es sobre el potencial de hongos lignícolas, eh, de bosques también de niebla, y sus propiedades antioxidantes. Entonces, eh, les agradezco mucho la atención, y bueno, finalmente era mostrarles que hay mucho potencial, que conocemos muy poquito y que 
ese, tenemos los mismos problemas de baches de conocimiento y eh, presiones antrópicas sobre estos, estos bosques en todos los países latinoamericanos. Muchas gracias. Okay. Uh, now we are uh, at the end of the second part of our round table. Uh, and and the, at the end of our first day. So once again, thank you very, very much for all of you to, to uh, get your time to stay here and, and uh, uh, present 
uh, uh, all these uh, beautiful um, lectures for us from distinct themes and places and countries. And Ida, uh, thank you very much. I am very, uh, I am fascinated with this, this uh, place with cloud forest and uh, uh, with deserts in the north. I, I, I've never seen this before in my, in my life. So, uh, well, there are many questions. Uh, I would like to say to the attendees that uh, I received a filtered uh, uh, some questions, okay? So uh, don't be, how do you say, sad if uh, 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 some of your questions are not here because it's impossible <laughs> because of, of, of the time, okay? So uh, I will ask the lecturers one or uh, uh, two questions for each, okay? Uh, Paul. Uh, I, I, I will say in English and then in, 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 in Portuguese, okay? Please, okay. No, no problem. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how is the protection of traditional knowledge in Ecuador um, accounting for that uh, some fungi are traditionally known as uh, medi medicinal. Uh, como es la protección uh, del conocimiento tradicional en Ecuador? Uh, Tiene en vista que uh, algunos hongos son tradicionalmente conocidos como medicinales. Sim, não sei se em português ou em espanhol. Em espanhol, pode ser? Ok. Como que é? Em in, in espanhol. Eu okay. não falo espanhol, ok? Eu não falo espanhol. Fala a metade em espanhol e a metade em português. Em português. Em Bom, na verdade, em Equador, as novas leis com o Ministério do Ambiente, eh, menos mal, se han ido reformando. Ahora ya los hongos se reconocen justamente en el momento de, la, de las colectas y también obviamente hay una protección más eh, hacia, hacia, hacia funga, ¿no? Es importante esto y al mismo tiempo el, el, la protección mediante la constitución del Estado en donde se protegen los saberes ancestrales. La otra parte importante es que cuando eh, nosotros realizamos un banco de genes o un banco de información, siempre están respaldados con las universidades. Al estar respaldado con la universidad, entonces también se mantiene la autoría de la comunidad y lo que se trata es de replicar esa información o de devolver esa información en beneficio de la comunidad. Entonces el recurso a nivel de categoría de uso medicinal, eh, eh, bueno, estamos explotando ahora eh, bastante información de esto eh, con principios activos, metabolitos secundarios, etcétera. Y eso lo estamos haciendo en conjunto con la Facultad de Ciencias Biológicas, la Facultad de Ingeniería Química, en donde también tenemos el Laboratorio de Micología Aplicada. Y pues es importante eso porque el momento que ya tenemos el principio activo, identificamos, pues eh, lo publicamos en conjunto y en coautoría con las comunidades. Entonces de esa forma se protege el recurso y una vez que se quiera eh, de una u otra forma dar algún lineamiento bajo la ley ambiental, pues ya está muy, muy, muy protegido. Esa es la forma como nosotros, como academia, apoyamos. Ok, uh, thank you very much. Another one, uh, Paul. Uh, is there any study with bioluminescent fungi and traditional communities? ¿Hay algún estudio eh, eh, con hongos bioluminescentes y eh, comunidades tradicionales? Sí, sí. ¿En Ecuador? Eh, Precisamente ahora tenemos, y, y justamente en, en algún encuentro que tuvimos en Panamá, eh, y esperemos pase la pandemia, yo tengo ofrecidos algunos libros para enviar, Correos del Ecuador cerró lastimosamente, pero tenemos que hacerlo de forma privada. Uh -huh. eh, en ese, justamente en ese librito, 
hablamos sobre el uso de hongos bioluminiscentes eh, relacionados con las comunidades. Por ejemplo, las comunidades quichuas de la Amazonía le dicen nina ala, hongo eh, de fuego, que les ayuda justamente a los cazadores a no perderse el camino. ¿sí? Y también eh, pues están muy vinculados con, las, con los hayas o con los espíritus del bosque. Por eso es súper importante también. En esta parte de los bosques eh, nubosos se, se ve mucho este proceso de bio, bioluminiscencia, ¿no? Que está llamando hoy por hoy a, um, de, como una forma atractiva hacia el micoturismo. Entonces, en eso wow. también estamos trabajando con, la, con las comunidades, porque en la noche se hace una visita Ajá. a los senderos y Ajá. todo eso se prende como si fuera una película de Avatar, más o menos. ¿Sí? Ok. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Thank you. Ahora... Uh, uh, agora para uh, Peter. Peter, is the diversity of macro fungi related to a higher biodiversity of plants in the studied sites? Sorry. Um... Uh, what was that related in which side? Uh, uh, is the diversity of macro fungi related to a higher diversity of plants in the study sites in the sites that you yeah, that you uh, uh, present? Okay. Well, I, I, I honestly, I'm, unfortunately, we don't have the, the information, but um, although generally it's, it's uh, what we know of the uh, relic Amazonian forests is there, they, they are more diverse than the uh, polylepis forests in terms of plants, at least, um, at least um, vascular uh, tree, um, um, the, 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 the macro, the macro um, uh, flora, really. Um, so in that sense, probably yes, but uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, if we stake all, all, all the diversity the, of the flora, I mean, who knows? Uh, I, mean, I, I, I don't know enough about it. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Peter. Now for, for Tina. Uh, Tina, uh, what taxonomic fungal groups are the most difficult and constitute most of those unidentified species? Uh, this was, would be probably Agaricalis, the order yeah. Agaricalis was very, we, we found many different specimens and we, we do not have specialists for Agaricalis in Panama and we also have um, not many collaborations yet. We just started this. Uh, like uh, two years or three years ago, we started the first collaborations, like in the case of Entoloma and Rosulacy, these, these big um, Rosula, Lactarius, Lactifluus species. But for other um, uh, spe species, we do not have the specialists yet. So um, there are many Marasmius and ma many, many other uh, genera in Agaricales that are very poorly known in general for Panama, not, not only for this area, in general. So in general. Agaricales is probably this, the most, the biggest group. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is another one selected here from the team for you, Tina. Uh, uh, are those specimens, the deposited in a particular herbarium? Yes, uh, we at yeah. the university, we have a herbarium. Okay. And uh, there we, um, we have the specimens are deposited there. Although we had some losses <laughs> because we have a very high oh, humidity oh. here and it's, um, it, it happens. It happens, especially happens. big fleshy mushrooms tend to get yes. uh, problems also with mites. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge. They are the worst. <laughs> yes, yes. And then the problem also is that with this inventory, you have like many different specimens mm -hmm. and sometimes it's not uh, possible to, to work through all the material in one day. So, so they become degraded. And so it, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to have good specimens that taxonomists then uh, can use. So we had this problem 
Mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of, of specimens, uh, especially for the Antoloma species, we found this. So also these smaller agricultures, that, that is a problem. So you have to dry them at once and do um, extraction from molecular analysis at once. Uh, okay. Without this, it, they just degrade very fast. Okay, thank you very much, Tina. Aida. But the, the specimens are um, in the herbarium oh. at the university. Mm -hmm. So um, we also have um, a very good collaborations with the um, environmental ministry from Panama. So I can get uh, collection permits, export permits. So we, um, we can do a good work uh, and uh, follow all these regulations that the country has um, put in place. Mm -hmm. Ah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Aida. Uh, Have you found scientific novelties of sequestrate fungi in the cloud forests of Colombia? Han encontrado nuevos alasgos de hongos sequestrados en los bosques de niebla de Colombia? Eh, sí, pues yo leí la pregunta antes, entonces me fui a buscar, porque realmente <laughs> quien puede responder esta pregunta es Viviana Motato, que es nuestra especialista en este tipo de hongos corticioides en el país y que ya está otra vez aquí en Colombia. Eh, pero revisando los listados de reportes, pues les cuento que hay bastantes. Eh, Rivarden estuvo en el país en la época de los 70 y tuvo la posibilidad de ir a la Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, que era una de estas serranías aisladas en el norte del país. No la serranía que le gustó a Aristóteles, no la del de la, desierto, pero ah. otra que también es muy eh, interesante. Y eh, Rivarden, en conjunto con, eh, ya les digo cómo es el otro autor, con Horstram, también un... Uh -huh. eh, ellos son de noruegos. Eh, ellos describieron muchas especies, tenemos muchas especies de Ifodontia, de Linterias... Eh, que están descritas algunas como especies nuevas de material colombiano eh, de estas zonas. Entonces, eh, si quieren me contactan, yo les puedo pasar como la, la bibliografía relacionada porque ellos, tanto Rivarden como Ostras, ellos publicaban como en pequeños fascículos y en pequeñas, uh -huh. eh, en revisiones muy específicas, entonces está muy dispersa la información, pero sí hay. Uh -huh. Entonces, si quieren, me contactan y yo con mucho gusto les puedo compartir la información si están interesados con este, este, pues, por este grupo de hongos. Y también los puedo poner en contacto con Viviana, que creo que es la persona eh, idónea en este momento para, para hablar del grupo en Colombia. Perfecto. Y la, la última, the last one, um, ¿qué podríamos decir de los hongos más Allá de los robledales. ¿Cómo? Sí, pues lo que yo les contaba, eh, haciendo como esta búsqueda, realmente podemos decir muy poco. Y yo creo que es algo generalizado con lo, en el país. Y es que éramos muy pocos micólogos, eh, poco a poco ha regresado más gente al país y yo creo que eso es muy valioso. Eh, porque vamos a ir entre todos tratando de completar este, este como, bueno, croquis de vacío de información. Uh -huh. eh, también hay muchos trabajos que se han hecho que no están publicados, entonces también tenemos que ponernos en la tarea de publicar para poder decir mucho más sobre los hongos de bosques de niebla que no, donde no hay roble. Porque creo que sí hay información, pero es información que está muy eh, dispersa, que no está todavía curada, que no está en bases organizada para poder decir algo más. ¿Qué podemos decir? Que seguramente va a haber una gran diversidad. Muchas micenas, muchos hongos, muchos marasmios de estos grupos que además son muy complicados de trabajar. Eh, eso es lo que esperamos. Esperamos que alguien se entusiasme para empezar a, a dedicarse a este grupo para tener resultados lindos para el segundo simposio Internacional de los Hongos en Bosques de Niebla. Ah, perfecto. Thank you very much, uh, Aida. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much for all of you uh, to 
be here with us. And I'm, uh, I, I would like to apologize uh, some technical problems because uh, uh, even though <laughs> we try to train, we make every, made everything before, something unexpected and some other problems occurred. But I hope uh, in, uh, the, the next day uh, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, at least. And uh, uh, that's the final part of uh, our day on the, the first day of symposium. And I would like to thank you again, all of you and all of our attendees. Thank you very much. And bye bye until uh, tomorrow. Thank you, mm. Aristotle. Thank you, Aristotle. Thank you, Aristotle. See, muchas. Goodbye. Adios. Bye. Gracias. Adios. Thank you, guys. Gracias, Aristotle. Mm. Ricardo. Yeah, gracias. Muchas gracias. Muy rico. Todos verte. ustedes. Gracias, Diogo, también. Y Alison. Okay. Gracias. Nos vemos. Muchas gracias, Ari. Chao, ahí Chao. Chao. Adios. Chao. Hasta Chao. mañana. Sí. Un fuerte abrazo, Ricardo. Chao. Tina, todos. Goodbye. Ciao. Take care. Bye.